a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber. The order of business of the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk has read that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating the name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, which is today, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue, not on the agenda for that date, nor plan for any future agenda. Will the clerk please call the first item of business? A few announcements here before we start our council meeting. In addition to having our public comment today in the council chambers, there will be a webinar that will be available for public comment uh, on the city council meetings held today, Monday, June 29th, and also July 20th of 2020. If you are interested in registering for the webinar, you must contact the city clerk's office um, and call us at 402-441-7436, and you must register with the clerk's office by noon that day of the meeting. We may have a change in contact information for the registration for the July 20th, 2020, so we will make an announcement for that contact info as well. And also due to the 4th of July holiday, the City Council will not meet on Monday, July 6, 2020. Our first item of business is our public hearing consent agenda items sections one and two. Is there anyone that would like to testify on the consent agenda at this time? Seeing no one, um, I would ask for a uh, motion to introduce to accept the consent agenda as written. These were introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Introduced by Shobe, seconded by Raybold. Can we have a vote, please? Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Thank you so much. Moving on to public hearing liquor resolutions. Item 4A is application of the bar at the yard LLC doing business at Longwells to temporarily expand its Class C liquor license to an additional outdoor area measuring 140 feet by 20 feet at 350 Canopy Street, Suite 100. Is there anyone here to testify uh, in, all right, come on up and please uh, uh, say your name and uh, your address for the record, please. I'll also swear you in too. Raise your right hand. Our next, excuse me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Good afternoon, my name is Eric F. Marsh. I own Longwells. I've got a, uh, a handout or an exhibit I'd like to hand out to everyone if I could. Give that to you. Thank you. As I said, I own Longwells. Um, we're applying for the Lincoln Dine Out program. Uh, we were on the agenda for last week. There was um, some discussions between 
how our application would impact the rail yard expanding into Canopy Street last week. So to keep the mud out of the water, we volunteered to table ours for this week, till this week. On Tuesday, um, the dine-out committee met and declined our application. Um, I found out about that at 3 p.m. today. Uh, when I inquired about that, I was given a number of reasons that were around the drawing that we had made. So we've redone a drawing. I brought that with me today to address any concerns. Um, if you would look at the drawing I put in front of you, there were concerns about the sidewalk because um, if you're familiar with it, Longwell's runs from 7th to Canopy on R Street. And R Street is to the north of our building. We call it our north patio where we have a cafe strip. And it's a very small strip. It's on here, tried to be to scale. But, I mean, it's this wide. Runs down the length of our building. After that, there's a sidewalk that's a little wider than our cafe strip. And then from there to the street, there's another 16 feet, maybe 15 feet. When we heard about the Lincoln Dine Out program, we thought that this is exactly what we were looking for. Um, Longwell's and our North Cafe Strip hold about 200 people. Um, we know that we can be at full occupancy right now, but if you have seat, people seated and you have social distancing between tables, there's no way to hit that 200. And what I thought the purpose of the Lincoln Dine Out program was is to expand out into sidewalks and the areas toward the street um, in order to hit your occupancy. We will come remarkably close to that 200 by doing that expansion. Kind of thought this was exactly what this was all about. People have raised a couple of concerns. Number one, we've already expanded into Canopy Street. Two things there. We have a south patio and a west patio that now can expand into Canopy Street, all right? But the rail yard expanded into Canopy Street, not the businesses. Yes, we benefit from the people, we, we benefit from the entire thing, but our business model is built on having a south patio, a west patio, an inside, and a north patio. We've accounted for the social distancing of our south, our west, and the rail yard, but not for the internal side of Long Wells, nor our north patio. Mainly because it's so, so thin that it's difficult to social distance and have very many seats there at all. So that's what we've done. Our drawing now shows that we will have at least six feet between the tables. We'll probably average eight. The sidewalk will remain clear um, during that entire process. Um, if anyone has any questions for me, I will answer those, but I think I've addressed at least what I know to be the concerns now. I'm sure that there will be a couple more, um, and I would be happy to address those. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Councilwoman Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member, Me Council Member Show. Mr. Marsh, um, I have a couple of questions about um, the north sidewalk area. How wide is the distance that you are leaving open on the sidewalk? We're leaving the entire sidewalk open. Entire sidewalk is open. Yes, there will not be a table there um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't want to stop pedestrian traffic. So we won't be gating it off on either end. We already, for our busy hours, have a guard at our north or at our front door, which will be able to keep uh, that side open. We will staff an additional person down on the corner of 7th and Canopy. But the sidewalk will be unencumbered. There will be no obstacles. There will be no tables. It'll be just a straight path down the sidewalk the entire time. Okay. And so you're saying that with um, this north extension and the extension onto Canopy Street that you will reach full occupancy? We will be able to, yes. And will that impede any other business in the rail yard from reaching their full occupancy? I do not believe so. Um, when I look at what's happening in Canopy Street, I look at Canopy Street helping the rail yard reach its full occupancy. So basically, that, to me, they're two different issues. When we're expanding to the north, we will infringe upon no one. There's no other business that we will encumber. There's, there's, there's nothing there that our expansion to the north will stop or preclude anyone else from reaching their occupancy. I don't know if I answered your question, so give me another crack at it. Is there any other way for you to reach occupancy if you don't have the north patio extension? There is not. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Schaub? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mars, thanks you for coming forward. I'm a little puzzled about, 
Are you extending out into R Street and will block traffic in R? No. It, we are. You're still within the this side of the lanes. That's what I'm a little confused about. Yes. I see where the sidewalk is, and I assume the sidewalk ends and the road begins. No, we are expand. There's a there's a 15 foot gap between the sidewalk and the road. That was, and, was, keep yeah. going. Yeah. And so it's it it's what's there. Um, it's a it's a bricked area with trees that we've denoted on the diagram to show you but there's a true sidewalk that's about five feet wide that is a sidewalk and then there's a green space brick spaced between that and the road and that is what we would expand into would, would you be putting up some type of barrier to the road so to keep people yes in we cars would up? yeah okay exactly like we've done we've closed this area a dozen times in the past for sdls so, was, so we would use the same fencing for that to uh, segment the area. Thank you. That, that helps me understand a little better because I knew that Canopy Street would be closed and I yep. was thinking what kept you out of the highway. Thank you. Mr. Chair, at some point I'd like to ask some staff questions. I'm not sure if we're there yet or not. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for this applicant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, um, I would ask if anyone would like to testify uh, in support of this item. If anyone would like to testify in opposition. And then if not, then I guess we'll move into staff questions for uh, Mr. Shobe. Um, thank, you, Mr. thank you so much. Who would you like to talk to with staff? Oh, Tanya Peters. Thank you. City Attorney's Office. Good assumption. Yeah. Probably yes. fair enough, right? <sighs> Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I think you can take that off if you want some, well. Yeah. Testifying is a little easier. We'll and see how I do. Okay, that's not. Nice. So I'm a little confused on how we got here. There's, um, Mr. Marsh has been very kind to us in the past, and he's trying to keep his business open. And we've seemed to have this conversation between what the rail yard is doing and what other businesses in the Hamer, in the entertainment district are doing. How did we get here with this separate application? Um, at the time we made the dine out program, uh, Mr. Marsh made a separate application that benefits only Longwells. At the same time, he was part of the application that benefits Longwells and other businesses that face Canopy Street. So he submitted two applications. So last week when I talked to him, I, I told him that there were issues with his application um, and that staff would prefer that he withdraw it, but he didn't have to. Um, and then we would see if Canopy Street was approved. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, this is the first time that we've seen this particular mm -hmm. um, diagram. And we had discussed last week, uh, he and I, about the problems with the application, the pedestrian pathway, the space between the tables, because the original drawing, um, when I looked at it, I would not have told you that he was allowing pedestrians to walk through that space. I thought the sidewalk was completely closed off. And that the tables, there were quite a few tables and I could not tell what this, the spacing was, and that was part of the concern. He may have used the same um, SDL area in the past, um, but that would have been part of a larger activity in the area, and chances are um, our street was closed. Okay? I don't know that for sure. It's just chances are that that was closed. So in this particular um, Okay, so the sidewalk is going to be would be closed for an extended period of time, much longer than our normal SDL, um, taking away pedestrian travel or the comfort of pedestrian travel on that. We don't know what the arena is going to do for events. We don't know if we're going to have a football game. So we're trying to make sure that we have enough pedestrian space should those two entities kind of get some activities going. So staff on Tuesday denied his outdoor dine out Lincoln program, which would be basically the lease for him to use the space, which he needs in order to get an addition proved for the liquor application. Okay, so without the city's approval for that space, the addition can't be approved by the liquor commission. Whew, that's a lot. Sorry, I might have to take this off. Okay. I have a question. Go for it. All right. Um, Tanya, if uh, the Pinnacle Bank Arena started to have events and we found that people did not, could not stay within the sidewalk area and felt like the only way for them to get passage down that side of our street was to step into the street. Could we at that point, for safety reasons, modify this dine out extension? We could. I can't tell you that it would be a real quick 
or easy because we would have to modify our permit, take it to the Liquor Commission, and ask them to um, basically counsel or modify the addition. Um, so ideally, we would avoid any of those situations where we think we're going to have to do that. That might be an issue. Um, in this case, uh, Mr. Marsh and I have talked about this. He does not feel that he has direct access to Canopy Street, that it doesn't directly benefit his business. There are a number of tables that will be located outside of his business. His staff can serve there, liquor and food. Um, uh, he, he has several liquor or out food windows that um, directly um, abut the space on Canopy Street. He also has an exterior door that goes into the rail yard, which is part of his liquor license. And so we are already extending his liquor license onto Canopy Street. It probably, in my layman's estimate, it probably benefits him more than many of the other um, locations just because of those serving windows that are right there. But um, he feels that that's not an extension of his space for occupancy. And I would, I would kind of beg to differ, but. Councilman Cho. I think I've already had one bite. How about we, everyone else get a chance before I come back to my second turn? Councilman well, Rubel. Tanya, have you had a chance to look at his revised drawing? I did, just quickly. And there okay. would be some questions that I would send to the committee. One of those is, he shows a sidewalk path through here, um, but I don't know what the width of that is. Like, does that meet ADA requirements? How many pedestrians can we accommodate with that space? Um, he has fencing that looks like it ends at the end of the building. In the building, technically to leave his license area, he needs a path in order to carry that liquor. So he would have to expand one direction or another um, and include that within the addition. The other thing is he needs to amend his addition with the liquor commission and he needs to go through the sidewalk app cafe application process um, so council kind of has two choices like you can give him a recommendation of approval for this um, but he still has to go get that permit before it can be approved you could continue your his application until the July 13th meeting and see if he can work out the issues with the committee as far as just so some of those things I address I really can't tell you what the distance is between these tables. I can't read the writing. It might be six foot, um, so we would need some clarification um, on some of that. Um, and you know, I don't know if these are four persons tables, six person tables. I have no idea. So those would be some questions that the committee would probably ask him. Thank you. Any other questions, Go Councilwoman? Uh, no. Uh, do you have one? Uh, yeah. I do. I you do. should go so, first. Go. Uh, you uh, might ask mine, and I won't have to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this may be for Mr. Marsh as well, but Tanya, so um, is, what would be your recommendation? Is there a way we can work with the applicant and the committee so that um, the questions get answered, we don't delay, um, we can help Longwells and our other businesses move forward from what they've all experienced the last several months um, so that we don't um, not inadvertently, but um, continue to, um, for lack of a better word, uh, roadblocks isn't the right word, but how can we help this move forward as a city? What would be your recommendation? And then I guess I'd like to t have Mr. Marsh come back up if that's appropriate, Mr. Chair, when the questions are answered to see if he'd be willing to see, to work with us so that we can. Um, that's, a, that's a hard question because there's some details unknown and you know the the issues that I'm addressing are really things from other departments their their job duties to make sure that we're providing a safe um, traffic flow um, for the pedestrians in the area you know of of all of our applications um, like I said he already has access on canopy Street to put site tables or and to serve this would be abnormal from the limited few applications we have to have two areas. So, I mean, he would be, we'd be treating this particular business differently than we're treating some of the other ones. Um, I would expect that we may get some more requests from other businesses if they can take up the entire sidewalk, right? 
in other areas or even in Canopy Street. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, so your options are, if you don't want to see this again, either approve it with the condition that he gets the permit um, through the committee or deny it. Um, and then it would go to the Liquor Commission. He could still work with the committee and see, um, and, but they would not approve it without that, um, without that information. But it's going to be a little confusing when it goes over the Liquor Commission seeing council approve it. Um, but yet the city staff are, are saying he still needs to get that other permission. So that kind of send, sends a little bit of a mixed signal. Or we, or we could actually delay it until, like you had suggested earlier, to July 13th. Mm -hmm. If you could go back and clean up this revised drawing to put in the, the critical dimensions for the sidewalk, for the distance between the tables, and access to the server from the interior part of the, uh, the restaurant and the bar. Right. And then in between that time that he could resubmit it to the committee with all these changes, enhancements, clarifications, they could come back by the 13th and make another recommendation once they've had a Certainly. chance. Okay. Certainly. Sorry, I'm, that wasn't, I wasn't really mentioned? helpful I, on that one. But helpful. quickly before you have, so I, this is another map related question. I'm concerned about the contiguous nature of the cafe area with the sidewalk breaking it. You know, he's, he, currently his liquor license covers his adjacent to the building cafe. Then there's a city sidewalk. And then we're gonna extend the liquor license to a property that's not adjacent to the city? Well, you would have to license the sidewalk. We would have to license the sidewalk right. too. The, uh, and we'd have to go down and look at this space. I don't, I don't have enough of a memory of what it looks like to know if we can bring those tables closer and send the pedestrians around it. That would be ideal, but I think there's pavers in that in that area, and I don't, I don't usually like to send people over pavers. There's, there's quite a few more trees than you imagined. It looks like there are about six trees down through there. Yeah, I looked at an aerial last week, but that is. That was last week. That was last week. <laughs> so, yeah. Councilman Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tanya, just so I can summarize, so I, I can keep all the pieces here, mm -hmm. you're saying that the modifications um, that we would need in this, so if we were to say we approve, but we need you to <laughs> assure us of an appropriate ADA width on the sidewalk for passage, we need to know the seating capacity of each of the tables and the distance between each of the tables, and we need to have a clear access path for servers from the building to the proposed area. You could do that, but there's no way to get that assurance to you. Um, it would be assuring city staff. So I think you would have to do approval um, with um, a with approval. the condition that Conditions. they get a dine out mm -hmm. um, dine out program or dine out Lincoln program permit that that and that they provide this information to okay. the committee for review. Now, I can't tell you that the committee is still going to feel comfortable doing that um, based upon some of those unknowns that we don't, mm -hmm. that we're going to have over the next few months. And remember, this is, goes until the end of September. Thank you. Councilman Washington? Or uh, Councilwoman Ward? Thank you. Remind us again who is on the, com the dine out committee, please. Um, I don't have an exact list, but it is basically your sidewalk cafe committee with a few other people that usually look at sidewalk or uh, special events. So um, public works and transportation, uh, somebody from park and go um, because of the parking meters and whatever. Um, so it's a little bit broader than just that normal sidewalk cafe committee. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ms. Peters? All right. It seems like that we had a question for um, the applicant, Marsh. Mr. Marsh. So uh, you want to go ahead and come on back up and we can ask you some more questions, please? Thank you so much. Right. Councilwoman Ward? Could, oh, not me. Could I answer a couple of things there to beforehand or do you? 
as in a rebuttal statement? Yes, I think I, that's, you can have a rebuttal statement, right. sure. Did anyone um, have any questions though that they wanted to ask? I think Councilwoman yeah, Ward did. Go ahead. If I could, this may you help. Thank you. Oops, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this may help in your statement. Mr. Marsh, I just wanted to um, ascertain if we went back or delayed your application, um, if you would be willing to work on those um, questions that we had and that the law department had. Um, if we were to delay and come back on the 13th um, to approve your application so or the consider it? The answer is yes. Okay. I mean, I've been in front of this, this I know guys you have. for a dozen times. Sure. We do whatever it took to okay. make it work for the city, for us to do that. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to wait two more weeks. I, I will if, if that's the only path forward, obviously. Understood. Um, with this weekend is a big weekend for us. Um, it will be a big weekend. It'll also kind of kick off the back half of the summer that really didn't have a front half. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's important in the hospitality industry. It's important to us. Um, I, I, a couple of other things I'd like to cover. I have two applications because I have two aspects of my business. All right. Half of our business is out the windows. The other half is inside. So I, I can't, I can't serve one and ignore the other and survive. All right. The reason I'm in front of you is because this application, this program exists. I thought the goal was to, to do exactly what my application says, which is expand toward the street. Um, the rail yard one goes across two sidewalks. I didn't think that going across the sidewalk was a big issue. It's a wide ADA sidewalk. I'd be happy to go measure it in the next 15 minutes and email that to whoever you tell me to email it to. Um, in order to do that, if I had to guess, like I said earlier, I guess it's over five feet wide, but I will get that. We measured the exact distance from the rail to the street, which is 20 feet. We tried to label it. Guys, we're going to put tables every six to eight feet. They're going to sit four people or six people or two people, depending on the size of the table. None of them will be in excess of eight, um, and we're not going to have them crowded together. I, that's, that's the whole point of this is that social spread. Mm -hmm. Arena events, I, I've heard that brought up a couple of times. Canopy Street is now effectively closed for the duration of what I'm asking for. When the arena does an event, they close our street starting at the arena at Canopy. That will, by default, ex post facto, close our street in front of my building because there's no way to get past that intersection. You'd be driving into a dead end at that point. So that will give you a natural flow for pedestrian traffic for an arena event because that street will be a, a pedestrian pathway because there will be no, no traffic on it. Um, football events, <laughs> I hope that's a problem. <laughs> I think we all hope that it's a problem, but if there's seven days this fall, we're gonna need all the room we can to operate, it's gonna be those seven days. All right, to, to not let people socially expand during those seven days would seem to be defeatist to all the other days we're doing it. Um, uh, the pathway, I have a pathway to that area through the garage doors and through my front door. All right, I have an issue on my back door where the railing ends and my back door is, um, but we, I mean, I can go straight out the north of my building out of garage doors and go around the railing myself. So that pathway is there. Um, trying to see if there's anything else that was brought up in the middle of that. I will meet with any committee as quickly as possible to resolve any issues. Thank you so much. All right. Any last minute questions, Councilwoman Washington? I'm not familiar, uh, Mr. Marsh, with your garage doors on the north side. Could you just describe where they are in relationship to the four tables that are closest to your business that you've drawn in? Okay. I have a garage door that is right here that is 14 feet. I have okay. another one right here that is 14 feet. I have another one right here that is 14 feet. And you're saying yeah. that you can open the garage door and cross the fence? I can walk out my building here and I can walk around the rail. The rail is contiguous right here. This railing, right. this existing case area, this railing is contiguous so that we don't have people leaving our area to the north on a normal day. Okay. So I can walk out my building and go around the rail to the area I'm going to, which is how we will access it. Will be through the garage doors. Thank you very much. All right. Any other last minute questions? Okay. Seeing. Oh. I just have one more, Mr. Marsh. Thank you very much. So, if we approve it today, doesn't it 
ultimately have to go back to the, the committee that denied it so that you can show them your access. And we would be happy to go back to that committee as quickly as possible without waiting two weeks to come back here. So I, we, I mean, we'll, we could be at the next committee meeting. They had one last Tuesday. Hopefully they have one tomorrow. That's, we, we will be there with bells on as soon as they meet. So with this temporary permit, it only goes through the end of September? That is correct. And you're okay with that because well, if football should happen, knock on wood, then it would be... I'm going to do it every time you say it. Yep. It would, it would just be... It would go away anyway. Yeah. And so on a football Saturday in September, should we have one, then this, you wouldn't be able to have this uh, set up. Um, I, I'm not positive of that outcome, and I'll live with whatever <laughs> someone tells me that answer is. So... I, I don't know if that's an issue or not, um, but if, if someone says that sidewalk cafes or, or dine out Lincoln is suspended for football games, then they are. All right, and maybe at that point we would be covered under a current S, or an SDL application or something like that. I'm not positive how that would work out, but if you told me that those were the only days I couldn't have it, I'd live with it. Okay, Tanya, Tanya could you yeah. come back up and clarify that? So. In the event of a football Saturdays, how does this impact any of the um, rail yard expansion requests? Well, the, the rail yard is currently approved to use that space through September on Canopy Street, mm -hmm. whether or not there's a football game or not. Okay. We're not making them come back. If they're going to do a band or something where we have to have a safety plan and it's outside the, the requirements of the program, because remember the program is Basically, nothing that requires your guests to get up and move around. Just sit down, eat, drink, leave. Mm -hmm. Then they would, we would make them get an SDL or at least come back to the committee and talk about a safety plan. If we were going to do, if we were going to say, you got to pick up your fence and your tables from this area on football games, I think we got to do a little bit of drafting and, and rule things. And the other problem with that is, he would be responsible for liquor violations that occur on that sidewalk because that's part of his liquor establishment. And so mm -hmm. that's a huge risk to put on someone's shoulders or on the business shoulders. Um, and it, it wouldn't be unusual to have a violation. So, yes. Um, I totally understand the need to keep this process moving. Um, so I'd like to know, will the dine out committee be meeting tomorrow? They're scheduled to meet tomorrow at 2.30, and I don't know what's on the agenda, um, but possibly. Um, where did that map go? I think it's on the phone. Um, so if you were going to do something today, we, we have to think this through. So right now he has 104 feet. He is not allowed to go out those garage doors, walk around the fence to an opening and come back in. Okay, so we'd have to redesign it on the fly. So we'd have to add feet, either on this side or on this side, for him to be able to do what he's proposing. Because he's crossing the public sidewalk. In an unlicensed area. An unlicensed public area, okay. So, um, it's dangerous to design on the fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to start thinking through everything, and I don't know that we're we've got it all. But those are some of the things that, if we're going to approve the license today, we need to modify our resolution to the right dimensions, whatever those would be, because that's going to be his license space if approved, if he obtains the permit. I'm sorry, guys, and I'm going to back out of here. The 104 feet includes a walkway around the railing. It, there's a rail, there's walk space on both sides of the railing. The, the railing is not 104 feet. It's 96 feet, I think. So it includes enough for us to get around it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Councilman Schaub? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Peters, I'm going to tap your knowledge again if you have a moment. So if the council were to do a conditional approval, relying on the events committee this would still have to go before the liquor commission it goes to them for approval okay okay we've already 
had to beg and and uh, work with them and tell them that this is going to be easy. On, on, so I'm a little hesitant to send a difficult one to them because they are doing us a favor by thinking outside the box and, and doing this process. So <clears throat> we need to make it as simple as possible for them if we're going to do this. So that design on the fly or craft on the fly thing, is that something the committee could do if we gave them the authority? Well, if you're going to move forward, you have to approve a certain footprint, we right, for the, um, so that's what- The license to be extended. That's what we're kind of doing, yeah. And in fact, it's probably easier to reduce it than to extend it. Now, if we look at his drawing over here, if this is more accurate for the square footage, originally I was told they were going to exit out this door and in to this space. Um, and, and this is why when we first looked at it, I would not have told you that they had pedestrian access just because of these lines that are here. Um, and normally we don't have pedestrians walking through a licensed area. We do have that on canopy, but we're opening up those four side or, or the ends and there's no tables or anything really close. So the pedestrians are free to pass through. Does anyone have any more questions? Thank you. Okay. Seeing none. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to the next item. Sony, this is yours. I'll be calling item 4B, application of McFarland Family Farms, LLC, for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area, measuring approximately 10 feet by 10 feet at the Haymarket Farmer's Market on Canopy Street. Um, I did receive a phone call today from the applicant requesting for a withdrawal of this application. I'd like to make a motion to accept the applicant's request to withdraw and that we withdraw this application. Second. Moved by Councilwoman Raybould, seconded by uh, Councilwoman Ward. Uh, can we please have a vote? Or is there any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, can we please have a vote? Okay. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. All right. Moving on to the next item, please. I'm going to call item 4C, application of the Hub Cafe LLC for a special designated license to cover an indoor area of 30 feet by 30 feet and an outdoor area measuring approximately 200 feet by 170 feet at 215 North 21st Street on August 27th, September 3rd, 10th, 17th, 24th, and October 1st, and an alternative date of 10-8 between 3 p.m. and 10 p.m. Is there anyone here to testify on this item? Come on up. Please say your uh, name and address for the record, please. Thank you for the council for hearing me today. My name is Doug Dittman. Doug, I'm going to swear you in as well. If you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you really believe it to be? I do. Thank you. My name is Doug Dittman. I have, I'm the owner of Hub Cafe at 250 North 21st Street here in Lincoln. And uh, I'm here in regards to our Hub and Soul uh, music series on the dates that Sony read. And uh, it'll be our second year of having this event where, as you know, we're located on the bike trails. And um, we simply enclose the amphitheater and we roll out our grills and we have food and drink and music for this series, we have it. Uh, we raise money for a group each year. This year, it'll be Great Plains Trails Network. Last year, we raised ten thousand dollars for them for the uh, bike bridge. So we are preparing for this event like we did last year. Of course, it's a little different this year. We are working through the COVID-19 event and gathering safety plan with the city. We met today with Lynn Johnson at uh, Parks and Rec and, and others. Uh, we will submit this to approval to the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. So far, what we've seen from it, we feel like we can meet all the requirements uh, that are being asked of us. Um, also, it, it will be based upon the COVID risk dial and whatever setting it is at that time, green, yellow, orange, red, and a plan for each of those. 
Occupancy has been adjusted accordingly to the city's uh, rating. That's really all I have to say about it. Do you have any questions for me in regard to Hub and Soul? Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Dittman? Uh, Councilman Cho? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dittman. I attended Hub and Soul last year and had a great time mm -hmm. and was looking forward to it again this year, but I'm a little concerned about capacity. Right. You did outline some things, but whether it be head counts, people screening, can you give me any more details on how you'll make sure that social distance stuff is maintained? We will. Is Lynn Johnson here, by the way? Okay. I, I, we, we were working through this today, and uh, a lot of the numbers, I think we're looking at 300, around 300 for capacity. We're going to do temperature checks. We're going to keep write down names of everyone that comes in. And then we think we can have a technology where they can call in what they want to eat, and then it'll call their cell phone when the food is ready. Um, we've worked through the capacity of the Union Plaza area that's enclosed. And really, the, that would be, uh, I think, Lynn, you worked through the numbers. It's the distance between folks that you could put a blanket out there in the grass. It's a large, grassy swale. Yeah. yeah. So obviously lines are, are no good. So, um, you know, I think we're going to, there, there will be beer, for instance, but the idea is that there would be enough that you wouldn't have to wait in line. You're calling in your food order your phone rings worked pretty well last year yeah so the food would be ready that way is there anything else on uh what we're planning that, that you want to have any more questions for mr Dittman? i think i'm good thank you you do no i'm good i think mr johnson the, let him come up and add if you would mr johnson is there anything you would like to add Hey, good afternoon, Lynn Johnson, Lincoln Parks and Recreation, and I would say yes, we are working through the process with the Hub Cafe and the event organizers uh, to develop the plans consistent with the guidelines that the Health Department has. We don't have them finalized at this point, but we are preparing those and we'll be coordinating with the Health Department to make sure that we meet social distancing guidelines, make sure that we don't have people standing in lines, for example, um, and we are We've looked at the capacity of the space based on a six foot radius, and then we're taking a percentage of that to determine the capacity of, of people that would be allowed to attend. And essentially, it'll probably be a, once capacity is reached, it'll be a one out, one in system. Um, but we know from the, the event last year that it was kind of a come and go event. So I suspect that we may be able to achieve uh, the capacity without having to restrict anybody's access, at least for a period of time. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Johnson? Uh, it's not a question. Oh. You're going to go first. No, you it's go. not a question, but I really appreciate the attention you've taken to uh, coming up with a contact traceable event so that you've got people's temperature, their names, their phone numbers. Um, thank you for working all these details out. Absolutely. <laughs> Show. I was going to say the same thing. And do you have any concerns? I don't. In fact, I, the, we, we work very closely with the mayor's office and the health department, and we kind of feel like this could be a model event for how some of these community gatherings that are so important to our community mm -hmm. are able to happen in an appropriate, fun, and safe way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the next item, please. We're calling item 4D, application of cut. Cosneb Neda LLC doing business as the Kindler Hotel to expand its Class CK liquor license for an addition of an area including the second floor of a commercial club at 200 North 11th Street of approximately 100 feet by 142 feet, basement area measuring 12 feet by 28 feet, third floor area measuring 101 feet by 93 feet, and fourth floor area measuring 101 feet by 70 feet, and also including an outdoor area approximately 13 feet by 17 feet and 13 feet by 40 feet at 200 and 216th North 11th Street. Is there anyone here to testify on this item? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you really believe it to be? Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm the general manager at the Kemmer Hotel. And we had applied for, um, we're applying for an extension of our current liquor license. But we've realized that maybe all of this is a little too much at one time. 
So what we would like to do today is withdraw all of this except the Sidewalk Cafe application, which is at 216 North 11th. It's in front of the Kindler Hotel. It's the 13 feet by 17 feet and the 13 feet by 40 feet. And then we'll come back at a later date and apply again for the other portions of this. And I'm sorry, can you say your name for the record, Mary please? Mary Beth Smith. Thank you so much. Okay. Does well, um, thank you for coming down, Mary Beth. And um, I would um, motion to amend this application this afternoon to only include the outdoor area of 13 to 17 and 13 to 40 foot at 216 North 11th Street. Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Councilwoman Washington, seconded by Councilwoman Raybould. Uh, can we do a vote, please? Mm -hmm. Or can we have any discussion, please? Any discussion? No. Um, well, I had an opportunity this afternoon to talk to Mary Beth and to talk to Tanya and to talk to Dan Marvin. I talked to a lot of people today about this application because I thought it was important that we get this clarified. And I am so glad that uh, we reached a good resolution. I believe that um, this meets the intention of the Dine Out program by offering the Kindler Hotel uh, increased outdoor space or outdoor space at all, because you don't have that yet. And so by licensing the outdoor space, um, they can begin to come back into business. And the other places are not yet fully constructed. So I don't think that we've harmed their business at all by not approving um, space on the third and fourth floor and the basement that is not yet um, fully prepared for customers. Any further discussion? Okay, well, it's been motion, been seconded. Can we do a vote, please? On the amendment. Just on the amendment. Uh, just on the amendment. Just the amendment? Yep. Okay. And then we'll vote on the whole batch. Okay. Ward? Yes. Shope? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried on the amendment five to zero. Okay. And now we'll move on to the voting session for the liquor resolutions. Okay. We have to go back. We just amended the motion that's already on the table. So we have to go back and vote on that one. Well, I was, that's correct, but I was going to make a motion that we uh, approve items 4C and 4D at this point and then I'm take sorry. a separate vote on 4A. I'm sorry. Yes, I was wrong. You were okay. um, very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I make a motion to approve items 4C and 4D and 4D as amended. Second. Moved by Councilwoman Raybould, seconded by Councilwoman Ward. Uh, can we do a vote on the motion, please? Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. And I'd like to make a motion that we approve for A, conditional upon a revised drawing going to the uh, committee tomorrow and getting their approval as well. Second. Is there any discussion? Could we, um, Jane, would you be open to a friendly amendment Certainly. that conditions this approval on a permit by the Dine Out Committee? That is stated much better. Thank you. All right. Thank so you. we have that moved by Councilman Raybould, seconded by Councilman Washington. Uh, we had some discussion. Mr. Uh, Mr. Shobe? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think there was a conversation during our public hearing about the square footage being better outlined in our motion today. Do we Are we going to authorize the committee to do that, or do we need to fix that before we move forward? I want to ask Ms. Peters to help me understand better. Mr. Marsh told us that the dimensions were good. He gave us some good numbers. Do we need to change our motion to reflect those? If, if he is correct, right, that, the, that 140 feet is enough, then your, your original resolution and, and everything includes the right dimensions. Okay. Okay, if he's wrong. Then we just help him break the rules, right? Um, we'll <laughs> make it up as we go, I guess. We'll just figure it out, right? Um, so uh -huh. we, we can ask for an addition. And as long as I think the city is giving, if they give him a permit, right, for that, then we should be able to amend his addition. Okay. Uh, so I, th I think that was the intent when we did this, was to help as many businesses as we could 
do the best they could under limited circumstances. And I think that's the spirit of our intent. Mm -hmm. So we're okay on the dimensions. We can go ahead and move forward. Sure. Thank you. That was my question. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? And and I'd just like to, to concur and ditto what uh, C Councilman Shobe said, because the intent really is to help businesses uh, survive and thrive any way we possibly can to make sure that they can safely serve their clientele and customers and also stay in business. So I, I do agree that that is the intent that was articulated by Councilman Shobe, and, and I think that's how we all strongly feel that we want to do everything we can, not to really bend the rules, but make sure that we give the uh, business owner every opportunity to conform to the rules and amend as, as uh, the dine-out committee has requested to be in compliance. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, let's go ahead and take a vote on... Item 4A, with the condition that it gets our approval, but it also must get the approval of the dine-out committee. Did I state that correctly? Yeah. I think we vote on the motion, then we vote on it as a whole, right? Correct. We just vote awesome. on it as a whole. But we are mo voting on the motion to amend first, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. Conditioned. Mm -hmm. No, it's a conditional approval requiring, I don't think it's an amendment. It's, Tanya, you want to clarify? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's considered an amendment if we're giving it a conditional approval based on Mr. Kirk, the approval of the dine-out committee. It's a conditional approval. Well, the resolution that you have before you does not contain it. So to err on the side of caution, okay. I would amend it. Okay, thank right, you. And then vote on the amended version. Okay. Thank you. I stand corrected. Okay. So I guess we are voting on the amendment. Okay. All right, let's, uh, we, uh, motion by Councilwoman Raybould, seconded by Councilwoman Washington. Uh, can we do a vote on the amendment, please? Washington? Um, yes, and the second was Ward. Okay. okay. Ward? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried, five to zero. Now the amended resolution. Washington? Yes. Ward? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried, five to zero. Good luck, Mr. Marsh. Moving on to the next item. Okay, that ends our, or concludes our public hearing liquor resolutions. We're going to move on to our next item, public hearing resolutions. Item 5A is accepting and approving the report of new and pending claims against the city for June 1st through June 15th, 2020. Is there anyone here to testify on this matter? Seeing none, um, I would ask for a, that we move into the uh, voting session to vote on this resolution. Okay. Item 5A is accepting and approving the report of new and pending claims against the city for June 1st through June 15, 2020, introduced by Raybould. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Raybould, seconded by Councilman Shobe. Can we have a vote, please? Shobe? Yes. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Ward? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried, 5 to 0. Okay. Moving on to the next item, public hearing, ordinance of second reading, and related resolutions. I will be calling item 6A through 6C together. Item 6A is approving the Antelope Tower redevelopment agreement between Antelope Tower LLC and the city relating to the redevelopment of the property generally bounded by L Street, K Street, South Antelope Valley Parkway, and 20th Street. Also amending the fiscal year 2019-2020 CIP to authorize an appropriate $2 million in TIF funds to the Antelope Tower redevelopment project and also authorizing the issuance of tax allocation bonds for the Antelope Tower redevelopment project in the amount not to exceed $2 million. Good evening, uh, Dan Marvin, I'm the Director of Urban Development and I'm here to speak on behalf of these three items. Um, these are, many of these items I think have been before you in a number of different ways. Uh, we had the plan amendment um, a month or so ago and uh, what this project before you is um, a project that the developer would call workforce housing. So this would be um, probably appropriate for people who make above 60% area median income, but are, it's not the most 
um, expensive apartments that you're going to see in the downtown area. Uh, it's 93 apartments. Um, one of the things that we like about this particular project is they're building their own parking. Um, so this will not put residents in uh, downtown parking garages that are currently at capacity. Um, this project has been before urban design on three different occasions. Um, and as uh, Sony indicated, it's between K and L Street, between um, along the uh, South Antelope Valley Parkway. And they will take off of there, they'll take access off of K and L through some deceleration lanes. The developer will build out the deceleration lane on L Street. Um, the allocation of the tax increment financing is as follows. Uh, that's been, again, before you in a number of different ways, but the project is going to have an A and a B note on it. Um, the developer here, Tom Houston, can speak to the two different notes. Uh, but there will be site improvements on this. Um, that will be that will fit with the neighborhood, and um, again, we've shown you this particular rendering along Antelope Valley. Um, and one of the things that I think is unique about this particular project is the language that's in Section 310 that's highlighted. There's been um, some concern expressed in the community that. People with housing vouchers have difficulty um, getting into an apartment. Um, and uh, the city attorney, uh, Abigail Luttrell, helped form this language. And I think she was very creative in how she did this. But basically, people who have housing vouchers will count towards their income, and they can't be excluded from these apartments based on the source of income that they bring to the table to rent. So like I say, I think that number, a number of times I've been before you on this particular project. If you have any, any questions, I'm here. I know Tom Houston is going to take some time to speak on this. Um, the developer's here as well if you have any questions for, to, for Fred. Does anyone, uh, does anyone have any questions for Director Marvin? Councilman Washington? Director Marvin, thanks for coming down today. Could you, t you said that this is workforce housing, and I'm curious, would you uh, categorize this as affordable Housing or is 60% uh, 60 of area medium income a little bit above where we would calculate well, this is affordable? So what, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert, but I've, I've read enough on it that I can give you kind of a general idea of what we're talking about. All right. So for um, when, we, when we describe a, an apartment as affordable, we would say that it's somebody who makes 60% of area median income can get into an apartment without being cost burden, which means that they are, if they make, I think the um, area median income in Lincoln right now is about, um, I want to, I want to say it's about fifty-seven thousand dollars. So if you're at sixty percent area median income, that that would be that you are making thirty-four thousand dollars a year. Um, these apartments probably would have a person making that amount, $34,000, being cost burden getting in there. But at 80% area median income, up to about 100, 110%, I think that they would not be cost burden to get into those apartments at those levels. So generally when people speak about workforce housing, they're talking about something that is above a standard of what's called affordable housing. Okay. Fred's the expert in here though, and he could speak to that, but I think I'm pretty close. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further questions for Director Marvin? Right. Seeing none, um, is there, Mr. Houston, would you like to come and testify on this matter? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. My name is Tom Houston. My address is 233 South 13th Street, Suite 1900 here in Lincoln on behalf of Antelope Tower, LLC, which was formed to undertake this project, uh, the principals of which are Fred Hoppy, John Hoppy, and Jake Hoppy. Uh, Director Marvin's correct. The city block that we're looking at is between K and L Street, uh, between Antelope Valley on the west side and 20th Street on the east side. 
Uh, it's somewhat unusual because this is a downtown location that has three arterial streets directly adjacent to it, which makes it uh, not only a prominent block, but it makes it a challenge from, from planning for this block. Uh, the project itself is going to consist of a five-story building, uh, two primary components, uh, the, the first floor, approximately 18,000 square feet of commercial use, really envisioning neighborhood services, uh, coffee, sh coffee shop, uh, soft office, any of those types of services within the, that are needed in the neighborhood. The second component is the residential component consisting of 93 apartments, uh, 31 of which are studio apartments, uh, 37 will be one bedroom apartments, and 23 units will be two bedroom apartments. Uh, Director Marvin did mention that the parking will be contained on the block. We have planned for, and the site plan reflects, 174 parking stalls. If you do the math, well, first of all, I remind you, in the B4 district, the city has the obligation to uh, provide parking. Uh, but, but in order to make this project work and function well, not only for the retail, but for the residential, there's 174 parking stalls on site. Uh, pretty rough calculation, but the, uh, the B5 district advocates uh, one stall per 300 square feet, so that's approximately 60 stalls we would need for the retail area that we tried to make the analogy for this property. And that leaves 114 stalls for the residential units, which is in excess of one stall per dwelling unit. It's really 1.22 if you do the math. We think that's adequate. We think there's a lot of residents in this project that will not have vehicles, but uh, we also have good bike parking also uh, that will make provision for that. Uh, Director Marvin is correct. I, I consider this to be a moderate income project. And I think it's affordable. I think affordable is more of a generic term, at least in my estimation. Uh, the, the moderate income is really affordable for those individuals, residents making no more than 80% of the AMI. And that's really what the rents are being targeted towards. Uh, uh, Director Marvin did point your attention to Section 310 of the Redevelopment Agreement that indicates that the uh, redeveloper, the landlord, will not differentiate based on source of income, uh, will accept uh, all sources of income for the residents. Uh, because it is a prominent block, design was very important. Uh, there's no back door. There's uh, four <laughs> public sites to the building. Uh, this project did go to the Urban Design Committee, in my estimation, because I'm on that committee, an unprecedented three different times uh, to address not only design, but materials and screening uh, of mechanical equipment, et cetera. And it is important for this project to have good access, and it has access uh, for both K Street and L Street on the north and the south, and then also from 20th Street on the east side of the property. And it's very viable, very necessary for the viability of the retail area. Uh, the, the tax increment financing, we have uh, estimated at $2 million that the property can support. Uh, it's utilized for pretty standard uh, uses, eligible uses, in accordance with the community development law. And we have advocated, and the redevelopment agreement does reflect a note A and a note B, and that's because we're, cert we're uncertain on how this property will be valued. We know this. We know that downtown housing is valued different than housing on the perimeter. There's, a, there's another property that's pretty similar to this that has a much different value. We're just not certain how that Lancaster County Assessor is going to treat this, so we try to use a very conservative calculation to really size Node A, and that's uh, consequently why we try to break it up into Node A and Node B. Uh, moving forward, uh, the schedule is anticipated. If, if we uh, are able to get your approval on July 13th, the voting session, it's anticipated that grading would occur this fall and hopefully footings and foundations would go in this fall so vertical construction could continue with uh, compl construction completion sometime probably late fall 2021. And with that, I'd be asking for your support and be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions for Mr. Houston? Seeing none, thank, thank you so you. much. Is there anyone else who would like to come and testify on this issue? Come on up and please uh, say your name and address for the record, please. Richard Halverson, 6311, Ivernus Road here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And well, the terms, I have issue with here, moderate income, work, workforce income. Uh, why can't we just get a number? Why can't they just say these apartments, because I'm, you know, I'm sitting back and saying, what does this mean? You know, fifty-seven thousand dollars a year, forty-seven. You know, why can't they just come up here and say this is going to cost? I hate to throw out a figure because it's been a long while since I rented an apartment, and I know they've gone up a lot from when I was renting. In fact, I've seen. It, I thought you got to be kidding me. You know, even 
existing. So I would like when they have their presentation, so maybe the public can get some idea of what we're partly subsidizing by the TIF, what exactly the rents are. Because again, uh, when you hear moderate workforce, you know, uh, affordable, what what are they talking about? Again, I would just like, you know, have a state they will run from X to Y, you know. You know, maybe two, whatever, two bedroom, three bedroom, whatever, just state the rate flat out so we have some idea what what it's going to be. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on this uh, item? My name is Fred Hoppy. I'm the developer of this project. I've been working on it a long time. We set this building and the rents in it. Two, we, we haven't pegged down from downtown rents. We're trying to set the rents at about 80% of those in our neighborhood. And uh, the reason why is because we build workforce housing. And, uh, say what you will, workforce is what the average people make in town. And that we target 80 to 100 percent when we're looking at workforce of median income. That's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of different measurements involved. When I hear someone say affordable housing, normally that I think low income housing tax credit, that's 60 percent median income and below. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's a, it's a semantics game because really you want to look at, as just mentioned, what the numbers are. Right. And in this case, we're, we're trying to reach the Sorry. 80 to 100%. And with the help of TIF, we can kind of do that in this. But it is a, construction prices are pretty tough these days. So anyway. We'd like your support. Um, we think it's a good project. We work closely with the city to put it together. Um, it's got some unique details. As Tom indicated, that it is a very unusual kind of downtown commercial on the first level because it's in between those three uh, major streets. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of retail at Target. So for a lot of different reasons, we appreciate, we, we'd appreciate your support and, and we're ready to go if, if as soon as this piece is finished. And, and I'll answer any questions and, and, and uh, Jake, one of the other developers is here, he can give you what the actual rents are targeting. Uh, uh, off top of his head, I can't. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Hoppy? If, well, um, if, the, if you said, uh, Mr. Hoppy, thank you for coming down, and you yeah. said that uh, Jake Hoppy could tell us what those range of rents would be, I would be curious to have those that information. He was hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hoppy, thank you. Thank Your you. talent has already been sold. Jake Hoppy, uh, 301 South 57th Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so we have, it's, it really is around 80% of fair market value. So uh, like a one bedroom or a studio would be around 850 a month. A one bedroom would be around 1,000 and a two bedroom, two bath would be around 1,200. Thank you very much. Sure. Does anyone have any more questions for uh, either of the Hoppies? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Director Marvin, is there any other questions for Director Marvin? Pick me, pick me. Mr. Tobin? <laughs> Marvin, would you help me for a second? This is going to be a little bit out there. Are you ready? Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Um, I'm the, this, this property has been on the east and the west by South Antelope on the west and 20th Street on the east. Tw yes, 20th Street on the east. 20th Street already has some parking issues with staff people working at Nelnet and visiting the other shops mm -hmm. will there be any provisions for adjustments or, or improvements to that street as part of this development um was, have they, let me do that again have you had any conversations today about 20th about, street yes to the extent that we've had conversations about 20th street that i remember um 
It's the number of curb cuts. We're taking three curb cuts to 20th Street. Originally, there were more, which would provide, you know, for street parking, a few more locations. We don't kill off as, as many spots on street. Um, I think the street's in, in, in need of repair, but um, there will be a sidewalk that will be installed along that section of the road as well. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to know if you had the conversation. Okay. Any other questions for Director Marvin? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. Is there anyone else who wanted to testify on this? Because I think I saw you raise your hand. Yep, come on up. Hi, how's it going? Hey. Yeah. Uh, my name is Caleb Peterson. C Do I have to spell it? Yes. C-A-L-E-B-P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. Um, can I ask a like, question to you or to, like, is that possible or is it just a statement? Just a statement for right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say that in the wording that I, that I saw in, I think it was, I can't remember which section it was, but it was talking about it includes, um, it is not limited to, but includes, uh, will include those who need housing vouchers um, will be able to live in the apartment and I think that we could possibly have it be pursued or have there be some sort of intention to intention to include rather than just that it's possible to include uh, those who need housing vouchers. Maybe there would be a percentage of the uh, housing apartments that we pursue that so that there is um, possibility for more people who fit maybe in the lower, lower tier of that 60% uh, of medium, e medium income that it might be harder to get housing in that area with it being just north of um, near South neighborhood and uh, just wanting to reflect the, the uh, closer community rather than just the median income of all of Lincoln. So thank you so much for your yeah. testimony. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak on this item? All right, Santa, um, we will go ahead and move on to the next item, please. Calling item 60, change of zone 20016, application of Lincoln Federal Bank Corp, Inc. for a change from AG Agriculture District to R3 Residential District and from AG Agriculture District to P Public District on property generally located at South 27th Street to South 40th Street and Rokeby Road to Yankee Hill Road. Is anyone here to testify on this? And I believe that we had uh, received a request to uh, ask for a motion to delay this for two weeks, the public hearing for two weeks. Correct. Do you have any motions for I that? I would ask for a motion to delay the public hearing for two weeks so on July 13th. I would like to do that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chauvin. Can I get a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Raybould. Is there any discussion? Delay. Seeing none, I would ask for a vote, please. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Show? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried 5 to 0. Right. Moving on to the next item, please. Calling item 6E is amending sections 2.18.020 and 2.18.030 of the LMC relating to purchasing division to amend the threshold modifications and addition of service reference to correspond with the approved charter changes. Good evening, Council. Bob Walla, City County Purchasing Agent. Uh, this is a change in the threshold, the bidding threshold for the city. Uh, the voters approved this increase back in May. Uh, what it does is it takes the formal bid threshold from 25,000 to 50,000. The purchasing de department will still process the um, bids between 3,000 and 50,000 as informal bids. So we will still be doing um, quite a bit of what we call quotes, uh, but we will have uh, less bids that will go through the newspaper, which means we'll be able to expedite some of those quotes and bids and um, save us a little bit of money in advertising as well. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Mr. Wall? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, please. Ordinance's third reading with continued public hearing and action. Item 7A is change of zone 20009, 
Application of Civil Design Group on behalf of Tuscany Townhomes LLC, Perry Family Real Estate LLC, and Sherry True for a change from R3 Residential District to R3 Planned Unit Development to allow up to 130,000 square feet of commercial floor area and up to 322 single and multifamily dwelling units with waivers to the zoning and subdivision regulations and from AGR Agriculture Residential to R3 PUD. Development for that portion of Lot 182 zoned on the property generally located at South 59th Street and Pine Lake Road. All right, Good evening, you. Council Members. Mike Eckert with Civil Design Group on behalf of the uh, applicants that were mentioned. Uh, we were before you about three weeks ago and we had some confusion amongst one of our neighbors and so we resolved to uh, get that taken care of and we did. I think we worked out a nice private agreement that will help us out, uh, help everybody out. And so they were happy. I think you should have received some correspondence from their attorney, Danae Kalkowski, that they were no longer in opposition to the multifamily area. Um, I'll give you a quick quick background as we didn't get into it at the other hearing because we did move to uh, do the deferral at that point. But this is a somewhat unique area of Lincoln in that now over time it is generally surrounded by uh, development. Um, and so you have Pine Lake Road here on the south and a little bit off the screen there to the left is 56th Street uh, to give you your bearings. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a representation of uh, actually eight uh, acreages that existed in this area for since the late 80s. Um, South 59th Street is platted, but it is a gravel road. And so we worked with a few of these individuals back in 07 and we couldn't get everybody on the same page to go forward. They weren't in that point in their lives. And so we have now. So the PUD represents the different areas. The PUD is going to be an overlay district and that represents the areas down by Pine Lake will be office and commercial, um, single family and attached townhomes over in that area, and then an area of multifamily. And then the commercial area can also have multifamily in it. And so uh, we worked extensively with staff to do this in a generic manner so we could get uh, two of the first few projects going here, which will, which will come shortly. Uh, and so then each individual owner, though, has to come forward and do an amendment to the PUD to show their specific uses and where their detention is going to be and all those good items and staff will review it. And so as long as we're in conformance, though, with the uses as shown here, they will approve those administratively. Um, and so uh, a good infill, if you will. Um, we, we always think of infill as near downtown or other areas, but this is completely surrounded now by established uh, development, uh, floodplain on the east. And, and as such, I always like to point out the, um, the benefit uh, of a development like this to the city, particularly since we have Pine Lake just got improved and 56th Street's improved. But I calculated if we were to build it out at about 75% of our allowed densities because we have mixes there. And um, the site would generate $745,000 in the arterial street impact fees about 330,000 in sewer and water and about 57 for 57,000 for parks and rec. And so and the, and the the sales tax just the city's portion of the sales tax generated on the full build out of all those things would probably equate to another $700,000 so close to 2 million. Um, and so it's uh, it's going to help district 6 in terms of the impact fees for roads and I just like to always point that out when we have a fresh project like this. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Does anyone have any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. Is there anyone who would like to testify on this item? All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and end public hearing uh, for this section. We can now vote on this item 7A. A change of zone 20009, application and civil design group on behalf of Tuscany Townhomes LLC, Perry Family Real Estate LLC, and Sherry True for a change from R3 Residential District to R3 PUD planned unit development to allow up to 130,000 square feet of commercial floor area and up to 322 single and multifamily dwelling units with waivers to the zoning and subdivision regulations. And from AGR Agriculture Residential to R3 PUD planned unit development for that portion of Lot 182 zoned. And from AGR Agriculture Residential to Public Lot 
165, a portion of Lot 23, and that portion of Lots 8, 115, 137, Zone AGR Agriculture Residential, and from R3 Residential to P Public for Lots 8, 115, 137, and that portion of Lot 165, Zone R3, all generally located at South 59th Circle and Pine Lake Road, introduced by Washington. So moved. Second. Introduced by Washington, seconded by Councilwoman Raybould. Uh, is there any discussion? Councilman Cho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank Mr. Eckert for his work working with the neighbors to get this agreement in place. And I want to also say more housing in Lincoln is, is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And thank particularly you. infill housing, too. Yes. yes. So, thank you. Like she said. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Right. May we have a vote, please? Shob. Yes. Raybould. Yes. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried, five to zero. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, item, ordinances, third reading, and related resolutions. Item 8A, Street and Alley Vacation 19007, application of WPLA LLC, the Arter Group to vacate the North 40th Street right-of-way from the north line of Huntington Avenue to the south line of Baldwin Avenue, generally located adjacent to 4000 Huntington Avenue and 3711 Baldwin Avenue. This was introduced by Christensen. So, so moved. moved. I'll second. She moved it. I'll second it. Introduced by Councilman Raybould, seconded by Councilman Schaub. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, I would ask for a vote. Ward? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried, five to zero. Next item, please. Item 8B, change of zone 19025, application of WPLA LLC, the Arter Group for a change from R5 residential district to R6 residential district on property generally located at 4000 Huntington Avenue and 3711 Baldwin Avenue, introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Introduced by Councilman Cho, seconded by Councilwoman Raybold. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask for a vote, please. Shobe. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Motion carried 5 to 0. Stupid microphone. Moving on to the next item, please. Item 8C, amending Title 20 of the Lincoln Municipal Code by adding a new Chapter 20.14 titled Lincoln Energy Code by adopting the residential provisions of the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code with associated amendments for regulate, regulating and guiding the design and construction of energy conservation and efficiency components and equipment of residential buildings introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Worked at that. Introduced by Councilman Shoves, seconded by Councilwoman Raybould. Is we there an do have a motion to amend one and two? Yes, I would like to motion to amend uh, this one, uh, First Amendment 2074. This motion would reinsert the section regarding mechanical ventilation. Second. Introduced by second. Introduced by Councilman Washington, seconded by Councilman Shobe. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, um, I would ask for a vote on that amendment, please. Warren? A clarification of yes. what this does, Sandra, All right. our councilwoman. So the uh, international uh, code, the uh, residential provisions for the international uh, building codes, um, there, uh, the committee met in uh, with the building and safety. Uh, the com the community um, committee met. They came forward with five recommendations. Um, they uh, originally they had been modified by the mayor's office. Um, after more discussion, more information, um, the mayor's office decided to um, pull these back, and so and just in support um, for. Uh, the building committee uh, we are going to now uh, put back in the opportunity to um, to reinsert the section that says we do not have to have a mechanical ventilation system on each of the new houses being built 
It's a double negative. Yeah. Which is always confusing. Section 20.14.050. Yes. And then I think, that, does anyone else have any other discussion that they would like to ask? I guess I have a clarifying question because we have a second amendment. Mm -hmm. So we vote yes on this one first and then we vote yes on the second. Okay, I'm up to speed. Okay, uh, introduced by Councilman Washington, seconded by Councilman Schaub. Um, seeing no further discussion, I would ask for a vote. Schaub? Yes. Ward? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Okay, back to the main motion. Oh, no. I have a, need yes. a motion for a motion to amend two. One more amendment. One more amendment. So, oh. I'll, you want it? I'll take it. Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to move to motion, motion to amend number two that addresses uh, insulation, R values, and basement units of new buildings. Second. Introduced by Councilman Shove, seconded by Councilwoman Raybold. Is there any discussion? So, okay. Seeing none. Then I would ask for a vote on the Second Amendment. Yep. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shoeb? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Okay. Now the main motion. Now, thank you. <laughs> now the motion is amended. Now the main. Ward? <laughs> yes. Shoeb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Washington? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Moving on to the uh, next item, please. Item 8D <laughs> is amending Title 20 of the Lincoln Municipal Code by repealing Chapter 20.10 2 and adding a new Chapter 20.12 titled Lincoln Residential Building Code by adopting the 2018 International Residential Code for one and two family dwellings with associated amendments for regulating and controlling the design, construction, alteration, quality of materials, and repair of one and two family dwellings introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Introduced by Councilman Show, seconded by Councilwoman Washington. Is there any discussion? I would like to um, offer some comments. I think that both the previous motion and this motion um, will really do a lot for uh, making the new construction in Lincoln more environmentally uh, efficient uh, by reducing our utility costs and also add a degree of uh, increased uh, building safety. And I am really pleased that our process for amending our building codes has a robust public process and that it worked again. Thank you so much. Any further comment? Councilwoman Raybould? I do want to thank the task force because it's not easy to read through these codes because sometimes they're a little bit of gobbledygook, but I really commend the task force because they are the skilled contractors, electricians, plumbers, um, HVAC people. So I really commend them for donating a big chunk of their time to do that. And also the Home Builders Association, really, they're the ones that are out there executing on all of these changes and trying to understand them and, and still trying to deliver housing in the most cost effective and cost efficient way for uh, the new property owners. So I want to thank all that group of people working with building and safety to come up uh, with a, a good solid program going forward and updating our codes because it's not an easy thing to do. It takes time and a lot of work by many people. So thanks uh, to those who are all involved. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, I would ask for a vote, please. Washington? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Ward? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Okay. Moving on to the next section, please. Okay, that concludes our uh, ordinance's third reading. Resolutions, first readings are items 9A through 9D. Ordinance's first readings and related resolutions are items 10A through 10R. We have pending list items 11A through 11E. Those are all my items on the agenda. We will now move into the public comment section of the meeting. Uh, public comment provides an opportunity to speak on any issue that's not on the agenda for today nor planned for a future agenda. For this meeting, we are accepting public comment either in person or through webinar. We will be starting with individuals that are here in the chamber to testify.
And when everyone in the chamber has testified, we will then move on to speak to those who are in the, through the webinar. The city clerk will call your name up when it is your turn. And when you arrive at the podium, please state and spell your name and say your address for the record. Public comment is limited to five minutes per speaker, and we will have a timer to uh, let everyone know when you have one minute left. We have the time frame uh, in place in order to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Uh, do we have anyone that would like to uh, be the first uh, to participate in public comment? I actually have our list. Oh, you have your list. I yeah. just Thank you so much. Nope. First, please uh, come to the mic, W.F. Hoppy. That's Fred Hoppy, right? Is that Fred? Okay. We'll skip. We have Bruce Eibel. So that you can hear me more clear. Thank you. My name is Bruce Eibel. I live at 1500 Garrett Lane, apartment 107, Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm here, I'd like, to be, I'd like to make sure that we understand why I'm here today. The City Council of Lincoln, Nebraska is considering withdrawing money used to operate our law enforcement agencies. <clears throat> Let's look at the issue from a different perspective than the current sensationalized national narrative and ask this question. How many lives were lost because law enforcement agencies were not able to do their jobs properly. The protests over George Floyd resulted in more than 15 times the loss of his life. Human civilization has been ruled by laws for thousands of years. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has been a cornerstone for all of these laws. There have been times that some laws were not good and were corrected. And there have been other times when people or a person took the law into their own hands and made up their own rules, as in a mob, a bad autocrat, or dictator. The important thing to note is that throughout history, the law was corrected or altered to ensure the fairness and equality of all people. But the system of law has never been destroyed. Why? because the system works. I do not believe we should eliminate a system that has been in place for millennia. Because of some isolated mistakes, I am not diminished, I am not diminishing the tragedies that a very small number of officers have made. Our law enforcement agencies were created and designed to protect the lives and property of the vast majority of innocent, law-abiding citizens from the small percentage of those who are not. However, we do not live in a perfect world. The people of the justice system were given authority to enforce the laws we wrote and to keep the peace. This has been the basis for our way of life all through global human history. And they make mistakes just as we all do. Law and order is a system that works, and we should constantly be improving that system. So let's alter, correct, and improve it, not destroy a historically proven process. The answer is not to take money away from those that put their lives on the line every day to protect us and our property. Instead of defunding our law enforcement agencies, we should provide them with whatever tools they need to make those alterations and improvements. This will ensure the greater good of public safety and security for all citizens of Lincoln and Lancaster County, Nebraska. As a concerned and sincere citizen, I thank you for listening. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, Patricia Eibel. I'm Patricia Eibel, E-Y-B-E-L, 1500 Garrett Lane, number 107. I could just say ditto to what my husband just said, but 
I'll add a few thoughts of my own. Um, let me let me start by saying that I am um, troubled by the unrest and the division in our nation right now. I'm deeply saddened by the loss of life, by the show of prejudice, by the violence. But even so, with all that, I think that often during tragic times even, there can be opportunity for us to stop and evaluate and make changes, um, much needed changes, that are for the good of all people. I think to defund our police would be counterproductive. I don't think it would be for the good of all people. I think it would be just the opposite. I think that we would see more violence, more loss of life, more division. I believe we need our police. They are not perfect. Our nation is not perfect. But even with our flaws, we're the best nation there ever was. So I just believe that the majority of our police are honorable, have integrity, and respect our people and our laws. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. OK, next up. I have Mike Wooten, and then on deck would be Jack Nebelsick. Good evening. My name is Mike Wooten, and it's a pleasure to come before you today. Honorable representatives, I sincerely express my gratitude to you for the opportunity to have my voice heard. I also acknowledge that I recognize your role as God's ordained civil magistrates to uphold justice, to punish the lawless and those that do evil, and to praise and uplift those that do good. Thank you for your attention today. My purpose in coming before you this day is to be a witness in support of the Lincoln Police Department and a voice along with the vast majority of taxpaying citizens of Lincoln in support of and sincere thankfulness for the Lincoln Police Department. The Lincoln Police Department has done an exemplary job in serving and protecting the citizens of Lincoln for many decades. According to records, zero incidents of suspects shot and killed by officers from the LPD from 2017 to 2019. There were zero incidents. God states in his word that the law was not made for a righteous people, but for the lawless. That being said, I believe we would all agree that Lincoln has its fair share of lawless people. For this and much more, we not only need the Lincoln Police Department, but we need to increase their funding for more training and more officers. As our city has grown and continues to grow, so does the necessity to construct larger detention facilities to incarcerate the lawless. I worked for the city of Lincoln as a correctional officer back in the 70s and for Lancaster County Corrections when the jail was in the basement of this building. As the city grew, so did the detention facility and they added it on to the south end of this construct. As the city continued to grow, as you know, they put they built a, the jail out on West O Street, the largest facility ever for our city. For this and much more, we not only need the Lincoln Police Department, but we need to increase their funding for more training and more officers. The exemplary record of the Lincoln Police Department does not in any way justify any defunding or reduction of it. In fact, the record does justify that the mayor and this city council keep their agreement to accept the federal grant 
that gives $635,000 over three years to fund five more additional police officers and provide training. We are a society of rules, law, and order. This council session is proof of that. Mobs do not dictate to us. Mobs whose very freedom of assembly and speech were given those freedoms because of the power of rule, law, and order. For this and much more, we not only need the Lincoln Police Department, but we need to increase their funding for more training and more officers. As God's ordained civil magistrates and as representatives of the people, by the people, and for the people, it is your duty to hear the majority voice of law-abiding citizens and not give in to the fear-mongering, despiteful, and hateful sound One minute. of the mob. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Jack Nebelsek. On deck would be Miss Jane Kinsey. Yes, Jack Nebelsek, N E B E L S I C K. We live at 6040 Old Farm Circle, down by the Electrical Workers Union. It's always been for me a little intimidating to come before you, but uh, I wanted, I wonder what, always wanted to say that. Uh, I respect this group uh, for the responsibility you have of running this great city. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you and hear you deliberate. But today I'm here to speak also to the value of the Lincoln Police Department. <clears throat> it's been my good fortune to have been born and raised here in Lincoln, Nebraska. This city has been friendly, orderly, and respectful of citizens all during my life. I've always viewed the police department, county sheriff, fire department as vital to maintaining that order and respect. Uh, to request a decrease in police funding now would require even less of police presence in the community than now provided, which is 11.6 per 10,000 people, would be less than that with the increase in our, our uh, population. In the face of current added community tensions, it also defies common sense to now decrease funding. Rather, common sense would require a city budget increase to the police department. In that regard, I would respectfully urge the city council and the mayor to honor the purpose of the new federal grant the city has tentatively been uh, awarded that provides for the funding for the five additional police officers for that department. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up is Ms. Jane Kinsey. On deck is Cami San Sanzels. Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. Uh, I want to start by saying Watchdogs is not against protests. We marched and held our banner high in the Occupy, Occupy Lincoln protests. However, protests do not speak to law. They speak to, to emotions and not plans of action. There is a limit to what they can accomplish. The only way to reform the system is in a thoughtful, methodical way. This country, as all success, um, successful countries, is built on the rule of law. Courts are designed to implement law and police are given directions to report infractions of law. So, because humans are flawed, society is also, and the people who carry it out. But to demand that other people conform to one's expectations and that society be torn down because of one's hurt and disappointment will not succeed. No one's life is safe in a lawless society. 
Just think about the Arab Spring and its protests and its overthrow of despots and order. Right now, these countries or whatever is left have either more dictatorship and or chaos with war. The pandemic and protests have given people all over the world pause to reevaluate their lives and society at large. Yes, police have members who have used their authority in a harmful way. Who hasn't been on the receiving end of this? Personally, I have been stopped by police or the state patrol more than 20 times since I've lived in Nebraska. The only sensible choice is to correct this, is to present one's case in the judicial system. Otherwise, one's life is in jeopardy if one reacts at the time of the incident. Yes, racism, sexism, and exploitation, exploitation exists all over the world. Think of slavery of minorities, women and children bound in a patriarchal system, teenage girls given in marriage to older men, Jews led to the gas chamber by Nazis, and Japanese American moved to internment camps in World War II. The past cannot be changed. All that thoughtful people can do is learn from these injustices and not repeat them. Forget the cries to disband the police. Without police, there is no guardian of law and order. Forget the calls that this is a racist society. Reality defies this because an American, African American, was elected president not once, but twice, with 51% of the voting public. And this council has four or five members of a minority on it. So Lincoln is not a racist society either. Forget the call for reparations. There is not enough money in the world to repay everyone who has received injustice. The only successful way for redress in an orderly society mm -hmm. is through modification of laws or new laws by elected officials. This is democracy and the mechanism is given to common people so they have the power to set the course of their lives and country. Any other means is anarchy. Don't be fooled by loud voices and persistent media coverage of them. They drown out rational solutions. The way of Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi was for systematic change. May your rational heads prevail as you pass ordinances and we all move forward from this moment in history. I sent some of this to the Lincoln Journal Star and they refused to print it. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to be able to speak in a public forum and, forum and to let um, the citizens of Lincoln and you know about it. Thank you, Ms. Kenzie. Next up is Cami. Up on deck is Liam Kreikmeyer. Uh, good evening. My name is Cameron Sanix, K-A-M-R-Y-N, last name Sanix, S-A-N-N-I-C-K-S, and I live at 1420 Old Farm Road. Uh, I came to speak tonight to ask you all to take initiative and show that you care about my life and the lives of brown, black and brown people that look like me in the city of Lincoln. Uh, you are all appointed or elected leaders uh, just by simply running for office and sitting here today. Um, and it, I would really like to see that from you. Um, I'm 22 and I should not be living every day uh, as it could be my last. Um, as a black queer woman, the reality of waking up tired yet continuing to fight is a reality for many of us um, that should not exist. Uh, my ask of all of you tonight is to think hard 
about the current Lincoln Police Department budget and the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, uh, specifically in regard to the increased uh, budget um, to add officers and provide body cams while also cutting necessary services for our city like libraries. Um, the, the, the addition of, of body cams for the final implementation will not do anything to change what has happened. Uh, we've seen across the nation and in our own city that body cams and being filmed does not stop police misconduct or police brutality. Um, as, a, as a city, we can do much more by, uh, by cutting their budget um, and also saving, uh, and also providing for resources for many that don't have current resources. Um, I would also like to offer a clarification that defunding is different than abolition. Uh, defunding is simply cutting funds, whereas abolition is removing funds. Um, much of the testimony we have already heard thinks that defunding is the abolition. While abolition is the only way to solve for uh, systematic injustices, I am simply here to ask you to defund those systems in order to start fixing it. Um, and one day, hopefully, we can get to abolition. Um, while sitting here in the chamber, I came up with a few creative solutions uh, while also learning how you all do your business. Uh, some of those solutions to divest from the police could be investing in mental health resources that is adequate for everyone, um, investing in social workers that are ready to handle, uh, handle situations of distress much better than the police have ever been able to handle, um, uh, investing in economic uh, success for black and brown residents. Um, those can be through uh, business loans and grants. Um, those can be through ensuring that your black and brown residents are employed at the same rate of your white residents. Um, those are just some of the creative solutions that I came up with while sitting right there in that chair and watching uh, you all debate what we can do right now during a pandemic to help our businesses stay open and alive. Um, those, these situations have not just started at the beginning of this month or the end of last month. These situations have been around for generations. Um, and as I've lived in Lincoln uh, for 20 of my 22 years of life, um, I have grown, grown up knowing that this city does not work for me. Um, that this city is not here for me. Yet I still want to stay in this city to make it better for people that look like me. Um, I am not here to cause issues. Um, as most of you know me, I am here to better our city. I'm here to ensure that when I continue to live in this city, that I don't feel unsafe leaving my door, that my little sister doesn't have to ask me to ensure that she is home before the curfew even sets in so that she does not die, even though that that curfew was not constitutional, that I should have been allowed to stay outside and protest for my right to live. Um, those things should not be happening in our city. I, I should be able to walk through my neighborhood in South Lincoln and not feel watched and profiled as many of my white neighbors ride their bikes without a worry in the world. I can't run on our trails in our city without feeling unsafe because I watched Ahmaud Arbery be gunned down in his own neighborhood. If we think that Lincoln is any different One minute. Than, than, than Georgia or Chicago or New York, it is not. We are being passive with our ways to, to to look at these issues and we are just shrugging them off. I prepared something to speak while I was sitting in this chair, but I've gone off script because this is so important. I am tired of risking getting a virus that we don't know how it can affect us and it affects people that look like me more than it affects people that look like you for the most part. I, I should be able to live and work in my community and, and be able to trust my neighbors, but that is not possible if we continue to fund the police department at the rate that it is being funded. Most of you campaigned on the ideal of equality and that equality only seems to matter to my queer identity and not to my black identity. I would really like you to think about that ideal when you campaign and when you talk about those things. I would like to live in a city that is safe for me and safe for my siblings and safe for me to, to raise my future children in. So that's what I came here to say. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Up next is Liam. On deck is Franchon Blythe. Hello. My name is Liam Krakemeyer. That is L-I-A-M-K-R-E-I-K-E-M-E-I-E-R. -E 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 and I live at 3743 Woods Avenue. Uh, so I have two topics to address real quick. Um, and first, I don't know if Lynn Johnson is still here, uh, but I would just like to thank him and the city of Lincoln uh, for the great way that they have opened the pools. I think it's been uh, 
very efficient and uh, just great with the contact tracing and uh, good that they were able to open during this pandemic. Because um, I, I do work at Woods Pool, which is just a couple blocks up from my house. Um, and so, but moving into this, uh, I don't represent the views of Parks and Rec, um, but I'm just kind of speaking as an employee. Um, and so we do have uh, occasionally some problems that arise at Woods Pool with the patrons uh, causing issues and starting fights. And it became quite a problem last year that eventually they brought in a resource officer and the problems, they disappeared. It, it helped so much just to have that person there as a deterrent. Um, he would walk the deck. Uh, he was very kind. Um, we got to uh, know all the people that are, all the cops that were coming through as the resource officers and it just made me feel safer to be at work. Um, unfortunately this year uh, with the different budget and everything we've had to put a couple different staff doing that same position um, and so I mean it's the burlier staff members um, and so I just think that it is unnecessary to cut any funding um, to the police department because I think our town is unique where we do such a great job with the community policing with the resource officers and the patrolling um, I can see no problems and I think it was brought up earlier about how there have been no major incidences since about 2013 or probably even before that um, and so I just think that they are the best equipped to handle such tense situations that we would see at the pool. Um, it, you know, would sometimes get crazy out of hand, um, even though they could be teenage kids. Uh, and so I just think that they do such a great job. And then again, being in the neighborhood that I'm in, um, my dad is part of the neighborhood association and uh, he knows uh, Chief Blymeister and uh, Chief Blymeister knows his name and you know they it, they create such a personal connection um, and so I know that there is this federal grant that is on the table floating around uh, that could go to fund five new police officers and I just think it would be unwise to withhold that funding uh, because as it is now some of the numbers show that we are at a lower standard than some of the other cities at the same population that we have um, and that ratio, you know, uh, having those extra officers would be able to help with that policing. Uh, and so I just think it would, uh, if we had fewer police officers for our growing population, it just, I don't think it would go over well. We could see an uptick in crimes and uh, so, uh, civil unrest and everything. Um, and so I just think that uh, my full support goes to Lincoln, the Lincoln Police Department, and they do such a great job of policing our, our dear city. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Fanshawn Blythe, F-A-N-C-H-O-N-B-L-Y-T-H-E. I live at 3747 Broadbear Road. I'm here to express my full support for Chief Blymeister and the entire police department for the amazing job they do to keep the peace and to protect the citizens of Lincoln. I personally have organized two unity parade rallies to back the blue and show them the kind of support they deserve. Lincoln's police department needs encouragement during these difficult times. Our police department has been experiencing unmerited criticism. They have been held back from doing their jobs to protect and enforce the law. Over 27 have been injured during the riot on May 30th. I personally was there until after 2 a.m. standing in the gas station parking lot with the owner and I witnessed it all. And they came back and then I came back on Sunday morning to help clean up the graffiti. Our officers endured a lot that night from being spit on, hit with water bottles filled with urine and gasoline. They had, thrown, they had been thrown at them. Illegal mortars 
Fireworks they hoped would mix with the gasoline and would catch fire. Also, paintball guns. Four firearm bullets hit the Hall of Justice that night. This crowd was warned multiple times from the state patrol to stand down and go home. I pray I will never experience anything like that again. Yet, after all of that, our officers performed their duties with restraint. They deserve our respect and gratitude. Our police are understaffed, but you council members have a chance to help correct that. The 635,000 federal COP grant that the mayor applied for and this council approved and certified the funds would be, appreciate, uh, would be accepted if the funds are awarded. I have been told the mayor no longer wants to accept these funds because of pressure she is getting from BLM. This council needs to keep your promise to the police force and to the citizens of Lincoln by accepting the awarded grant. Five new officers will be added to the police department and the grant will pay for them for three years. Accepting this grant makes common sense and will save the taxpayers money in the long run. Thank you for your time and I hope that you will support our police department and accept that grant. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'll be calling Zach Tyson. Up next would be Nadine Nebelsek. On deck would be Tom Nebelsek. Uh, Tom Nebelsick, N-E-B-E-L-S-I-C-K, 6125 The Knowles, Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm here to express support for LPD, as well as the many others who put a uniform on every day to stand up and protect us, keep our communities and our state safe. And there are many others besides Lincoln Police Department. If this grant should be approved, I'd urge that you would accept those funds and put them to good use through its intended purpose uh, to continue keeping our city safe. As I listen to uh, all the testimony tonight, it occurs to me that something of this nature that affects our entire city and outlying area is in the hands of a very few people. I respect what you're charged with doing, your jobs. If it's that large of a portion of the population that's affected, why wouldn't we put something like this on the general ballot to let people decide if they wanted to defund the police department and risk the effects of less protection. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is Nadine Nebelsek? Not here. Not here. Okay. Moving on to Cindy Wendelin. Hi, I'm Cindy Wendelin, uh, C-I-N-D-Y, W-E-N-D-E-L-I-N. -E uh, my address is 16501 Southwest 42nd Street, Martell, Nebraska, which you'll miss it if you sneeze as you go by, but I am in Lancaster County. I have lived in and around Lancaster County all of my life. Uh, I'm a public school teacher my career choice and I have taught a multitude of people from all walks of culture as well as friendships now from all walks of culture. I hadn't planned on talking tonight and I don't have anything prepared but I just want to talk to you from my heart. Um, 
I was listening to all the plans that we have to build more places, to house more families, to bring in more good people into our community. And that's a marvelous thing. And here we have the funding available to add five more to our police force, which is going to be absolutely needed. Living here all of my life, I have never, ever felt insecure or afraid because I knew there were uh, policemen to uh, protect me. I was a kindergarten teacher, elementary school teacher, and that was one of the first things we always did with the children is let them know the policemen were their friend. I know there have been bad mistakes made, but I also know who we are as a people, and we bring the good out in each other. And I would just encourage you to allow five new police officers to be here to promote that kind of relationship between the public and the officers. Um, I watch what has happened in Minneapolis, and I'm sure you all have too, and it's tragic for everyone. I just don't want chaos in a place where we can prevent it. Uh, with the defunding of the police officers in Minneapolis, I'm sure you're aware of what has happened. We want you protected. We want to be protected. We want our city to be the safest place it can be. But since the defunding in Minneapolis, you know that there are three city council members that are now getting private security to the funny tune of uh, so far, it's cost them $635,000 in the last three weeks. Uh, didn't have to be. We have the opportunity to help rather than create confusion and chaos. So I would ask you, as a lifetime Lincolnite, to help make our city safe and keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, I'm, I believe it says Earl. I can't read the last name. I'll call that name again towards the end. We'll move on to Kyle Lamb. Okay. Brettles Bean. Brad, yes, sorry, thank you. Good evening. My name is Brad Beam, B R A D B E A M, 3710 Woods Avenue. I am so thankful for our outstanding law enforcement officers. We are truly blessed with exceptional law enforcement in Lincoln, Nebraska. As a person who was born and raised in Lincoln, I want to share several observations. First, I want to draw your attention to my two-page handout, which is the first item, and it's called Policing Principles from the Lincoln Police Department website. Lincoln Policing Model is based upon community policing principles. The primary goal is working cooperatively with individual citizens, groups of citizens, and both public and private groups to identify and resolve issues which affect the livability of specific neighborhoods and the city as a whole. The Lincoln Police Department is one of the longest community-based policing programs in the United States, having been implemented in the 1970s here in Lincoln. I hope you will take a moment to review the Lincoln policing principles that are on the city website if you haven't already viewed those before. As part of our community-based policing legacy, I want to draw your attention to Lincoln's history of law enforcement involvement in our community. Here are a few ways law enforcement has been involved over the years. I played youth football in elementary school and junior high. The police department has sponsored a youth football team since the 1950s. 
It's one of the longest sponsors of youth football in the city of Lincoln. When I was a seventh grader, I played in a basketball league at the Salvation Army. My team was sponsored by the police department. Two police officers were the coaches of our teams. In junior and senior high, we had great resource officers at Lincoln East. One was named Ollie Weiser, and he let us call him Budweiser. <laughs> right. He had a great sense of humor and was a terrific representative of the police department. One of the best known activities is the Santa Cops program, which started in 1980. The Lincoln Police Union Charities has distributed almost three quarters of a million dollars in gifts to Lincoln children over the years. The Lincoln uh, Police Union Charities has also supported and continues to support the Center for People in Need, YMCA Strong Kids Program, Friendship Home, and similar charities. As many on the council know, because I've talked to you about animal issues before, I am very active in animal rescue initiatives across the country. Lincoln has a spotlight organization that's known across the country. It's called Second Chance Pups. Dogs are pulled from area shelters and rescue groups. The dogs are placed in a nine-week training program at the penitentiary. Inmates care for and train the dogs. The dogs are then adopted into homes. Inmates learn new skills and give back to the community. Second Chance Pups began in 2004 and is under the direction of Lincoln Police Officer Melissa Ripley. Let's not forget that police provide assistance with many of Lincoln's most popular events. I'm talking about Uncle Sam Jam, gay pride festivals, marathons, as well as foot ga football game, uh, game day activities. So the legacy of involvement in our community by our local <laughs> law enforcement um, officers is exceptional. I could go on and on about our, how our community has been benefited by great law enforcement. Uh, I don't know, is Chief Plymeister here tonight? I didn't see him, but I was going to thank him or tell him to please share my appreciation with the officers and staff of the One police minute. department. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for your testimony, Brad. Up next is Lou Bratz, and on deck is Brandy Johnson. swearing in on this part okay first off oh come on oh sorry I never can get this right oh turn it around the other way, it is that way. yep Just didn't there wait long enough all right uh, ladies and gentlemen Team council members, again, my name is Lou Bratz. You guys have had my address long enough, so I'm gonna pass on that if it's okay with you. This is the organizational chart that has come out in the city budget, and I just would like to take note that the very top of this is the citizens of Lincoln, and right underneath that is y'all. Two of you are missing, I don't know where, but you were supposed to be a subset of us before the mayor. In other words, we, and then you, the mayor is answerable too. I'd like to clear a few things up. Number one, there's this question of, are, are all these people asking to defund the police when it comes to the budget right now? To defund the police when it comes to the budget right now would mean a reduction in the amount of money that the police department received last year, which is not being proposed. And even if you guys didn't take the 600 plus thousand dollar grant, you still do not look at a reduction in the police department's budget from last year. So where is the defunding at? I would like to state that an educated, enlightened, and informed population is one of the surest ways of promoting a healthy democracy. And somehow in, the, in this whole debate that is happening tonight, we are completely forgetting the various departments that are seeing their budgets and staff cut within this city. We're seeing the aging partners cut. We're seeing houses and human services cut. We're seeing our law department cut. We're seeing the civil rights attorneys that are supposed to be in the city of Lincoln's departments cut, and now those jobs are based on grants. 
We are seeing our libraries cut. We are seeing our parks and recreation cut. That's all happening. But nobody's talking about that because, to be honest, we are seeing two examples, or I will cite two examples of white privilege, one which is happening right here in this room right now, and one which I will tell you a story about. The one that is in this room right now is that the people that are continuously calling for public safety and law and order, we have signs all over this room for social distancing because we ha still have a coronavirus com uh, coronavirus pandemic going on right now, but a lot of people in here that are pro-public safety have no problem endangering themselves and everybody else in this room by ignoring the signs that are on these seats. The hypocrisy in our democracy and white privilege as work. Now, I will go so far as to say the second example, would you like the good story or the bad story about my run for city council and how I experienced both the libraries in this town and the police department in this town and how my daughters experienced them? Which one would you like? Miss Washington, would you like the good or the bad first? You may choose. Okay. Mr. Show, because you ran with me, would you like the good or the bad first? And for you. The good one is this. I ran for city council and I lost. That's okay. I met two people, had two interactions with two different departments. First and foremost, the fire department had good interactions with. The Lincoln Public Libraries had good interactions with. So far to the point that my daughter, which everybody up here knows or should know that I have three of them. One of them now is a volunteer at the Lincoln, Lincoln Public Library System and has been for two years because of stuff I learned through my run at the time. She is helping decrease the amount of money that's needed from y'all to, to supplement and make sure that our public libraries continue to run, not only for the children, but for the adults that hold their little meetings there as well, because it's the most cost-effective community space in this town. That's the good one. The bad one is this. My 14-year-old daughter... She's now in mental health care every week, every week. And it's because of what happened while I was campaigning for the Lincoln City Council. And some people know this story and some people don't. I have one minute. Yeah. I'll finish with that. The story is this, myself, my children, my wife, we were all out and we were putting literature on doors just like every single one of you that actually ran for that seat have done. And I was down on my knees, reaching into this bag for more literature with me and my daughter. And she's standing next to me. And she says, Dad, don't move. He's got a gun. And all of a sudden, I hear hands out the bag turn around. It was a Lincoln Police Department officer with his gun out because there had been calls that somebody was casing doors. And it wasn't down in near South or Everett or Air Park, any place that anybody wants to classify as the bad part of town. It's at 52nd and South. So my white privilege, the second example is that I'm alive here. That I'm alive here. That my daughter didn't see me get shot here, but she still has to go in and know that the people that are supposed to protect her, the people that see her in the schools, there's their for resource officer reasons, are the ones that she saw as an 11-year-old girl holding a gun on her father. Thank and you. now, and now, I leave you with this. You have a choice in front of you. Governments don't want well-educated, well-informed people capable of critical critical thinking. That is against their interests. They want obedient workers, people who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept it. If you sit here and undercut every other community program, but continue to further and fund, further fund the police department, that is exactly what you're voting for. My name is Lou Bratz and thank you all for your time. Next up, Brandy Johnson. On deck, Mary Hilton. Up next is Brandy Johnson. On deck, Mary Hilton. Randy? Brandy. Good evening. 
My name is Mary Hilton. I live at 5324 Hunts Drive. During tumultuous times like these, I like to count my blessings. And I'm here tonight um, to state for the record that Lincoln is a great place to live and work and raise a family. And I count it a blessing. Like many who have had a little extra time to ponder about things, when I ponder about the elements that must coalesce to make a great city, I consider healthy individuals and intact families um, that love one another and their neighbors. I think about the faith community caring for the spiritual needs of their congregation, who then reach out to the city to care for the poor and the needy, the widow and the orphan. And then businesses who are able to produce goods and services that people want and need without undue burdensome regulation. And of course, civil government, who maintains vital infrastructure, punishes evildoers, and encourages virtuous living under reasonable laws. And I appreciate your well-intentioned efforts as city council to work to make Lincoln a great place. Thank you. A foundational component of our city's government, um, the part that helps sec secure the safety and protection of every individual in our community, is the Lincoln Police Department. We have a well-trained professional department that is doing a great job in our city. I live across the street from three police officers. And I know the hard work and effort that they put into developing excellent relationships in neighborhoods across our community. Day in and day out, they put themselves in harm's way for us, for our safety and security. And they are due the respect they've earned. I believe that the debate concerning the police should be based on facts. I'll cite just a few covering a period from 2017 through 2019. Um, the police arrested 300,210 individuals, and of those, um, 893 resisted arrest. There were 140 assaults on LPD officers during this period, yet zero suspects were shot and killed by Lincoln police officers. So it is disheartening when our police, who uphold a high standard of ethics and training, are demonized and stereotyped by undefendable actions of police in faraway cities. It is a fact that since 2015, there have been no unarmed persons of color shot and killed by Nebraska law enforcement officers. So it doesn't seem to me that there is evidence of systemic racism in our police department. Our police department needs encouragement of the city council and mayor. And one thing that you can do and the mayor can do is to accept the federal Justice Department grant that has been applied for and you have been awarded. It seems to make sense to accept it. This is a benefit to taxpayers, is a benefit to the LPD, which is understaffed, and which our mayor admitted not many weeks ago that our city has a lower than average number of police officers per capita than cities of similar size. These five new officers will be specifically trained to deal with gun violence, and it will free up current officers to work in other areas of need. The rule of law to be upheld and to keep our city safe, our police force needs your support and encouragement. Please don't listen to voices that are challenging and undermining the lawful authority of our police. They only discourage LD LPD's efforts in maintaining an exemplary police department that fulfills the true needs of this city. Please keep your word by accepting the federal grant. It will provide the encouragement that our police force deserves, and keeping your word will set a good example of virtuous living. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Carla McCullough. On deck is Connie Dawson. Carla McCullough. Next, Connie Dawson. Good evening, City Council members. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to stand in front of you and share my heart tonight. And I also want to thank you that you serve us in this city. My name, uh, again, is Connie Dawson. My address is 7400 Ringneck Drive, 
and I am the lead pastor of Radiant Church, which is on the corner of 70th and Vine. Um, as a pastor um, and a leader in this community, I would just like to simply address what so many have already addressed tonight and said it probably much better or more logically than I will present tonight, um, and that is the defunding of our police department. When I talk to people in our community, people that I serve and people that I interact with, there really is a great fear in people's hearts that if we defund our police department, that this beautiful city and this wonderful place that we have to live will become unsafe for us. It will, they will not have the ability to keep our city safe or our people safe. And I agree with what has already been said, that what happened in Minneapolis was a horrible thing. And the police officers that were involved in that, they need to be punished. However, just because these police officers did something that was extremely inappropriate, it doesn't mean that we should extrapolate that onto all police officers. And I'm concerned about that. It would be as if you as city council members and you've done such an excellent job serving us, if maybe let's say in Colorado, a police, the city council really did a poor job. They did something that was illegal. And everyone said, well, let's just do away with city councils because obviously they don't serve the public. Or an, another example would be as me as a pastor. If another pastor did something that was egregious and then everyone decided, let's just not have pastors anymore because it's not appropriate. We have to understand that issues happen, bad things happen, and we have to live in a, a city and we have to, to relate to one another out of love, I hope, and forgiveness with one another. As has already again been stated, the Lincoln Public, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Lincoln Police Department annual records has shown since 2017, 18, and 19, there's not been one person shot or killed by the, uh, the Lincoln Public, I'm sorry, the Lincoln Police Department. And as a, as a citizen of this city, I'm extremely proud of our police department, even though I don't have a family member in that, I can just simply say I'm extremely proud and thankful for the law enforcement officers that we have. We need law and order in our city. We need and desire, as a citizen, we need and desire our police force to be, in fun, be, to be funded and empowered and to protect us. Rather than defund our police, we need to support them. We need to show them gratitude. We need to let them know that they have served us with excellence. And um, if there's any proof that our police in our city have been deficit in any way, then I think that would be a sign for us to invest more in them for training and helping them to be better at their job rather than defunding them. So city council members and even the mayor, I would encourage you to ask her, would you please accept the funding that is offered by our federal government to this city to for us to have more police officers and to cast your full support behind our law enforcement men and women. Please let our police know how much we love them and appreciate their hard work and their service to our city. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about this issue that I am very passionate about and also the people that I serve as a pastor is also very passionate about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. We are actually going to break for about 10 minutes, and we will reconvene at 8.10. <clears throat>
Good evening. <clears throat> and I thank you for even hearing all of us. And it's getting later and later for you, too. Um, it seems like there was a lot on the docket today. Uh, I wasn't going to originally say anything, but since I've waited all this time, I feel like I need to say what I have on my heart. And that is, I, I so appreciate the Lincoln Police Department. Um, I'll tell you one little thing that happened to me. I got a ticket the very day that I, I went and um, complained about all the speeding in my neighborhood. <laughs> that very day I came home and the police were right there checking on, on speeders and I got caught. <laughs> 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 well, I know they do their job. Well, I am, since I have a few minutes, even though I haven't got anything prepared, I'll tell you, I've lived here 50 years. Before that, I lived on the south side of Chicago. I know what ghettos are. I know what crime is. I know what um, fear is, because I lived in it. And I'll tell you, without police, um, and without good police, I wouldn't want to live in this city. When I moved here, I was so impressed. This city had just, it just blew me away after where I had lived. And coming here, I just always have felt safe. And um, I worked at a... Um, um, the homeless clinic. I worked there as a chaplain for eight and a half years, and I had seen so many people, people of color, people, uh, Hispanics, people who were immigrants who, who didn't even speak the language, who had been um, hurt by other people uh, one lady, the first week I was there, came, she was an African-American lady, and she had her nose sideways on her face. Thank God there was a policeman who came to her rescue to help her and to get her to the friendship home because she probably would have been murdered that night. Um, I've seen over and over again all kinds of people, and I really wonder who are the people that would come and say we have enough police we have we don't need we don't need any more police who are these people that would defund our police um, and not accept um, an offer for four uh, for five more police who are these people it, it makes me wonder what kind of people they are and what do they want do they want lawlessness do they want to see crime and and what do they want? Um, to me, I just really appreciate the fact that I feel safe here, and I have felt safe here for 50 years, and I will continue to feel safe here because I know that the police are doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, Bruce Dawson. On deck, Lydia Arnold. I, I only came to support my wife, so. I'm, okay, I'm well, not allowed to okay. speak. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce. Next, Lydia Arnold. Pastor. On deck would be Corey Ruman. And just as a reminder, if you could please spell your name uh, and say your address for the record, please. My name is Lydia Arnold, L Y D I A A R N O L D. I live at 5210 Irvin Street. First, my sincere thank you for all of you for your service. I very much appreciate it. Next, a thank you, another sincere one, for your part in providing Lincoln with the Lincoln Police Department. I very much appreciate the Lincoln Police Department. I feel they are a positive, stabilizing force in our community. I think the murder of George Floyd 
was horrible and unconscionable. I think we need to fix what needs fixing, including here in Lincoln. I think it needs to be fixed very thoughtfully, wisefully, and skillfully, just as a surgeon uses skillful wisdom to fix what needs fixing without causing irreparable harm or even destroying the person he's committed to help. Wisdom has always been needed when you're governing communities like you are, and even more today, because with today's technology floods us. We are flooded with information, we can be flooded with ideas, we can be flooded with inflammatory rhetoric, and there's not. It, it can be easy, and I don't know if you always can, to know how to check out and separate fact from what's not fact. It's difficult to find stable footing in floods. So how do we move forward with wisdom regarding our current situation? As a surgeon carefully and minutely learns all he can before performing surgery, before performing surgeries, I suggest a careful review of history's lessons. One lesson might be the Trojan horse. Things aren't always what they seem. What does history teach regarding criminal activity? Does criminal activity increase or decrease if law enforcement is removed? Does history show that law-abiding people are safer without a well-trained, accountable law enforcement department? There are many other good lessons from history, and I hope they are reviewed at this time and mulled over so a consensus can bubble to the top. Uh, since I am not a person of color, I close with a thought from someone who is, Clarence Page, uh, who had his editorial printed in Sunday's Journal Star. It included this statement from a person of color. We need to improve the police, not abolish them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Corey Ruman. On deck is Jessica Greenwald. Thank you very much. My name is Corey Ruman, C-O-R-E-Y-R-U-M-A-N-N, -N, and I live at 2718 South 12th. Um, I just wanted to, to start as I've been sitting here, and this is not a necessarily a criticism. I know these are difficult times, um, but I am feeling uncomfortable because I have so many privileged identities, and I often get a seat at the table about how decisions are made, about who gets to sit where and who is in the chambers, because it does make a difference during breaks who has access to council members and who gets to sort of have discussions. So I am feeling uncomfortable with that, and I just wanted to share that with the council before I started. Um, I am here, um, and I apologize and wish that I had come uh, a long time ago, but I often believe that folks um, with, with my, um, especially straight, white, older men, such as myself, there can be misperceptions about where we stand or what we think, um, and it's often easy, easy for me to sit on the sidelines. I also am the father of two young children, um, and with everything that is happening in the world, I have revisited and wish I had come sooner when these decisions about SROs, I'm not here to talk specifically about defunding the police, but I am about SROs in the schools, in the Lincoln Public School System. We hope to stay here for a long time, um, but I don't want my children in institutions where we need police officers. And this is not a knock against the SROs um, or who they are. I'm sure that they are um, care deeply, but the, the reality is, and the evidence and the research is clear, that SROs do not make our schools safer. My third grader now is telling us, I don't want to go to middle school. I want to be homeschooled. Not necessarily because she's afraid of the police. She's a young white girl. So the likelihood of her being negatively impacted by SROs is unlikely. But her, her brown and black friends of color, her friends who are disabled, her friends who may identify as gay, lesbian, transgender, um, it is very likely that they will be negatively impacted in some way. That's the reality of the culture and the world that we live in. And I wish it wasn't that way, and I wish that I didn't have all these privileges and all of these identities, but I do. And it's time for us to make changes. And I would ask that the council please consider that decision about SROs in the LPS school system. I keep hearing things about how police officers are there to um, enforce law and order and all of this. So you can call, we can describe them as 
student resource officers, but the bottom line is they are police officers with guns in our schools. And it's unnecessary and it's not needed. What we need now is to, we keep talking about coming together, but we live in a world where, where we make decisions based on fear. But we're at a time now where we have to have courage. We have to, have, we have to make courageous decisions. And I finally decided for myself to step up and say, let's do something different. And I often think about the national news and national politics and get so focused on that, I forget we can make a change in Lincoln, Nebraska. We can make courageous decisions and, make, and, and change the culture of fear. Not, not to make decisions based on fear, but bring people together through community. Send the SROs out in the community. Get them together with and make them have connections. Sure, can they go to the schools once in a while during lunch? Great, but I don't want my children walking around institutions and reinforcing the school to prison pipeline, which is very clear. If you Google school to prison pipelines, just Google it and see all of the research that clearly indicates how the way our institutionalized racism, sexism, and all of those is in, infiltrated and in completely within our educational system. That includes LPS. I know Lincoln is a wonderful, beautiful place, but we are also a racist, sexist, ableist, One minute. homophobic community. That is the reality, and we can change that. We can try to bring together and bring together community. Um, so I appreciate your time. I know you've had the SRO discussion, um, but I would really, really, as you think about funding or defunding the police, to consider um, the impact that that may have on students and, and think about that in your decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Jessica Greenwald. On deck is Jess Parker. Jessica Greenwald? Ms. Parker? On deck would be Ozzy J. Hi, my name is Jess Parker and my address is 7501 Whitlock Place. I'm not only a citizen of Lincoln, but I am also a white ally to the Black Lives Matter movement. This is my first time speaking at a city council meeting, my first time even being here, so bear with me. Um, I would like to express my concerns with the proposed city budget, as well as my concerns with the Lincoln Police Department. While the proposed city budget includes very vague and very undetailed goals from LPD and their use of the needed funds, I think some things need to be brought to the spotlight. Instead of police requesting additional funds or grants, from the city based on prior budgets, these additional funds or grants should be used elsewhere in the community to better align with the community's goals of being an educational frontier or becoming a more inclusive environment, and most importantly, to combat racism. The racism that is ever present here in Lincoln, Nebraska. One idea would be to defund the police the use of these funds and to put them to better use in the LPS school system. This money could be used to create and implement an African American history course that would be more than a fact thrown at the class at the end of the day during, sorry, this money could be used to create and implement an African American history course that would be more than just a fact thrown at the class at the end of the day by their teacher during Black History Month. This course should be more than just a picture of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. in a textbook with a small caption to summarize the civil rights movement. This class should not be an elective in high school, but a continued course offered throughout numerous years, just as the current American history course is offered and in some grades is required. Another thing that this money should be allocated for instead of, instead of the Lincoln Police Department is for more inclusive books in school in school libraries. I have discussed this issue today with an LPS elementary school librarian. At this specific elementary school, there are 468 books which have been designated by the LPS library services, which is called Mosaic Committee. Mosaic is, which according to the LPS website, Mosaic is a multicultural committee composed of literature savvy teachers, librarians, and librarians who scout educational journals and review sources to select newly published multicultural books. 
This elementary school has 31,292 books within their library. That means less than 1.5% of, of this school in particular are labeled by Mosaic as being multicultural books. This is an extremely low number considering the amount of non-white children who attend LPS across the district. In addition to me asking to defund the police and reallocate the funds, I would also request that the police academy increase their credentials and academy hours. A four-month police academy program is not enough time for someone to fully understand the law. For example, in comparison to the education requirements of a local criminal defense attorney, which is someone who would also need to fully understand the laws in order to do their job effectively, they were required to have a four-year undergrad with a double major and then an additional three years of law school with a focus on social justice law and litigation. There is a vast difference in the requirements between the two. There's a variety of other occupations in the Lincoln area that have extraordinary higher educational requirements as well. An elementary teacher at LPS has taken five years to receive a bachelor's degree with a, with a special education endorsement in addition to a teaching certificate. A person who works at Duncan Aviation as an avionics One installations minute. crew has taken 17 weeks at Navy school for air, airframe structures, 12 weeks, for high air, sorry, air, aircraft hydraulics, among other things. The cosmetology licensing requires 2,100 hours plus additional training, which my research shows is 1,260 more hours than most police academies. According, to, okay, lastly, on a separate issue with the police, I would like to recognize the amount of money that's being used from unions and PACs, political action committees, and given to, lo, to political candidates. According to the website, No More Cop Money, which was founded in part by a former Lincolnite who is a PhD candidate in political science, $31,404 of police money from unions and PACs has been given to 14 political figures in Nebraska since the year 2015. I think you already had your turn to speak. I challenge you all sitting here today at the city council meeting to take a look at the no more cop money pledge. The pledge is asking you to commit to eliminating donations received to your campaign from law enforcement organizations that include unions, associations, and PACs representing or affiliated with current or retired police, police chiefs, sheriffs, state troopers, correctional officers on the regional, state, and local level. I will be here at the next city council meeting. I'll be here at the meeting after that. I'll be here at the meeting after that. We all will, until there's change that's gonna be made. No one is saying that we don't need law and order in our city, but we need equal law and order for all. All lives are not gonna matter until Black Lives Matter and it's gonna start here. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next, Ozzy J on deck, Jenny Tyner. Hi there, um, Ozzy J, A-U-Z-Z-Y, or letter J, and uh, I do not feel comfortable disclosing my address. I had written it down on the form, so if there's any want for it, it's right there. Um, I just had a couple of notes that I wanted to touch on. Uh, ideally, it would be um, just- point, point of order, I'm sorry, Ozzy, I, I do hate to interrupt you, but, and can you stop his clock, please? I did. Fanchon and the other young woman, can you please stop playing with your signs? Or normally, after you have testified, we ask that you leave. Fanchon, if, since you've already testified, in light of the fact we're trying to minimize and allow poor, more people to move in, could you please exit the chamber? I think that would be nice. Can I ask a favor? Can you both please put your signs down? Could you please put your sign down too? Because it is a, a distraction to this young gentleman who's trying to testify. And as you know, we've been very patient and we want to hear everyone. But when you do things like that, it is a major distraction. He started it, not me. Cool. Thank you. And I apologize for interrupting you. I feel like the, uh, she should apologize. Thank you, Councilwoman Rubel. I'll take that. Thank you, Councilwoman Rubel. Um, I restarted your time, yeah, four minutes. You. So uh, just wanted to touch on a few points. Obviously, the idea of 
cutting funding from uh, public parks, education, uh, public resources like libraries, um, which I know I have personally used um, in times of not having internet access or the means to um, use computers or uh, uh, literature for any sort of schooling or personal betterment of myself. Um, I can only see that as a detriment to Lincoln and our community if you cut what is blatantly there to help people better themselves. Um, I'd like to touch that I don't think five clops will make a difference. Um, I see that getting thrown around a lot. Um, the protests that had happened a couple weeks ago with the uh, um, curfew, I believe that the uh, LPD and the state troopers acted um, insanely um, out of uh, out of pocket, out of uh, reasonable action for what called to be um, done with a bunch of peaceful protesters. Uh, I would also like to add that there should be some sort of transparency with the communications that were going on between LPD and the state troopers to see where that line of communication came from to have uh, things escalate and they did from the police's and the state troopers side. Uh, I think that transparency would point out a lot of maybe inconsistencies with their reports, which is why I believe that we don't have that. Um, as well as uh, the medical bills for the, I believe four, there could be even more. It's, um, it's crazy to think that people hurt by our police system and our police force uh, are being forced to pay exorbitant amount of medical bills. Um, a young woman having her nose essentially almost blown off, a man with a hole in the back of his head. If I had that done to me, I couldn't fathom how I'd be even able to start chipping away at that medical bill. And I feel like the least that um, our city council and the mayor herself can do is uh, compensate and fully take care of all of those medical expenses for the people that they let um, the police force use extreme force on. Um, I think the last thing that I wanted to end on, I have a little short thing, but um, I just wanted to say that um, Black Lives Matter, um, Black is beautiful. We will always be here speaking as white allies and as people in our community that are tired of seeing this injustice. And I'd also just like to give a special shout out to all of the black backs of blue people. Um, I didn't expect to laugh as much when I had stepped in here. And I will say that it was a little bit of brevity to what is a anxious and not enjoyable time. So special, special shouts to them. And I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Jenny Tyner. On deck is Kelly Seacrest. Hi, my name is Sarah Hopeleon, and I'm stepping in as Jenny because I had to leave, um, knowing that I have my own curfew at home. <laughs> Anyways, hi, my name is Sarah Hopeleon. Um, I'm 19. Um, I live at 2972 West Washington Street. Um, so uh, she is, but she'll step in when I, my name is na named. Okay, swapping yes, yeah, sorry, okay. swapping places. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, could, Sarah, excuse me, could you p spell your last name? Yes, A-L-H-I-L-F-Y space L-E-O-N. <laughs> um, so as we're talking today about the defunding the police, um, and about the safety of police. I also do not agree that with five other police officers that there's gonna be much of drastic safety measures within the, in our community, but also when we are talking about safety, and especially safety in, in, in these people who have um, come and spoke to you today and talking about their own safety because they are white people and mo white women who profit and, not profit, but can, Sorry, can actually use and are able to feel safe due to the police. 
If you're black or if you're brown within the city, you do not feel safe because of the police. And I've seen this time and time and time again with my black friends, which <laughs> just knowing that there's a police officer behind us or knowing that, that her life could be taken or my own life can be taken because of the police, when they're supposed to serve and protect, they're not serving and protecting everyone. They're serving and protecting and, sa and serving and protecting the white people and the white folks of this city. Um, I also would like to um, talk about the defund defunding the, the police. And when we talk about defunding, we're meaning the allocation of the funds into the city and where that could actually help and actually be able to benefit the city way more than having five more police officers. I am sorry, but I just do not see the benefits of having five more police officers when we can have maybe five more social workers or five more um, people in, or more um, budgets in, and um, not budgets, sorry, um, grants within medical um, fields and, and other resources of that matter instead of the police. And, yeah, I also want to say Black Lives Matter, and you guys all have a responsibility to the people, to the citizens, not just the white citizens that live here, but the brown and black citizens that live here, too. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next is Kelly Seacrest. Good evening, my name is Jenny Tyner, and I let the woman go ahead of me because she had to leave. J-E-N-N-Y-T-Y-N-E-R. My address is 620 South 29th Street. Okay, I'd like to begin with something I mentioned earlier, um, which is I'm highly distressed by the violence that happened over, well, all the time, but during that weekend, and I do want to echo a request to think about how we can pay for medical bills for all of those injuries. They are real. There are GoFundMes happening, and it's terrifying. Okay. I would like to talk about two concerns that I believe are related. First, I am loudly against giving LPD $600,000 for body cams and extra police officers. This is not where I believe these funds need to go. We have the F Street Rec Center. We have the Malone Center. We have all kinds of community centers. We have libraries. We have parks. I'm echoing everything you've heard before. I actually think that we need to find funds that could be used to support alternatives for sending 40,000 children back to school full time in August. This is scary. Um, I don't know how many city council, I don't know how much the city council and the mayor's office holds hands with the superintendent of LPS or the Board of Ed, but I would at least hope that you can apply some pressure here. Um, I'm both an LPS elementary school music teacher and a parent. Oh, and I'm advised by my union to say that I, uh, my views are personal and do not represent the views of LPS. But I am personally horrified <laughs> that our city is planning to open full time in August, especially as we know that our cases are spiking. We know this. So I spoke to someone in the Commissioner of Education's office, because I know that the Commissioner of Ed and Pete Ricketts decided that we're going to how we're going to do this. And he went into this lengthy discussion about all the safety measures that they're planning to implement to keep things safe, such as requiring children to wear masks upon entering and leaving the building in bottleneck situations, and that um, they would then take their masks off in their classrooms and these would be their pods, okay? How does this work? <laughs> I can imagine this working in a tiny town where the kids are all in the same little pod anyway. Everybody knows everybody. There's 500 kids in the, 500 people in the whole town. There's 500 students in my school and we are a Title I school and we are over capacity. Those kids are shoulder to shoulder all day long. There is no way <laughs> as an elementary school teacher that I can fathom this happening and I don't want them to not wear masks. I do. I just can't fathom how we get that many five-year-olds to wear masks for seven hours a day. Um, and I don't get a pot. I'm a specialist. I see 500 kids a day. So I don't get to be in a classroom with 24 kids. 
what what happens to the specialist teachers that teach literally every student in the school? What happens? Okay, I'm sorry, I get upset. Okay. <laughs> um, and also, how are many of these teachers supposed to do their jobs? I, already, we're not allowed to do singing for obvious reasons. Recorders are taken out. Uh, we don't get to use mallet instruments or share drums. I don't know how I'm going to do my job. So, I do have a suggestion. <laughs> um, Oh, and I was going to say, there's an inherent in a, like there's inherent inequity in this such in this situation based on class, meaning, any parent who's uncomfortable to send their kid to school has the option to homeschool, provided they have enough income to have their family not take a hit if they do stay home with their kid. I would like to do that. I don't know how I'm going to be able to. I have to work. What happens to single family homes? So. Oh, no. One minute. Okay. Um, all right. So I get it. We have a child care issue, right? Some parents are highly, they're immunocompromised kids, asthmatic kids. My own son has got terrible asthma, and I don't have the option to homeschool. So my friend Kelly, who's coming up next, um, she had this great idea, and I was like, you're a genius. Um, what if secondary education remained remote? High school teachers and high school students remained remote. And we used eight high school buildings to spread out our 20,000 elementary school kids, right? And then we can actually have a smaller student to teacher ratio. We can actually spread out the way they suggest in Palmyra and wherever these other tiny towns are, you know? Um, I think that's one creative way. And allocating funds to help in childcare through community centers, libraries, spreading us out putting our money to the community, especially because we have a disenfranchised population. The police does not make us feel safe, and we need money for our community. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Kelly Seacrest. On board is, I believe, Glenn Cleese. Oh, Thank microphone. You. Scoot over. Two left. There you oh, go. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. This is my first time, so I'm a little nervous. Um, my name is My name's Kelly. I live in Lincoln. Um, I'm here to speak to you about the budget and defunding the police. Um, I urge you to defund the police and to say no to cops grant, and I support removing police from schools for all the reasons that you've heard. On every level, that we can know something. Our instinct, our common sense, our personal experiences, first-hand accounts, experiences and knowledge from trusted sources, historical and institutional and cultural knowledge from a wide range of places, to statistics gathered from various places, people, and institutions. We know the police harm and murder black people and native people and other people of color. We know that from the various Supreme Court cases, that the police are under no legal obligation to protect people. We know that the origins of policing come from the time of mass institutional human trafficking, murder, torture, and genocide for profit, also known as slavery. This idea that police is this ancient institution is false. We also know that many victims of sexual violence find no justice or healing within the criminal justice system and are actually further traumatized by police. We know disabled people and people with mental health issues are harmed and killed and murdered by the police. I could go on and on and on about this. So no more justifications, no more centering. What I'm asking is that you accept and act on what we know. No more centering white people's own personal positive experiences with police officers. No more reveling in false histories that confuse control with justice or law with ethics or force with safety. No more increasing police budgets and thus their power with things like body cams. Body cams do not work. Over and over, large studies have proven that they do not reduce violence, abuse, or brutality. 
That's why I'm asking to defund the police and put that money towards community services that support people's mental, physical, and sp spiritual health, like libraries, public parks, community centers, and the maintenance of sidewalks. When people's needs are met, harm is reduced. There was no police in my life growing up. Their existence barely registered throughout my childhood and early teens, save for the movies and TV shows that I gladly consumed. I can tell you another thing about my adolescence. There was a lot of drug use. But this drug use among my mostly white and upper middle class peers was rarely criminalized. Instead, my peers' drug use was met with family interventions, therapy, and rehab. Those peers whose drug use was put into context, those peers who were given opportunities in education, those peers who were met with compassion, not punishment, or in other words, they were given care, well, they just grew up just fine. If your child or loved one did something harmful, became addicted to drugs, got into a fight, was in an abusive relationship, would you call the police on them? Would you want them arrested? Would you want them in jail or prison? Or, let's use our imaginations, would you want them to be held accountable? Held not in the sense of against their will, but held as an embraced by the community, held as in recognizing that they are not disposable, there's no such thing as an evil person, held in the sense that making sure that they believe that they can change and hope that they can repair the harm that they may have caused. By defunding the police, we can start stepping in the direction of restorative and transformational justice. One minute. Practices created by black indigenous communities that are already available and happening and are successful in healing people and successful in giving people's tools to handle conflict, successful in handling trauma and mental health, and restoring relationships and making communities safe. By defunding the police, we are listening and supporting the current human rights movement that is being led by black people to protect, save, honor black people's lives. By defunding the police, saying no to crop, cops grants, we can put those resources to community services and goals like education and health. By defunding the police, we are taking an active step in dismantling white supremacy. By defunding the police, we are investing in justice, freedom, and care. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next is Glenn Cleese. Glenn Cleese. Next up is Serena Freet on deck, Morgan Valley. Hello, my name is Serena Freet, S-A-R-E-N-A, -E Freet, F-R-E-E-T. With the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, we have seen firsthand the violence of police in our community. Reforms that have been implemented nationally and locally haven't fixed the problems we're seeing. The Citizens Police Advisory Board in joint relations with the mayor's office since 1976 hasn't brought meaningful accountability. Tomorrow's report of LPD's General Order 1510 on their use of force will cite de-escalation strategies, practices to minimize the use of deadly force and neck restraints, more comprehensive reporting, and a more robust duty to intervene, intervene by other officers if excessive force is being used. We know these reforms do not eradicate violence, racism, or white supremacy. We know these reforms do not make our community safer. We know this because this is not our first time having these conversations. The history and institution of police is rooted in violence. Through the surveillance of black and brown bodies and the protection of the white ruling class and their property. The function of policing and their use of force, the need to carry guns, access to warfare, chemical weapons, helicopters and drones cannot 
and will not be trained out of them. All of this time, energy, money, year after year, is invested into the police departments with no ability to provide or make communities safer and with no meaningful structure of accountability. More police officers won't stop sexual assault and domestic violence. They can't offer help, to pr help or protection to folks with mental illness because these are services the police were never designed to do. The police are the gatekeepers to the prison industrial complex that continues to disproportionately impact indigenous, black, and Latinx peoples. This is not a coincidence, but by design, which is directly related to the conversations about the 1,600 bed new prisons we're having. While we are living amidst a pandemic, financial shortfalls are the realities of the upcoming city budget. COVID-19 has brought greater transparencies to these inequalities and the needs that are being met and the needs that are not being met for some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Let the community and press see an itemized line expenditure of LPD to know how they receive and spend more than a quarter of the city budget. While at the same time, the city is divesting from resources that actually make our communities safe, like libraries, safe and affordable housing, and safe and accessible sidewalks. That is, of course, not an extensive list, you all know. Um, a resilient Lincoln and a high quality of life, uh, uh, and a high quality of life for everyone is possible here in Lincoln, which is what the city budget is planning to do. That's what their priorities are. If we prioritize the needs of everyone, beginning with the needs of the most at risk, then we ask you to say no to the COPS grant, One minute. no more to officers, no more officers, and no more money to LPD. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next is Morgan Valley. On deck is Michelle Clifford. Right over to the left there. The microphone. There you go. Uh, my name is Morgan Valley, M O R G A N V A L L E Y, and I live at 1125 Claremont Street. And I'm here because I have concerns about two different issues, both related to funding. The first issue I'm here to address is body cameras and the mayor's plan to purchase additional cameras. I take issue with this for two reasons the first being the overall increase of funding being given to the police department. Similar to what others have stated, I don't believe we should be funding the police department further. I think moving forward as a community, we need to work to find more solutions to prevent crime instead of letting the police handle issues they aren't equipped to handle. We need to be funding initiatives to help end homelessness and alleviate the current issues homeless people face instead of criminalizing it. We need to fund education. We need to fund health care, including care for mental health. We need to fund more housing initiatives. We need to fund social programs to alleviate the conditions that can push people into crime. We need to defund LPD and fund more productive initiatives to provide long-term solutions for our community. Additionally, the proposed funding being given to police departments could be allocated to prevent the proposed cuts to areas such as city libraries and sidewalks. I'd rather fund libraries than the police. Beyond this, I take issues with body cameras themselves. The National, National Institute of Justice acknowledges there's a large gap in research surrounding the, the technology. And institutions such as George Mason University have gone as far to say that some studies may have overestimated the benefits of body cameras. Without a concrete plan for the use and regulation of body cameras, they aren't useful, point blank. People, particularly people of color, have died at the hands of police in other communities across the country where body cameras were required. They aren't a cure-all, and when, we, when, when looking at a cost-benefit analysis, they, may be, they might be missing the mark. I want less focus on the police and their technology and more investment in the community overall. All in all, if the city wants to further fund body cameras, take it out of the current police budget, if anything. We should not be increasing police, um, police funding, but rather defunding it. 
However, the city clearly has no issue passing the burden of cuts of taxpayers, bringing me to an entirely different issue, not related to the police, but rather related to funding that will impact our environment and disproportionately impact low-income families. My second issue goes back to last week, as the mayor's office released a statement with plans to reduce the number of recycling drop-off locations from 19 to 4 or 5. Yet, as we all know, the city mandated household cardboard recycling in 2018. In the same sta statement from last week, they stated that 40% of households have curbside pickup. That leaves 60%, a majority, without the service and relying on these drop-off locations. I also think it's fair to say that of the 60%, more, there are more low-income families than those who do have curbside pickup. You can't mandate something and take away access for compliance. Access to recycling drop-offs is already an issue, but going from 19 locations to merely four or five is completely unacceptable and can make recycling and meeting this mandate extremely inaccessible, as, it's, as there are already issues with accessibility. The city is putting the burden on low-income families in order to save in the city budget while wanting to increase it for body cameras. Make it, overall, this doesn't make any sense, and I think we need to make it make sense, City Council. Stop defunding things like libraries, sidewalks, recycling, and additional services while placing the burden of these effects on Lincoln residents and defund the Lincoln Police Department. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next is Michelle Clifford on deck, Lori Marsh. Hello, uh, my name is Michelle Clifford, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D, and I'm at 1130 South 14th Street. Thank you for your time today. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I wrote this while babysitting my nephews overnight while their father was at work. Their father is a police officer. I worry about his safety and about my nephews growing up without him, but I worry more about what might happen to someone else who else could grow up without a father. My brother is not a bad person, not consciously biased, but we are not talking about moral judgments. We're talking about facts. I worry because statistically, it is likely that he could kill a black man for no reason and get away with it. These are the expected results of a racist system. We are up against internal biases, structural inequities, decades of racist media representation of black people as criminals, a war on drugs that incentivizes manufacturing crime and encourages racial profiling, and laws that serve to excuse this so long as no one admits that they were trying to be racist. These are problems that go to the very core of our country's faults and require collective action, something bigger than Lincoln, but that must include Lincoln. Minimally, we need to acknowledge that the 14 hours of diversity training that LPD gets is not enough, and work to create an environment that is specifically race conscious and works to combat bias. But this increase in training cannot require a budget increase. I know how challenging it sounds to add something to the list of priorities without an increase in resources. I am a teacher, so you can take my word for that. It's actually about reprioritizing what the police do and how they do it. We do not need to increase funding to officers to implement body worn cameras least of all while other departments in our city are being asked to make budget cuts. There is conflicting research on whether or not body-worn cameras reduce police violence at all, especially given that moments of police violence uh, have often had cameras turned off or malfunction at that very moment without repercussion. In Lincoln, our police department states that if an officer fails to record or records only part of an encounter, they have to write a report explaining why. There is no statement about repercussions for failure to record. While we don't even have any regulations around their ethical use, we do not need to spend more money on them. I come at my understandings not only as the family of a police officer and someone who seeks out learning about racial injustice, but also as someone who was once the victim of a violent crime. I was first ignored by police and later dismissed. Even though my treatment was better because of my skin color, I felt a reluctance from police to spend time investigating my case if not for lack of empathy, for lack of energy and resources. There are only three victims advocates uh, who serve all of Lancaster County. I was not offered support from the police, so I gained a deeper appreciation for other social services that try to fill in those gaps. We need to prioritize funding these services at greater levels, even if it means shifting funding away from the police. Mental health services, resources for the poor and houseless, 
domestic violence services. These are the programs that get at root causes of violence and crime. Police are merely a reactionary measure. Finally, programs for youth like our public libraries, which may have to cut staff and services now, are key to a healthy society. We need to invest in our young people. During the protests, our leadership failed them. The adults failed them. Their cries of outrage were met with an arbitrary curfew and police violence. As a teacher, I followed the leadership of my students proudly during the protests. Police responded by shooting tear gas and rubber bullets at preteens, teens, and their teachers. This is not how we should show our youth that we value and protect them. This is not how the adults are supposed to behave. We are being fearful in the wrong direction. We should be much more afraid of what we are doing to our kids if we refuse to make changes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next is Lori Marsh. On deck, Angela Barber. Good evening. Uh, Lori Marsh, L-O-R-I-M-A-R-S-H. I live at 3809 South 19th Street in Lincoln. Um, I probably won't go my five minutes because I'm going to read off my little handwritten notes instead of something that's been sent out to me via email on my phone. Um, I'm retired military. I've been de deployed to some areas which are not so great. Many of them don't have any kind of law enforcement, or if they do, they've been paid off. There's little or no justice. Uh, there's little or no compassion. And what I learned from that was that how great we have it here in the United States. It might not be a perfect system. Um, there's going to be bad apples in, in anything. There are doctors that kill people. Um, I, I'm not acknowledging that uh, anything anybody does um, on purpose to hurt somebody, um, obviously that's wrong. But I don't feel like defunding a police department based on uh, actions of somebody is realistic at all. Um, I do believe that police will make a difference. Five more police will make a huge difference. Our city has grown exponentially, and I don't believe that uh, we have been keeping up with the needs of our city. Um, that would be five more people in a separate area of town um, that we don't have now. Uh, I support our police. I believe they do a great job. I don't believe they in, are inherently racist. Um, I believe that if this money that's earmarked um, becomes available, I believe he should accept it. I believe that it would do good for the city of Lincoln. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next, Karen Wilson. On deck, Jake Hop. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. My name is Kieran. I'm going to take off my shirt because I'm sweating and also because I'm wearing this really nice shirt on underneath. Um, this is actually what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I'm going to take my mask off. Sorry. Could you, yeah, s could so. you say your name again? Oh, I'm sorry. Kieran Wilson. Thank you. Can I go now? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, what I want to talk to you about um, specifically, I'm going to start off talking about the protests. Um, there were some statements made this past week, specifically by Terry Wagner. I understand that he is not in LPD, but I still think it's important to acknowledge one of the statements that he made. He said that um, the communication with LPD, um, that they were told that these protests were never legal. Um, I don't know what ordinance he's referring to, but if there's an ordinance that like our city council has passed at any point that makes protesting illegal. I think that it's important that we review that. And if that statement's untrue, then I think it's important that we release the communication that led to that statement being made. If there were conversations between LPD and the sheriff's department that convinced uh, the sheriff's department that these protests were illegal, I think we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, I saw something out of Minneapolis specifically 
where the communication between their departments led them to believe that situations were being escalated. Um, and I'm not going to speculate here, but at the same time, I think that it's important that if this is a problem that we're seeing elsewhere, that we look into whether or not it's happening here. And if we don't have access to that information, if that's outside of your power to get that, then at the end of the day, that means that the police are in control of the situation. If we don't have access to the narrative that led them to do the actions that they did, then the police have free reign to determine what that narrative is. Um, so that's specifically about the protest. Um, moving forward from that, I want to speak about um, some of the individuals that were here that spoke uh, prior to us. I think it's important to acknowledge where these perspectives are coming from. You know, I'm going to be plain and simple with you here. I keep saying P words really forcefully. Um, I'm going to be plain and simple with you here. Um, individuals believe that their communities are safe because of policing. But that's not why. It's because they live in privileged communities. You know, if you go down to the near south and sit around there for five minutes, I guarantee you, you will see more police pass by your location in five minutes than you would see in five days in their neighborhoods. Their neighborhoods are not safe because of policing. It's safe because of privilege. And so when someone like me comes up here and starts telling you that I have friends that live in these communities that are going through these problems and that police are a problem in those communities, and you listen to these people who are telling you that police are helpful, you have to acknowledge where it's coming from, right? I mean, if I'm having more interactions with police over the course of my lifetime, then I think that my frustrations with them are justified and they should be carried with more weight, essentially. I mean, another thing that's important to acknowledge is we talk about how we have criminals and we need to use um, police to combat this problem. But at the end of the day, if our prisons are getting more and more full and we're telling uh, our police are telling us they need more and more police, how are they fighting crime? They're not doing a good job, apparently. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that there are other ways that we can fix issues. You know, we don't always have to build walls to stop people from getting in. We can fix the problems that are making them want to get in the first place. It's the same thing with the police. We don't always have to hit everything like it's a nail. You know, we have other ways that we can solve these problems. And it's unfair for someone speaking from a position of privilege to not acknowledge that. It's absolutely unfair. We make criminals out of people by not fixing the problems that lead them to live those, those lifestyles. It's super important to acknowledge that. And you're not going to hear that from these people because, plain and simple, again, their neighborhoods are not safe because of the police. They're safe because they're from privileged neighborhoods. It's just factual. There's no arguments around it. And so the last thing that I want to speak on is kind of in reference to things that we've already discussed with you, um, uh, particularly, particularly the medical uh, bills being paid. Um, I spoke to you the first time and I told you that if you don't have the power to make the police pay the medical bills, then I think it's your personal responsibility. And I mean that. I want you to reach out to these people and hear their stories. Because at the end of the day, if they are paying tax money for police to protect them and then those people assault them, you have a responsibility to make sure that they don't have to pay again. One minute. They, they paid those salaries and those police ended up assaulting them. Why should they have to pay the medical bills? Even if you think that their use of force was justified, even if you say those were just mistakes, why should they have to pay. They've already paid. You know, the same argument happens when we talk about the police unions. That money is my money that's being funneled into these politicians' campaigns. Or the gentleman who talked about the police funding his football team. That's my money. At the end of the day, we need to acknowledge that. These people are beholden to doing the right thing because of the money that's funding them is coming from people. And so when I tell you that there's a problem, you need to listen to that because I am paying for the system to continue perpetuating, it, per, perpetuating itself against people of color. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, Jack Hoppy, on deck, Kayla Peterson. Jack Hoppy. Okay, next up, Kayla Peterson, on deck, Marina Kushner. I'm Caleb Peterson, C-A-L-E-B-P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. And I just got nervous right as I was walking up here. Um, all right, so I'm going to like calm myself for a second for some reason. Uh, thank you for letting me talk with you guys. Um, when I did my research over the weekend about uh, the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, uh, I was surprised to see that there was... Well, I wasn't surprised to see that we had to defund certain departments because of the um, projected $12 million shortfall. Um, but I was surprised to see that amidst our current 
social climate amidst what's going on that uh, the police department was getting more funding. Um, and in that surprise, I think, is kind of what I want to talk about today. I think everyone here that has spoken so far has shared a lot of good details about uh, why, uh, why people are saying to defund the police. And um, I know that you've, I, well, I hope you've done research. I think you guys, you, you do this for your job. So I know that you're, I don't think I'm going to tell you a perspective that you don't necessarily have. But as a citizen re reading through the budget, I want to talk from that angle. Um, I think when I see when I see a lack of decrease in the proposed budget um, and a lack of defunding, I, I notice that I think of you sitting there and think, how, how are you going to actually, like, how are you supposed to solve the problem? How are you supposed to hear everyone? How are you supposed to make systemic change? And I think you're probably thinking, what's feasible? What works? What's smart? You're thinking, what's rational? What works within this system? But I'm thinking if racism is systemic, if, if racism is a part of the system, how is that gonna, how is that gonna change anything? Um, based on this budget, it feels like we think that the system is unchangeable. It's like, it's like, it's like gravity almost. Like it's gonna, it exists whether or not we can, we can't do anything about it. It feels like you, you think the police is like a truism, like it's self-evident. Like, there's nothing that we can, we can't change something that is a, a physical reality. Like, it's like inertia, but an object, an object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. And if this is the system and it's in motion, we have to act upon it. We have to do something to change it. And I don't think that body cams, and I don't think that adding, adding funding is going to change this system. I think that it's, uh, how, how can you, if they're the power, if, that's, if, that, if, if the police is the power, how is adding more money to it decreasing power? MLK said, the oppressor never gives up their power to the oppressed. How are we listening to this current moment if we're continuing to add power to this thing that is oppressing? So if, you as a, if we are, as a city move forward with this budget, it makes me think that you, you must not believe racism is systemic. You must not believe that there's a systemic problem because you're not making systemic change. You're, you're giving people umbrellas during a rainstorm, but the problem is not getting wet. The problem is that it's raining. That's, what, that's gravity. That's like inertia. You know what I mean? So y you can actually change that, though. You can dream. You can, people built planes. They defied. They actually changed the system, right? I don't want to believe that you've stopped dreaming, and I don't want to believe that you are just tr trying to make compromises and just working within the system. I don't want to believe that you're just trying to do what's feasible. I want to believe that you're actually dreaming, that you're thinking, how do we create a society? How do we create a place that loves everyone, that honors everyone, where all people are created equal? One minute. It, I don't want to believe that my city has stopped dreaming. I don't want to believe that we're making compromises because our compromises continue at the expense of our black community, of our minority groups, of the poor, and they continue to uphold the ways of life of people that look like me and the people that come from wealthier backgrounds. They continue to uphold white supremacy in our city. So I come here to support uh, the ideas of defunding the police because I, I want to dream of how do we change a system. And I want you to also dream about changing a system. And right now, I'm not, I'm not feeling that from my city. I don't, I don't think we believe in systemic racism as a government right now. That's what it feels like. So thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next, Marina Kushner. On deck, Caleb Peterson. That was Caleb. That was oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Marina Kushner? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name's Marina Kushner. I've grown up in Lincoln. Um, I think you've heard from a lot of really exhausted people today. I'm personally really exhausted from the month of just trying to work through everything that's going on, figure out what we can even feasibly do. Um, so I'm just trying to get my thoughts together here today. 
I want to acknowledge um, how traumatic it is for black people and other indigenous people of color to come here and testify and have to sit through these testimonies and hear people like disregard their existence. It's painful for me and so I can't imagine how painful it is and I see the pain in my friend's eyes in the hallway as these people walk past them and just disregard their existence. I also want to thank Michael Bowers for, James Michael Bowers, for getting the online testimony going. Um, Last time I testified, I said it feels really inaccessible to be here, and that is a step towards making it more accessible, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's really interesting how a lot of the folks who testify in support of funding the cops live in neighborhoods that the rest of us don't live in. I think it's worth noting, as Kieran mentioned, um, there's clearly a divide in Lincoln. There's like us and everybody else. There's some exceptions to people who live in other neighborhoods, but we're living in separate realities. Um, and our reality we're asking for doesn't endanger these people, but their reality they're asking for does endanger our community. I think admitting that we need to invest in 600, 800, a million, whatever dollars in this budget for body cams is admitting there's a serious problem. I don't see why we have to invest almost a million dollars to get body cams if there's not a police violence issue or a discrepancy in their honesty. Um, I don't think body cams work. We've heard the statistics that tell us they don't work. So there's like between half a million and a million dollars we can be investing in other communities that need the investments. Um, there was an interview with Terry Wagner, like Kieran mentioned, on NET. You can find some of the excerpts on Chris Dunker's Twitter. Uh, saying that the protesters were mostly peaceful, but b verbally abusive. In his own words, he says the pr protesters were peaceful and verbally abusive. Um, how long could that go on? So they took that verbal abuse and responded with this force. There were some like water bottles thrown, which I think we're all aware are not very like lethal weapons, water bottles. Um, I don't really understand how that then came to be noses flying off, people potentially permanently blinded, holes in their heads, um, spending time in hospitals, out of places like we are today. If they were shot on Sunday night, they can't come to city council the next day and testify. The police took them off of the playing field um, and we're offering them half a million dollars in return so that they can continue doing that and have more officers to help them do that instead of investing in libraries so that those kids who had their noses blown off can go to the library and learn about how to defund the police that blew their nose off. Um, it's just completely backwards and frustrating and I know you've heard this a million times. I'm just sad that I live in a community where we have to say it a million times and that people just disregard the reality, which is pain and oppression. Um, if we can't agree on this very obvious thing to me, which is the police brutality of that weekend and obviously of uh, as a regular phenomenon, I just don't understand why we can't just like freeze where we're at because clearly they've got a lot of cops, they've got a lot of rubber bullets, they've got a lot of tear gas. Let's so just stop, leave them where we're at, take the $800,000 and put it somewhere where it matters and come back to this at the next budget, see how it goes. Like, just give us a chance to keep working on mm -hmm. our organizing because a lot of us are very new to this. Um, we just want to like live peacefully and be able to afford where we live and like eat and like care about each other. So just like, please have some faith in us and stop disregarding black people and people of color and just just like stop just listen it's so it's fucked up thank you thank you for your testimony just briefly we have five more testifiers and then we'll move on to our online zoom but i will double check to make sure that everyone that is here has testified mark Frioff. On deck, Roxanne Pearsall. Hi. Um, sorry, I didn't know I was up. So, my name is Mark Freeoff. I live here in Lincoln. Um, I'll write my address down wherever I'm supposed to. Um, before I get to the subject at hand, I just wanted to share something I learned yesterday. 
Um, I was listening to a brilliant psychologist talk about diversity, race, and groups. And that seems to be what all this is centered around. The gist was this. Did you know that there's more diversity within a racial group than there is between that group and another group? I didn't know that. I, I had to think about that a sec, but it makes sense when you start thinking about it. I'll repeat that. Did you know there's more diversity within a racial group than there is between that group and another group? Well, what are these things? I mean, anything you can dream of. Uh, interests, professions, abilities, intelligence, physical, athletic abilities, you name it. Diversity within a group. To suggest that in 2020, differences between people can be summed up by their skin color is inherently a racist notion. I'll repeat that again. And this is the psychologist talking who studied this. This isn't me. To suggest that differences between people can be summed up by their skin color is inherently a racist notion. I say that to point out that there's more that unites us across the white, black, Hispanic, insert race, group, divide than, the, than divides us. So with that in mind, I'd ask you to be suspicious of those who attempt to divide us based on skin color using just emotion, which amounts to feelings, and hyperbole. Um, so I'll just get on to uh, the subject at hand. I emailed some of this already. Um, City Council, please support our local police by accepting the federal grant to add five more officers to the force. This is badly needed in Lincoln. The officer to citizen ratio is only 11.6 per 10,000 compared to the national average of 18.7 per 10,000. I believe motivation for even considering the opposite stems from some sort of feeling of virtue garnered by jumping on the now chic anti-police bandwagon. However, I warn you, this is entirely false feeling of virtue that stems probably more from political convenience than actual virtue at this moment. In a year, you will wish you had accepted five more officers. Consider how accepting five free police who deal directly with gun violence would have been a no-brainer for the council and the mayor a year ago. A year ago during the safe storage debate, would, would we be having this conversation? No, this would have been slammed through like other things today. <clears throat> Many of the people here now speaking against the police would have supported five cops to deal with gun violence a year ago. I, I can't wrap my head around the, um, the hypocriticalness of that. Many people here speaking against police today would have supported the five cops a year ago to speak to, to oppose the gun violence. Now they're opposed to five more cops. I, I can't comprehend that. Our police generally do a good job. There have been zero unarmed people of color shot by police since 2015. That's a fact, not a feeling. There have been zero suspects shot and killed since 2017 in Lincoln of any race. Punishing the Lincoln police for a job well done therefore makes zero sense. One minute. Um, I'll tell you who was hurt recently. There were 27 cops hurt in the riots. I, I don't know why this isn't more broadly you know, talked about by the mayor or the police themselves. Um, there must be a gag order there. But there's 27 cops. I don't know how many have come back uh, from, their, from being hurt. I mean, five more might be a good idea, don't you think? Especially ones that deal directly with gun violence, which apparently was an issue here a year ago. Um, <clears throat> as an elected representative of a democratic republic form of government, it's your job to see through the smokescreen of passing political wins. And that's what this is. And I rate mobs and do the right thing long term for the city. That's basically the definition of your job is to see through, be wise and see through the mobs. That's why we live in a democratic republic and not a democracy. So in closing, I urge you to stand up for Lincoln and support your oath of office to uphold the laws of Lincoln by enabling the Lincoln Police Department to effectively do their job. 
It's common sense and it's also the right thing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, Roxanne Pearsall on deck, Maya Moore. Hello. Um, so if you don't want to hear feelings, I'll give you guys facts. Um, so I'm sure you guys are already aware of these statistics. Um, black people make up 13% of the population, yet they're arrested. Um, yet they are 24% um, of the people arrested um, since uh, 2019, 1,000 people were killed by the police. Um, and since 2013, 99% of police have not been charged for any of these murders. And body cams do not help. And I feel like some of these police enthusiasts and police supporters would be aware of these statistics. But evidently, I'm just hearing a lot of people who are afraid of change. And I'm hearing a lot of reactionary rhetoric. Um, so I just want to make this brief. I want to thank you guys for listening um, to us. Uh, you guys have a long night ahead of you. Um, so I'm just going to keep this short. In uh, Camden, New Jersey, uh, the murder rates were 18, were 18 times higher than the national average. Um, in 2013, they implemented heavy police reform. Um, they dissolved the police department and um, created a county force. Um, the police were rehired. They were required to fill out a 50-page application and undergo psychological testing. Um, and after this, homicides went down from 67 in 2012 to 25 in 2019. And excessive force complaints went down from 65 to 3 in 2019. And I can only say that I'm really disappointed that um, a lot of these police supporters ignore these statistics. It only makes me believe that they um, want to uphold their power and satisfy their fascist desires to punish the poor and punish minorities. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you guys very much. Thank you for your testimony. Maya Moore on deck is Thank you. Hi, my name is Maya Moore. I am a resident of Lincoln, and I've lived here my whole life. Um, I want to open with a quote by Angela Davis, if you are familiar with her. And if you aren't, you should read her work. It's very, very amazing. Everyone is familiar with the slogan, the personal is political. Not only what we experience on a personal level has profound political implications, but that our interior lives, our emotional lives, are very much informed by ideology. We sometimes do the work of the state in and through our interior lives. What we often assume belongs most intimately to ourselves and to our emotional life has been produced elsewhere and has been recruited to do the work of racism and repression. And so this um, really highlights the importance of examining racism within yourself, not that you are racist, but it is examining how our racist systems have taught you to believe that the white class, the, it's a class, it's mostly white, it's not all white, but it's the false belief that white people get more at the expense of black and brown people getting less. And that lie has been sold to us in America. And there are a lot of people that are unwilling to break apart the system that upholds the wealth, the monopoly that controls and represses the working class, 
that disproportionately um, <coughs> represses and oppresses black and brown people in America. And this brings me to the point that I am a white ally for the Black Lives Matter movement. I think police, the defunding of the police in Lincoln is essential for the liberation of black and brown people in our community because it is a part of the same system that oppresses them and funnels them into the prison industrial complex, which is made under the, the slight um, differentiating and differentiation um, in the 13th Amendment when it was passed to end slavery. The amendment read, we shall, we shall declare that slavery is ended, but, but it is still legal if the person is imprisoned, if they are incarcerated. Every person, every able-bodied person that enters a federal prison is forced to do labor. That is slavery, and that is legalized slavery. And there are organizations that write legislation, such, such as ALEC, who have board members from large corporations that benefit from prison labor. We cannot continue to fund the police and prisons that uphold this unjust system. But when we look towards a future where everyone is valued without this industrial complex that profitizes off of legalized slavery, um, we can we can dream, as many others have have um, one minute. Um, thank you. Have testified to today. We cannot solve problems bigger than our imagination. In order to solve our problems, we have to think bigger than the systems that we currently uphold. We can't work within the confines of our systems that we have right now, and that starts with defunding the police and reallocating those funds to services that actually help people. Putting people in prisons does not disappear the problem. It only disappears the person. And once they come out of the prison, they often have a lot of rights taken away that were outlawed after Jim Crow was passed. It is the new Jim Crow in that it has legalized some of the same restrictions that were in place for black and brown people before then. We can no longer fund this system, and we need to defund Lincoln Police. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Is on deck Anna Graff. Hello, hello. I'll take off my mask. Hello, and I just first off want to say thank you for your time, and I also want to thank you for allowing online commentary for those who could not attend for today's meeting. And I'm sure you know why I'm here. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has only been a cornerstone of life for white Americans. The history of gen gentrification and redlining alone can prove that. These narratives of police being guardians of the law and, and order are inconsistent with the real actions the LPD have taken. There are countless victims of sexual assault, domestic abuse, people of the LGBTQ community, people with mental illnesses, and people of color, specifically black people, that can prove that. The Omaha Police Department did not completely take key eyewitnesses, their accounts of the death of James Scurlock. Rest in peace. The Lincoln police did not protect Lincoln protesters from, sorry, this gets me riled up, from white supremacists circling the downtown Lincoln area in unidentifiable trucks, harassing and terrorize pe terrorizing people trying to leave the protests. And on top of that, 
the Lincoln Police Department consistently targeted neutral party street medics caring for injured protesters with rubber bullets and tear gas canisters. This is not an issue that involves some unfortunate situations with some bad apples. And to the white people in the room and watching online and everything, your individual experiences with cops do not overrule the toxic history between the police and an entire group of people. This is a systematic problem deeply rooted within an organization that has no checks to its power. If you want to make a complaint about the LPD, you have to make it through their internal affairs and risk dox doxing yourself. And even now, with the people speaking, they are conscious about giving out their identities and addresses in order to avoid harassment. Why should we fund a system that is more corrupt than a few bad apples? This type of corruption goes right down to the roots. Instead of awarding a grant to the LPD, I I'm asking you guys to think of ways that you can use those funds towards community efforts that will actually benefit marginalized communities. Like you've heard already, you know, funding for social work, upgrading parks, making a thorough plan for the youth of Lincoln when they go back to school this August. Give these funds to programs that will uplift the overall community rather than fueling a department that only increases distrust and anxiety in Lincoln. I am a white woman. I am an ally to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I've had good experiences with cops, but I recognize the fact that there is an entire community of people who have had negative experiences with the police force and that it's not okay for me as a white woman and for anybody of the white community to sit aside and let these injustices happen. The Lincoln Police Department have not kept the peace. They have kept the oppressed afraid to speak out and kept the unjustified power of white supremacists. And we are here today because we will not allow history to repeat itself. And we, the people, ask for you to check your conscience and check the facts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Anna Graff on deck, Alex Hochin. Hotchin, excuse me, sir. My name is Anna Graf. Um, do I need to spell that? <laughs> um, I have your info okay. from before. Thank you. Um, throughout the response to COVID-19, all sorts of things have been made more accessible than they ever were before, from education to workplaces to socializing to local government. These accommodations have created a society where people can participate, regardless of their health risks or disability status. This rapid and dramatic shift has greatly benefited people's health throughout this pandemic. These adjustments are new, but should be permanent. For some people, especially disabled people and those with chronic illnesses, some of whom will testify after this, these are accommodations that have been denied to them for a long time, saying that it would take too much work. But we have all learned throughout the past couple of months that these reasonable changes can be made, switching back to only allowing in-person testimony or requiring people to specifically reach out for accommodations discourages many from testifying and limits their ability to participate in these decision-making processes. Virtual testifying needs to remain in place permanently at each and every meeting. Making sure that disabled people have access to testify is essential to addressing racism and police brutality, as disabled people, and in particular black disabled people, are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Out of all of the people killed by police, half of them have disabilities. Continuing to allow virtual testimony would mean a more informed discussion, leading to more effective solutions. As a disabled person, I know the great difference ac accommodations can make. Participating in something does not require doing it in the same way that everyone else does. Just because someone is not able to physically travel to this room does not make them any, any less of an important voice in these discussions. And this would also have a great impact for people who have disabilities and other um, marginalized identities. It would have a greater impact for people who are black and brown, other than as a white person, I have had access to resources that many people of color have not had access to. A kinder, more just society includes everyone having access to these conversations and prioritizes the voices of people who have been ignored and oppressed, so black people. Making public meetings, especially city council meetings, 
more accessible is important so that all can participate, not just those with resources who tend to be wider and wealthier and older. Continuing virtual testifying is one way to begin to change that. Even as many people begin to meet in person, even if a vaccine is developed, there are lots of people whose ability to participate in local government will drastically decline if easy access to virtual testifying is not continued. The Lincoln City Council should have virtual testifying for each and every meeting, abolish the police, and don't put a landlord on the planning commission. People making profit out of housing hurts everyone, but especially black people. And it's antithetical to affordable housing and racial justice. It keeps people in poverty. Rather than investing in these systems of policing that perpetuate racism, we should invest in public housing to undo the, hor the historic injustices reproduced through housing. Many people tonight have mentioned the divide that people experience in the city, that is specifically because of redlining. It is segregation that has, that has been perpetuated. Um, that was done to oppress black people that made money for white people directly, like it's taking money from black people who were forced to rent and giving it to white people. And it's continuing to see cycles. Housing is a human right. Making money off of housing is not a human right. They are in direct opposition. Policing is a tool to protect those with money and hurt black and brown communities, continuing our country's long tradition of exploiting, black, of exploiting the labor of black and brown people to benefit white people and only valuing people if they are productive and the things that make money for those wealthy white people. This began during slavery. As someone recently mentioned, race, yeah, it's a, it's a social concept. Racism was developed before race was. They had to develop race as a way to justify Minute. their economic exploitation of black people, their human trafficking. And this continues. This is directly related to the mass incarceration that we experience. Racism is really complicated. It's a very complicated system. I'm continually learning more about it. And it's like that because people benefit from it. White people didn't just decide to create racism because they were bored. They decided to create these complicated systems because they benefit from them, and they continue to. These are complicated systems that take a long time to address, but by making sure that everyone is in, is, has access to these opportunities, and in particular those who are most dramatically affected by these decisions, so black disabled people, that is related to reducing these systems of violence. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Alex. And if there is anyone left here at the chambers that need to testify, please come in in the chambers. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Houchin. That's H-O-U-C-H-I-N. Uh, I, I prepared these statements uh, really in a rush. So uh, if, if it seems disjointed, and uh, well, that's why also because I'm nervous. Yeah. Um, hello, most of the city council. Thank you for staying so late. And I hope you had time to grab a snack during the break. Although I was born and raised in Nebraska, I'm not originally from Lincoln. However, at this point, I've been here more than half my life, so Lincoln feels more like home to me than anywhere else. I'm here to add my voice to calls to defund police, and I'd like to try explaining why. First, I'm sure you've all heard the old adage that when you, the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Kieran touched on it briefly earlier. So few of our problems as a city are actually nails, and you want to add more hammers? Let me explain. On average, 90% of police calls are for incidents that do not involve interpersonal threat of any kind, traffic violations, sh shoplifting, and so on. Yet, when you send an armed law enforcement officer into these situations, even the most exemplary officer with a spotless record and no complaints, you by definition introduce an element of threat to a situation where there was none. Tensions rise, fear rises, and prior experiences, whether direct or vicarious, begin to influence the actions of all involved, including the officer. Responding to problems with the right tools, whether that means unarmed traffic liaisons or conflict resolution specialists or mental health interve intervention specialists or property crime investigators or whatever you can imagine, you will not only see greater success in crime reduction and crime prevention, but you will also build and develop greater trust throughout the community. Second, while we're throwing around adages, there's another one that gets thrown around, particularly by our friends with blue stickers, but it gets misused a lot. Uh, it goes, don't let a couple of bad apples spoil the barrel. The way it's usually used, though, it means don't let the actions of a few cause prejudice against the rest, but that's actually in incorrect, and this is a little bit of a science lesson here. 
When an apple goes bad, it starts giving off ethylene gas. And if that bad apple is stored in a barrel with a bunch of other apples, that ethylene gas actually causes the rest of the apples to go bad. You have to get rid of the bad apples. Now, do I think all police are racist? No. I don't even know if most of them are racist. But as long as the good police stay silent and act like good little bricks in that blue wall, they're protecting those bad apples. They're allowing those apples to stay in the barrel, giving off that gas. And that's what we mean when we say the system is racist. Third, I want to point out that statistically speaking, police body cam footage is far more likely to be used to prosecute citizens than to hold police accountable. It's a red herring. This grant is bad news, no thanks. Finally, it's been said before, but I'll say it again. Neighborhoods with the lowest crime rates are also the neighborhoods with the most resources. And that's because the vast majority of crime is socioeconomic in nature. Our budget is a reflection of our values. And I would urge you all to reimagine that budget to make sure that all of our neighborhoods have the same resources as our safest neighborhoods. This has been proven to work in communities regardless of the demographics. If we can divert law enforcement funding to spend it on measures that actually prevent crime, rather than throwing ever increasing amounts at responding to it, why wouldn't we? Doesn't that prevent the most harm? Isn't that the whole point? We can imagine a better Lincoln, and that starts with what we spend our money on. Black Lives Matter, I yield my time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Please state your name. Hi, my name is um, Devin Colson. Um, my address is 1837 Sewell Street. Um, I'm going to take a deep breath real quick. Go right ahead. I went back and forth about whether or not I was going to share this evening because the past month has been so full of me recognizing the privileges that I'm born with, that I've grown up incoherent of, and I think this is like an active choice to begin this lifelong journey of standing up for individuals that in the current time may not have a voice. and. Um, yeah, just being a compassionate community member and learning and all of those things. Um, I want to recognize that I think it's really significant that we're all here right now. Um, how long people have stayed to listen and just thank you for your time. Um, I didn't know that racism existed in my state, specifically my city, and even more specifically my community until I was let go from my place of employment two weeks ago after addressing a racist comment from the employer that I was under. I found this baffling and um, yeah, it was just a, an eye-opening, awakening moment. Um, I have one other thing to say, and that is um, just another testimony. The other night, I was sitting out with my neighbors on their front porch. We live two blocks south of the Walgreens on 17th and South. We maybe see a cop car go up and down our street once a month, um, if not once every, every couple of months. And I was sitting out on my neighbor's porch and we were talking as we usually do and noticed a police car oddly down the block from us, abandoned. It was under a street light, um, but there was no cop in it. And a couple, or not a couple hours, a couple minutes later, we saw an officer walking around with, um, it, it, it was like one of those uh, battering like stick things and a shield. 
and the officer walked past us and we basically said, hey, um, are we okay? Like, what's going on? The officer responded and said, yeah, everything's all good. Didn't say anything else. My neighbors and I talked about it and we were like, well, are we safe? What's happening? And five minutes later, two more officers came walking down the same street in front of us, just the other direction, and they had two semi-automatic rifles across their chest. We asked again, um, okay, this is kind of concerning what is, what is happening, what is going on, and it took my neighbors and I three times of asking these cops what is going on in our, on our street for them to stop, look us in the eye, and give us some information. We found it startling that the first officer that we encountered failed to mention that there were officers walking around with guns, presumably that there would be a harmful situation happening around us. I don't know why an, uh, a law enforcement officer wouldn't let a neighbor or a concerned community member know what was going on. Um, and throughout this whole encounter, because I was a part of the protest and I have heard the stories of my friends being abused by cops by no reason, I was shook. And that was the first time I literally felt my blood in my veins shake in my body and it really made me think about friends of mine when they share with me the brutality that they've witnessed and the brutality that they've even felt happen to them. I'm sorry my words are like all mixed up right now, but I just think these experiences are worthy of speaking up about and I just want to thank you all and encourage you to please keep doing the work. One of my favorite mentors growing up always told me to, before pointing the thumb at other people, to t point the thumb back at myself. And this is where it starts. It starts with me as a white middle, middle class person actually acknowledging the privilege that I've been born into so I can speak and create those changes I, I, I dream of seeing in, in the future for my family and my community. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the chambers that would like to testify? Okay, I'm gonna move on to our webinar. And I'll five be. Break. Oh. So, uh, the council's actually going to take a five minute break. Okay. Um, let's reconvene back at 10.05.
and reconvened for the webinar portion of public comment. Um, the same uh, guidelines still apply. Uh, public comment is uh, for five minutes to ensure that everyone has a chance to speak. Our city clerk, Sony, uh, will let people know when it is their turn to uh, participate in public comment. Uh, we will have a timer to let you know when you have one minute left. Thank you so much. We have Emily Milligan. Emily? I can come back to Ms. Milligan. Elise Ellers. Elise Hello. Ellers? Is this Elise? We can hear you. Is this Elise or is this Emily? Elise Ellers, you're yeah. mic. Yes, go ahead and testify. You can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so hi, my name is Elise Ehlers, E-L-I-S-E-E-H-L-E-R-S. -E -E um, I'm at 811 N Street. Um, I'll be a senior at the university this fall. Um, I'm here today as a white ally to show my su support for the Black Lives Matter movement and the defunding of the Lincoln Police Department. I believe the people who have spoken before me have done a great job at addressing this issue, however. So I in so instead, I will spend my time advocating for permanent remote access to city government and public forums. Permanent virtual communication will be a vital resource in these coming years as systemic racism continues to be addressed during the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. As many other students at UNL, I am not originally from Lincoln. My family is located outside of the city and I visit them quite frequently. I also stay with them over extended breaks throughout the school year. Many other students experience a similar split of time between Lincoln and their hometowns. While Lincoln is not my hometown, Lincoln is still my home. My apartment is here, my school is here, my community is here. And I, along with every other individual who is unable to make these meetings in person, have a right to listen and participate in local city government. Extended online platforms for local forums and city council meetings should not only be a two-week solution. It should be permanently embraced for all future discussions. To not allow virtual participation, to not live record meetings, to not post taped forums for individuals who are unable but willing to participate is an unjust and negligent abuse of current capabilities and technologies. People have work, people have children to take care of, people travel when school is not in session, and people are scared to go outside because of global pandemics. But these individuals, the members of this community still have a voice. They have a right to speak out against police brutality, speak up for racial justice and equality, for affordable housing, improved education, environmental protection, and all other matters of concern, even if they are not physically present. I am urging you to implement easy, accessible virtual participation and to live stream, record, and post all future meetings and forums in order to ensure continued open dialogue during these times of civil unrest. 
to not utilize your resources to further progress communication within this city would be an illogical and unethical abuse of resources and power. Together, virtually or in person, the issues of systemic racism and oppression will continue to be addressed until the city of Lincoln is safe and welcoming for all people, especially people of color. So to conclude, make local government accessible, Black Lives Matter, and defund the police. Thank you for your time. Milligan, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Emily Milligan. My address is 711 Lakeside Drive, apartment 210. <clears throat> um, okay, first things first, I definitely want to discuss again, as Elise, Elise did uh, before me, how important these meetings are to uh, be more accessible to more people. I, I believe that it is necessary for these meetings to be available remotely for other people. Um, I am unable to come because I live with a person who is high risk um, if contracting COVID. And so I strongly believe that um, I should still be allowed to participate in these um, city council meetings if, even if I am not like Ill eligible to be there in person. <sighs> Sorry. Um, next, I also want to discuss the upcoming proposed budget and increases going towards the law enforcement as well as the presence of police in our communities and schools. Um, <laughs> Uh, do not increase the budget for LPD uh, to add more cops to the streets and to pay for body cameras for them. Uh, there is am ample evidence to prove that body cameras, as well as implicit bias, bias training and other suggestions for reform, uh, don't work. They don't work. Uh, the existence of police as well is well deeply rooted in um, violence, imbalance of power, and white supremacy. Um, I am a white woman, so I and I, yet I have never felt safe. Uh, with police around, and um, I'm a person who is um, greatly benefited from my privileges that my whiteness affords me. I cannot speak on the fears of my fellow residents and friends who are Black, Brown, and Indigenous, as well as queer. I prefer to listen to them, listen to them amplify their voices, and also and to use my voice as an effective ally. Um, next, I want to talk about is um, the defunding of LPD. Uh, I believe they should be defunded for several reasons. One is they receive far too much of the city's budget while si simultaneously spreading fear throughout the community. Uh, it is well known that reforms and bias training in uh, cameras, all that kind of stuff will not fix that. Um, it won't change that um, fact. And um, similar evidence uh, demonstrates that policing uh, becomes less necessary when other public goods are well-funded. This is um, including, but definitely not limited to, healthcare, education, uh, libraries, affordable housing, uh, as well as mental health services and so many more other services that are more deserving of um, funding from the city. Uh, finally, uh, police or RSOs should be removed from schools Black and brown students should not be worried for their well-being while at school, uh, which is meant to be a safe place for them to learn as well as grow. Uh, finally, uh, the many victims of the police violence due to the protests these last few weeks should not be responsible for the amount of medical debt they have now. They did not come to be shot at with rubber bullets by the police. They came to peacefully protest. Um, that is all I have to say now, but um, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week. And uh, Black Lives Matter and always will. Your testimony. Up next, we have Jesse Gray on deck, Rosalind Kitchler. My name is Jesse Gray and I'm here to make sure that the demands of my community are being heard, especially those of Black and POC community members. First and foremost, I'd like to address the proposed budget for 2020 through 2021, specifically the cuts from services like public libraries, as well as the increase in funds to the Lincoln Police Department. Public services like libraries are essential for a community to thrive. At this time in our history, especially as the pandemic rages and black liberation is being fought for, Access to up-to-date and accurate information is an absolute necessity 
and it should be available to all people in our community every day. To take away access to that information and then cut the funding needed to purchase new media for the library is to take away autonomy and the opportunity to educate from individuals, especially those in low income families who have no other options. Libraries are essential and need to be well funded, fully staffed and open every day. Ripping taxpayer dollars away from services like libraries, which actually help our community thrive, and then throwing over half a million dollars into our already bloated police department for five more officers and body cameras is a disgrace and a decision that I strongly oppose. I have noticed that a lot of people who gave testimony today have mentioned that they feel safer with police around. Um, I'd like to reiterate a point that was made that um, each of them was white or white passing. I am also white and I haven't feared for my life due to the presence of a police officer either. We don't have to worry about police killing us because they disproportionately don't. They far more often harass, harm, and kill black and brown people. That's what white privilege is. I care about those lives and those children who have to learn at a young age that in order to protect themselves, they must distrust the only organization provided to us by the state for so-called protection. For innocent mothers and fathers who've been murdered in cold blood by police, some in front of their own children. So I'm here speaking for them. Studies have shown that body cameras do very little to create significant positive effects on police behavior. I'd like to point to the cases of Philando Castile, Samuel DeBose, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, George Floyd, Elijah McClain, and Breonna Taylor as just a few instances that prove that police will not hesitate to harm or murder citizens, especially black and brown men and women, even when they are fully aware that they are being recorded. In short, I adamantly oppose spending more money on police when they have proven time and time again across the country and in Lincoln that they cannot be trusted to protect and serve regardless of new equipment or any so-called reform. On that note, I'd like to talk about how completely unacceptable it is that the Lincoln Police Department has been terrorizing, tear gassing, and shooting at peaceful protesters in our city's streets. The use of tear gas is considered a war crime. Why are police allowed to use it on citizens? According to a study in 2017, 3% of people hit by rubber bullets died of the injury and 15% were permanently injured by them. Why are police shooting them into crowds? I'm calling on our city's leaders to ban the use of these methods of silencing protesters in our city, and I'm urging you to pay the medical expenses caused by them already. The Lincoln Police Department has been intimidating harming and harassing Lincoln's most marginalized citizens for too long. It's time that we defund police and invest in new community programs that are each trained for the specific circumstances that they'll be dealing with. We deserve services that actually keep our community safe and allow us to thrive. I'd like to reiterate what was said earlier um, because many people who have testified still seem to misunderstand that we aren't calling for some kind of free for all or to completely abolish the police at this moment. We're calling to reallocate funds from an already overfunded department in order to create new, better options that will keep all community members safe, not just the white ones. And as a final note, I would urge the city council to continue allowing this kind of uh, public statement via teleconference from now on so that everyone has the same opportunity to voice their concerns. Um, with that being said, Black Lives Matter, and thank you very much. Up next is Rosalind Kitchler on deck, Katie Mar M Maria. Am I good to speak? Yes, yeah, there you go. My name is Rosalind Kitchler, R-O-S-A-L-I-N-D-K-I-C-H-L-E-R. I am a resident of Lincoln, Nebraska, living at 1414 C Street, Apartment 8. I am speaking in support of abolishing the Lincoln Police Department. As such, I am strongly opposed to the proposed city budget. This budget would rob essential social and civil services, such as the library, sidewalk repair, and senior centers in order to afford outfitting Lincoln police with body cameras. I am vehemently against using the city budget to purchase body cameras. 
Body cameras do not disrupt police violence. The police murdered George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philandro Castile, and Tamir Rice while on camera. I am only naming a few well-known victims. As long as police continue to be allowed to use force, they will pose a deadly threat to black residents and other residents of color. As should be resoundingly clear from the continued protest in Lincoln, residents do not want meaningless reforms that channel even more money into policing. Cutting funding for the things that tie our communities together, such as libraries, sidewalks, and public parks, goes against the public trust. It demonstrates that the government of our city favors the perceived protection offered by our police rather than the genuine well-being of Lincoln residents. I would like to correct a resident who spoke earlier. The police have not existed for millennium, as the speaker claimed. Rather, modern policing arose two centuries ago, in the 1800s in the form of Southern slave patrols. Policing spread to large Northern cities as fear of an increasing immigrant population grew. The police do not serve or protect all residents. From its inception to today, policing solely serves the wealthiest and whitest. We are mistaken when we act as if police violence is exceptional. While it may be exceptional when used against white communities, it is the norm for black communities and other communities of color. The nationwide call to abolish policing is not an outsized reaction to a single murder, but rather a long overdue reckoning with an inherently racist system. The only effective way to prevent continued violence against black residents and other residents of color is to completely defund the Lincoln police. This money should instead be directed towards supporting our communities through the provision of social services, rather than surveying and terrorizing them. While I am here, I also demand the city of Lincoln drop all charges against protesters arrested while protest protesting police violence, and I demand the city pay all their medical bills. A young protester had to have their nose reattached to their face after being hit by a rubber bullet. Tear gas is classified as a chemical weapon prohibited in warfare. You cannot undo the physical and mental harm caused by the police's gross use of violence against protesters. However, if you feel any contrition for these disgusting actions carried out by the police, you can take steps to limit this harm by dropping charges and paying all medical bills. Finally, I strongly request all city government meetings continue to allow comment by teleconferencing from now on. Members of city government should be as accessible as possible to their residents. Making meetings available enables many more people to attend and participate. Black Lives Matter, and I thank you for your time. Okay, next is Katie Mara. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Katie Maria. Uh, I live at 1640 East Street in the near south. I'm a graduate teaching assistant at UNL, and my views are my own. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, which I just bring up as a reminder that many of us are both committed to Lincoln and to other communities, and that um, the issues we're facing are, you know, across borders. Uh, I basically want to just echo everything that Rosalind just said, but um, I have uh, a few notes that I'll go ahead and read. Um, it is on some level humorous, but mostly terrifying that a bunch of people who are not from over-policed neighborhoods showed up here tonight to communicate that they are afraid of chaos. When I tuned into this meeting, that's where we were at. And so... I did and do feel urged in my spirit to speak to those people directly for a moment. I realize that the city council has listened to a lot of repetition. So uh, I see you. But to those people, um, your chaos, the chaos that you fear is internal. Gather yourself, calm yourself. This is a breakdown of what you know as reality. Your reality exists because of other people's labor labor that you never see, labor that is not compensated fairly by laborers who are not protected fairly. One example, the people who work in meatpacking plants to make sure you have chicken every day. Another example, me. I teach composition at UNL and make roughly $17,000 a year to do this. That's my income and I'm a highly qualified and experienced teacher. The president of the university system makes nearly $1.2 million annually. There is no equality under the guise of an unencumbered free market. You can't see this because you are protected by your class and your race and your well-meaning intentions. 
but intentions are not reality. Okay, I'll be done speaking to those people now. Um, those of us calling for a defunding or abolition of the police are not calling for chaos. This is certainly not the case. And the testimonies I first heard when I tuned in proves to me that a massive historical and emotional knowledge gap exists among those who have not lived in over-policed areas, a willful ignorance even. Good thing there is the internet. I know the mayor's budget does not propose a decrease in police funding. We are nowhere near a kind of government that does not rely on a prison industrial complex, not in this city or state or country. The United States has more prisons and prisoners than any other place, and the vast majority of them have not committed violent crimes, not even close. There is no correlation or causation nationally or locally between a decrease in violent crime and an increase in police officers, none. 14 hours of diversity training is not enough, but does not require a budget increase. It is about reprioritization. When people ask that one not make all police officers bad because Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd, they miss the point. It is the responsibility of you, the city council and chief Blymeister and our mayor and me as an educator to communicate that we have a comprehensive local and national understanding of the racist, sexist, classist and ableist systems that regulate our daily lives. The real reason I came here today is to say simply two things. The first is that if reallocation seems difficult to imagine, it is because the systems in which we currently operate are not meeting the needs of the people. If reallocation seems difficult, it is because we lack imagination and are making excuses. Community, community centers, parks, rec centers, recycling programs, libraries, more freaking libraries and books that depict black and brown children in our libraries, all of that. I want to shout out the young woman who did that math and also Jenny Tyner's idea about high schools staying online so that elementary schools can spread out. That I had to register for this meeting before noon, that I found out how to register on Instagram, that there was no option for closed captions in the video are, two, are just two pieces of evidence that the city as a governing body is not thoroughly thinking about all of the people that you serve. So please, Please allow permanent online access to all of these local forums for the foreseeable future, regardless of COVID. And please, please, please just hear me loud and clear that if reallocation seems difficult, it is because we lack imagination. Thank you. We have Jasmine Sheets and on deck is Sarah O'Neill. Hi, can you guys hear me? Perfect, yes, this is she. Yeah, sorry about that. My name is Jasmine Sheets and I live at 3769 Garfield Street. And I wanna thank you for making public comment more accessible. And I do want to demand that accessibility continues even after the pandemic, as many constituents are unable to attend in person but need to have their voices heard. Members of the community should be able to attend by a tel teleconference as I am now, and these meetings should continue to be held after normal quote unquote, quote unquote workday hours. I am also here to speak to you today regarding the Lincoln Police Department. After seeing the brutal force used against pro peaceful protesters here in our city, I am appalled that we are continuing to fund this department. Friends of mine were tear gassed and arrested while exercising their First Amendment rights and I now know what it feels like to be afraid of law enforcement. 
funds should be reallocated away from the police and given to other agencies in our city that serve us, such as mental health services, social workers, homelessness, affordable housing, addiction services, libraries, and parks. Our tax dollars should not support abusing the public. Instead, our taxes should be used to uplift those in our community. While it sounds great on paper that body cameras will will be purchased for every member of the force, we all know that these cameras seem to malfunction or that foot, footage is otherwise irretrievable when recordings need to be reviewed. To repeat earlier sentiments, studies show that body cameras do not reduce police violence. Even here in Lincoln, we are not immune to police brutality and racism. Others testifying tonight stated that there have been no examples of police brutality in Lincoln, and I am here to tell you that they're wrong. There was an instance where three police officers were wearing body cameras, but zero of the three officers had their cameras turned on during an incident where a black man was found knocked to the ground and unconscious downtown. The available footage skipped at the crucial moment when an officer, Aaron Peth, grabbed his arm to move him away. Yet footage from a nearby business clearly shows this officer taking the man down, causing his head to hit the sidewalk and rendering him unconscious. This man's shoulder was also fractured during the encounter. When the man regained consciousness, he was lying face down in a pool of blood with an officer's knee in his back. This man was not armed, nor was he dangerous or a threat to the security of officers or the public. This is unacceptable. As this was already discussed by a previous person testifying, nearly a decade ago in Camden, New Jersey, the police were disbanded and dissolved. I won't repeat the statistics that were already stated, as you have already heard them. The disbanding of police in Camden allowed the city to start anew and highlighted fiscal responsibility and also reduced police violence and crime. We need that here in Lincoln. Furthermore, officers should be required to carry professional liability insurance on their own accord. All too often, cities are paying settlements due to illegal and inappropriate force by officers. Requiring this insurance will cause officers to think twice before brutalizing the public. I urge you not to accept the $635,000 in federal funds that will add more police officers to our city. If you're wondering if we need change, you're damn right we do. And we need change now. The public is watching. Please show that you care about Black, Brown, and Indigenous lives in our community. Black Lives Matter, and I thank you for your time. Up next is Sarah O'Neill on deck, Paul Polson. Hello, my name is Sarah O'Neill. My address is 6809 Beaver Creek Lane. I'm speaking today because Black Lives Matter. As you consider the mayor's recommended 2020 to 2021 budget, I need you to ask yourselves the following. Is this anti-racist and pro-Black? Will it lead to unintended and discriminatory consequences? Can this be wielded to hurt the very people you are elected to serve? And does this respect, care, and value all members of our community? If you do not think critically, deeply, and understand intersectionality and systemic racism, then we will get results that only serve to appease the privileged folks in Lincoln, leaving everyone else worse off. The mayor's proposed budget is worrisome to say the least. Giving more money to the police will not make Lincoln safer. Even if you package the expansion in bows labeled increased body cameras, expanding the mental health association partnership and adding one sexual assault investigator. Upon first glance, these reforms sound great. They seem just, they seem right, but they are not. Giving LPD a million dollars to expand in these ways is not the answer and is not how our city should be spending our tighter budget due to the COVID pandemic. If you worry about police officer misconduct, have few, fewer police officers. The fact that you do not trust police officers demonstrates in itself that there is a larger problem at hand. We need what we need is not more videos of black and brown women, men, trans and cis, as well as non-binary folks being murdered. 
If you truly care about mental health, you should understand that police play an integral role in exacerbating mental health issues. Adults with severe mental illness account for one in four people killed in police encounters, and individuals with untreated mental illness face 16 times greater risk of being killed in a law enforcement encounter. Giving more money to LPD to address problems they are only capable of worsening is not the answer. We need to invest in care. We need to create a model in our community that actually serves those experiencing mental illness problems and the police cannot be involved. Sexual assault cannot be solved by the police. Police are the biggest perpetrators of sexual violence. We need transformative justice in our community. We need to ask how we can respond in ways that end sexual violence, not just harmfully and half-heartedly respond to it in, after it has already happened and in a way that re-traumatizes the survivor and does nothing to rehabilitate the perpetrator. Giving more money to the police will not support survivors. Again, we need to invest in care. Not only do we need to defund LPD, but I also implore you to reject the federal COPS grant. By not spending money on LPD, and in fact defunding and demilitarizing it, which I propose you do, we must invest in care and correct another mistake in the proposed budget and keep Lincoln City Libraries open seven days a week. You must change the mayor's recommended budget. Thank you for making public comment accessible and thank you for your time. Up next is Paul Polson on deck, Aaron Poor. Hi, can you all hear me? Nice. Uh, my name is Paul Polson. That's P-O-U-L-S-E-N. And I live at 928 South 20th Street. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak remotely, and I want to echo the need to continue offering ways for all members of Lincoln to participate in city government. I am speaking to ask that this council rethink the spending priorities of the mayor's proposed budget, do not accept any grants to hire or otherwise fund the police, and reduce the Lincoln Police Department budget as a way to minimize the effects of the shortfall on other services such as the library, parks, education, housing, and to bolster health spending during the pandemic. It is a little insulting to spend the last month marching with my community only to have a budget increase for the police department proposed during a budget shortfall. But I think I understand where the disconnect is. After one of the first protests in Lincoln following George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murders, I remember the mayor saying she was in conversations with our police chief to avoid this happening in Lincoln. And I don't think we have a shared understanding of what this is and whether it's already happening in Lincoln. The now regular recordings of police violence in the US are the visible tip of the iceberg for a much larger system that criminalizes underprivileged communities every day, criminalizing black bodies most of all. These killings are graphic reminders in public spaces of a system that performs less visible, quote unquote, legitimate acts of violence constantly. When you're only advocating for additional training or advocating for body cameras to disincentivize the forms of police violence considered illegitimate, you are ignoring the rest of the iceberg. You're not comfortable with the police suffocating someone in the street, but you are comfortable with arresting for nonviolent offenses, holding the poor in jail when they can't make bail, imprisoning them in crowded prisons, and constantly surveilling when they are released on parole. The idea that all that is at stake is the policing part at the top of this funnel is wrong, and the idea that this is an issue happening outside of Lincoln is also wrong. Use this budget cycle as an opportunity to start tightening the top of the funnel by reducing LPD's budget. Curb the risk of police violence by not militarizing them, pulling them out of the spaces like schools, and start shifting their responsibilities to services better suited to treat the underlying causes. Lack of financial security, lack of opportunities for, er, for employment, lack of education, homelessness, addiction, and access to mental health care. If our police force feels lean, it is because we are making them do too much. Asking people equipped with guns in prisons to solve social problems that can never be solved by guns in prisons. In short, defund the police. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. Next, we have Aaron Poor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Good evening, council members. I wanna thank the council for allowing people to participate from home. This is an important step in expanding access, as your mission says, to accommodate the participation of all Lincolnites. That must continue forever and expand even further. I'd like to speak to you about the budget. I urge you to reject the mayor's budget as it currently stands, especially with regard to the increase the Lincoln Police Department budget. The Lincoln Police Department has become grossly inflated over the last decade, growing in millions of dollars. LPD has increased its budget by over $21 million in the past 10 years and has responded to less calls than it did a decade ago. Disturbingly, LPD only have to undergo 21 weeks of training before they become an active duty officer. A teacher at LPS must go through at least four years. An officer on day one will earn $55,000 annually. An LPS teacher will earn $46,000 in their first year. And it would take an LPS teacher with a bachelor's degree 17 years to reach $55,000 annually. Can we agree that those pay scales are out of whack? The disproportionality underscores the priorities of the city, that Lincoln believes in policing more than it believes in quality education. And that is the issue I'm hearing over and over again, is that white Lincolnites think that policing is the only answer to crime. It's not. If resources are directed to communities of colors in ways that they deem necessary, the root causes of crime can be addressed. Policing is reactive, it's not proactive. Incarceration is not correctional, it disappears humans from society. Beyond simply rejecting the police department budget, I urge you to open up an investigation into the LPD. Using an objective third-party entity, there needs to be an equity assessment, and that investigation needs to include the reactions to the protests one month ago. As was made clear at the Malone Center from last week, the Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian communities experience racially biased policing here in Lincoln, and we are sick of it. A Lincoln Journal Star article in 2017 called out the disproportionate rates at which Black Lincolnites were pulled over by police. At that time, Black residents made up 4% of the city population, but comprised 10% of all traffic stops. The police chief and public safety director responded to this by saying, huh, we're perplexed, but we're pretty sure it's not racism. Another example for you. I live in the beautiful Near South neighborhood. I've seen numerous times when black teens are stopped by police who then call in reinforcements for routine traffic infractions. I've seen three to four squad cars surrounding one vehicle that was presenting absolutely no threat. They were simply young and black. This is terroristic. This is excessive. And this is a regular occurrence in this neighborhood. And this is what white Lincolnites are asking for when they ask for more police. This is unacceptable. And we know, we need to know the depths of the racial inequities perpetrated by this department so we can act in the best interests of all Lincolnites, not just white Lincolnites. We must defund the police and redirect funds to communities made vulnerable by centuries of racist economic, housing, and health policies. And that redirection must respect the sovereignty of these communities. It cannot simply be a bunch of white people deciding what is best for people of color. For example, I know that the city likes to tout the amount of funds that go to Centerpoint. Centerpoint is a predominantly white institution with a predominantly white staff and board. That is what was what is called a white space. And in white spaces like this city, racial biases, inequities, and violence go unchecked. Institutions such as that are rife with blind spots and can do irreparable harm to minoritized populations. A few other topics. I know that mayor, the mayor's plan regarding pardoning protesters will be rolled out tomorrow. I urge you to do everything in your power to ensure that the city charter facilitates the swift and complete pardon of people protesting police violence, regardless of their history with the racially biased criminal justice system. The city should also pay for their medical bills. Do not re reduce vital services such as libraries and public housing so that the police can continue to violate, to, can continue their violent assaultative practices. Do not delay sidewalk repair. People with disabilities that affect their mobility rely on accessible sidewalks to move about this city. 
I urge you to recognize the power you hold and to use that power to affect change in this city. The city is not equitable. It is not inclusive. We need you to act. What is your plan? Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much. Is Trisha Hiltgen. On deck, Isabel Salas. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, City Council members, uh, for taking the time to listen to us via web. Um, there's been so much said tonight. And I've lived in Lincoln most of my life. I graduated from Northeast. I, I am a half and half person, so I'm mixed race. Um, so I am actually supporting the police of Lincoln because I believe that we do need law enforcement in our city. I've heard many people say that they're protesting and uh, the sounds of it, they were trying to imply they were peacefully protesting. Uh, but the Lincoln Journal Star said that there was over $20 million worth of damage done during those protests. And so I would like them to pray for those protests for the $20 million in damage that they did. And consider their actions. Because when people make choices, they need to be held responsible for their actions no matter what color they are. Um, on a humanitarian visit, I, I went to Zimbabwe, Africa. Um, I love people of different races. It doesn't matter to me what color you are. I respect them. But what I found was that the black people were ruling over black people. There was racial, there was, there was class injustice by black people to other black people. I visited orphanages where the babies who had AIDS were ignored. So this is not just a white on black issue. It's a heart issue in people. And I've heard many people bring up Camden, New Jersey. I used to live in Maryland. My husband used to travel to Camden, New Jersey, ironically, for uh, business. And Camden, New Jersey is not the safest place in America. Um, and it is totally different than Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we lived in Maryland for almost four years. Uh, one of the reasons why we moved back to Nebraska is we have family here, but also fam uh, Nebraska has a different feel to it. It has more of a home feel where people are accepted, where I have I been discriminated against because of what I look like? Yes, but I didn't let that bring me down. I still pursued my dreams. I am still pursuing my dreams. And I think it's an insult to people of brown or black or whatever color to imply that they are not able to make something of themselves in this city, in this country. Because I see, I see two people of color, three people of color in that room right now. And you have chosen to do something with your lives. And you've chosen the career paths that you want to take. So to say that you don't have an opportunity is not, not correct. Um, one thing that I would want to say is that I, I, was, I was researching. Um, I was researching, and in 2019, the mayor said in a 1011 News article that uh, while our community's low crime rate and sense of security are a point of pride, Lincoln's growth brings with its growth in the demands placed on our police officer, said Mayor, Mayor Gaylord Baird. These new position, 
these new positions are an important step toward creating better working conditions for our officers, as well as creating a safer community. And that was to replace the people retiring in the police department. I agree with Mayor Gaylord Bear that Lincoln's growth, we need to have police force to keep up with the growth. And I encourage the mayor and the city council to accept the federal grant to have five more police because we are way behind police staffing and this city is growing more and more by the day. And I thank you for your time and have a good evening. This is Isabel Salas on deck, Megan Pfeiffer. Hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for sticking around and uh, thanks to Councilman Bowers and everyone else on the, the um, on the city council who, you know, voted to make sure that we can join in via teleconference. I myself have been extreme social isolating uh, to put loved ones and family members not at risk when I am traveling soon. So I really appreciate the opportunity and hope that it sticks around for quite a while as the pandemic will. Um, I just wanted to add a few comments to the way that our systems and institutions are run. Um, a lot of people have said a lot of things that I really agree with as far as um, defunding the police and diverting resources uh, elsewhere. Um, but I just, you know, I want to speak with uh, what I know. And currently I'm working on housing justice in Lincoln. Um, and I'm speaking for myself, not for any other entity. Um, just myself, Isabel Salas, as a community member um, and my experiences in the community. So. As the coronavirus pandemic has ensued, um, we've seen how fragile our systems are, uh, how fragile our systems are in the way that we are not supporting and not allocating resources to the folks who need it the most and the way that our systems are failing right now. Um, and currently um, I've been working on a project through my work uh, called the, the Tenant Assistance Project, uh, which provides uh, legal representation in a limited scope capacity at eviction court for tenants um, in the Lancaster County Court. And we are the only court in Nebraska that continue to have evictions um, in our state uh, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and during the governor's moratorium, despite the governor saying, pretty please don't evict people, despite Mary Gaylor Baird saying, pretty please don't evict people, and despite lots of um, landlords saying that they're willing to work with tenants but still are evicting people in the midst of a pandemic where we're urging people to stay home. The reason that I'm talking today is because of the way that evictions disproportionately impact people of color, the way that our system systems and institutions have been historically set up to uh, minimize the equity building that can be done by people of color, the way that we've divested in our neighborhoods of color uh, and not allowed for home ownership opportunities and burden renters with, with high rents that are, not, um, that are not commensurate with the increase in wages. And this disproportionately affects people of color, especially black folks. In eviction court, I've seen a lot of different things happen. And what I try to do is be a friendly face for folks there. If we're gonna talk about defunding the police, we have to talk about where the resources are going to. Allocating resources to anything that, ha that has been mentioned before, including allocating resources to the libraries for adequate information, allocating resources to our school systems, allocate, allocating resources for te tenant representation in, in the eviction court process would all be welcome options instead of continuing to fund the police system. Another reason that I wanted to uh, speak today, and again, this is just my own personal view, um, is because while we have received tremendous and wonderful support from the mayor's office in creating the tenant assistance project, one piece of news that broke last week was really um, surprising and, and kind of uh, discouraging to me. Um, so the, the mayor has appointed or re recommended a certain individual for appointment on the planning commission. And the planning commission has a lot of oversight onto what gets built and where, and at what rates will they accept section eight vouchers? Will we allocate TIF funds for them? Um, even though they're not providing affordable housing for folks who need it the most. And even our own city of Lincoln has told us in their uh, affordability, coordinated action plan that the folks that need the most um, 
the folks that are in the most need for housing are the folks who are making $25,000 or less. It's really shocking to me that the mayor would appoint someone who has decided to proceed with evictions during the, the pandemic and the governor's moratorium, who last week just tried to evict someone who was on a Section 8 voucher, which is not legal under the CARES Act federally. Um, it's really shocking and disheartening to me. And so I want to see equity on all levels of, of our government. And I wanna see funding and resources so that we can protect folks um, because we know that the private market won't do it. So those are my comments. My comments are my own. Um, and thank you for your time. If not, I will call her at the end. We're going to move on to Ms. Caitlin Hopkins. Hi, um, my name is Caitlin. I'm a resident of Lincoln. Um, I would like to echo that there are many members of our community who are unable to participate in these formal listening sessions. Um, and we need to continue to offer public comment during each session and to continue to offer public comment via Zoom for those who can't be there in person. Um, I would first like to say, I've been sickened by the mayor's dismissal and inaction in regards to dropping charges against peaceful protesters and um, failing to specifically denounce the violent activity of police during these protests. I think that her proposed budget to allocate more money into body cameras and the police department is both a lazy and unimaginative way of responding to our cries to hold our police accountable. Um, the white people who are yelling about blue lives in this space clearly were not present during the protests and are not disproportionately affected by um, the way that they act. I echo many others in saying that the Lincoln Police Department failed to protect and serve and instead has chosen to antagonize and attack citizens who were exercising their right to protest. Um, not only was their detainment unnecessary, especially during a global health crisis, but the manner in which protesters were arrested and treated was sadistic and excessive. Um, the city of Lincoln attempted to silence us, display that they honor property over well-being, and that they are unconcerned with the re-traumatization of Black people. Um, police officers dancing with citizens is not meaningful action, nor does it excuse the physical and emotional damage that their officers inflicted on protesters during the nights prior. Um, I would also note, and conveniently, Roy Christensen is not present, um, but he made a recent statement in the Journal Star stating that the amount of force used was necessary to keep peaceful protesters safe. Um, that was not only wrong, but also disrespectful and shameful given the firsthand testimonies that he has been presented with. Um, for these reasons, I disagree with funneling any more money into a police department comfortable doing this. And I challenge the city to ask what you are doing to hold your trained police officers accountable for their violent behavior. Why are protesters paying fees that go directly into the pockets of people who have abused them? Um, now is a great moment to demilitarize our police department, reallocate our resources, remove SROs from public schools, and drop nonviolent offenses to help with prison overcrowding. You as council members have an opportunity during this time where there is a radical resistance to ancient systems of oppression to raise your voices and use your positions of power to actually make a difference in our community. That being said, we demand that the city immediately release and drop all charges against protesters and cover the health care bills that our community has had to pool to correct the police department's horrific mistakes in judgment. We need to disperse funds from the proposed Lincoln Police Department budget into programs that decrease the need for policing, um, like those mentioned previously, addiction services, health, health initiatives, affordable housing, assistance programs, food services, education, um, that includes our libraries. Um, body cams have no effect on use of force or complaints on officers. As a community, we're done investing in weapons of war and perpetuating a cycle where unaccountable police officers are allowed to terrorize us without any consequence. Um, the answer to these issues is not beating people when they're protesting against a system that actively oppresses and kills them. And we're done with leaders that are too concerned with people pleasing, their own reelection, or simply being afraid of the work that it takes to dismantle and reimagine a world without systemic oppression. 
We can no longer fail to act because as long as we're not taking direct action to fix the broken system and to pay reparations, we are failing. Um, Black Lives Matter and we all must take action accordingly. I really appreciate you guys staying late tonight. Um, this has been a good session. Thank you. On deck. Good evening. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Um, my name is Roland Cook. I live at 841 North 86th Street. I've been patiently on hold for over five hours, I believe it is. Uh, what I have to say is I support the police. Uh, we are blessed to have an exceptional law enforcement in our community. They are an essential part of our society to protect us. And I know they do an excellent job. I know several police officers personally, and they are very dedicated to the job they do. I also support our constitutional right to protest peaceably. No matter what the circumstances are, people do not have the right to riot, loot, burn, and destroy public and private property. These people must be held accountable for their actions. They can't blame the police for their activities. Your jobs as the city council is to serve and protect our community. If you do not hold these cr criminals accountable for their actions, you are guilty of failing to do your job. I encourage the mayor and the city council to keep the agreement to accept federal grants to fund five new office, police officers. They are desperately needed. We fall way short of the national average of law enforcement officers for the size of our community. Our, our officers are overworked and underappreciated for the great job they are doing. We are a country of law and order, and I demand that you do your job and stand behind and support law enforcement. We cannot cave into the mob rule Without rule of law, our country will be destroyed. If you fail to do your job, you're caving into the hands that want this great country destroyed. I support all lives matter. And when I say that, I am called a racist and a bigot, a homophobe and everything else. That is absolutely ridiculous. I grew up in a very poor family of 10 kids. I worked for over 45 years of my life to get where I am. And in those years, I probably missed less than two days of work a year because I was dedicated to my job and I performed it well. And I expect the city to continue to support the police and protect us from the unruly mob. If they wanna protest, that's fine. Keep it peaceful, I'll support their protest. But as soon as they pick up a brick, a rock, a water bottle, and throw it at police, they are not peaceful. And when they destroy property, they are not peaceful. And that needs to be, they need to be held accountable and this has to stop. This is absolutely ridiculous. Several members on the city council own or in ownership of businesses. You defund the police. What's gonna stop the riot mobs from busting into your businesses and destroying everything you've worked your lives for? It is incomprehensible that you would support the defend, the defund of the police movement. We need the police to keep law and order in this town. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity and I hope you use common sense and good judgment when it comes to the budget and use that federal grant to get the law enforcement we need. We also need to hold cops accountable. I've heard a lot of testimony tonight about the thousands of people killed by police. That is an outright lie, distortion. Look at the facts. People are not mass murdered by police. And with All Lives Matter, why aren't they addressing the black on black crime that is supersedes any, any uh, number of people injured or murdered by police? That's a red herring they use just to uh, promote their own criminal behavior. We need police, we need them now. Thank you very much and have a great evening.
Hi, uh, I'm Gus Spiritual, 1610 Kingston Road. First, I want to thank the council for providing this online option for participating in council meetings. It does a lot for safety as well as physical and social accessibility, as others have talked about. And I implore the council to keep this permanent as a permanent part of meetings. As the last months of protests have shown us, there are a lot of people for whom police presence is not a comforting thought, and for good reason. Especially for people of color and poor people, the police can be a violent symbol, both a reminder of the direct brutality that is as old as the forces themselves and still unchecked today, as well as an arm of the prison industry, which profits off of seeing as many people as possible as criminal, and therefore unfit for the basic rights and fair shots at life, which most of us take for granted. I get why policing can seem like the safe option, especially from the vantage point of a legislature. It's been around for a long, for a while. You want to seem like you're taking public safety seriously by being tough on crime, and there's a lot of organized pressure and money invested in its continuation. But for a lot of people, it's not the safe option. Not everybody is equally protected by the police, and I think that divide shows when you look at the demographics of the people who spoke earlier here tonight wearing a blue sticker. In a lot of communities and for a lot of people, police are a source of chaos and danger, not a solution to them. Somewhere between a third and a fourth of all murders committed by a stranger to the victim, victim are done at the hands of the police. And disproportionate amounts of these victims and of the victims of mass incarceration are people of color. The problem isn't, unfortunately, that the policing system is broken, but rather that it is working just as envisioned. The problem is the system itself and who it was set up to benefit. Our city's system for protecting the well-being of its people should be incentivized to do just that by caring for and protecting its people. Instead, our system rewards determining that some people aren't fit for care. It rewards reducing poor people and people of color to legal slave labor in prisons that at the moment statewide are somewhere near 160% capacity during a global pandemic. All this considered, it might be helpful to start treating the people and communities of the city like legislators tend to treat law enforcement. There, government tends to, be, tends to show compassion. There we give more resources, like money for more body cameras because we feel the system can be better. There we aren't quick to jump to punitive and retaliatory punishment for even violent outbursts of frustration, like tear gassing and firing rubber bullets at peaceful protesters. But ultimately, we need to stop acting like any small superficial reform will change the core problem. We need to stop accepting systematic violent treatment of people of color just because the LPD puts on popular events and brings puppies to the prisons which they work to fill. This problem is not one of a broken system that needs to be fixed, but of a system based on warped ideals and conceptions of community and us versus them which needs to be replaced. To that end, I first have three actionable steps that the re I request the council takes in the short term, especially in the light of the mayor's proposed budget set to be adopted on August 24th. First, don't cut funding to public services like libraries. We should be broadening access to free public resources for those who need them, not limiting them. Second, don't increase the number of police officers. Now more than ever, there is a vocal and passionate cry reminding us that for many people, the police aren't the nice, helpful idea that we would like. We shouldn't insult this collective effort and outcry of the people by responding with even more police interaction. Third, don't provide additional funding for body cameras, which as many people have mentioned, don't stop violence, instead of funding social services, and especially not without laws in place which treat any instance of missing or obstructed footage as an immediate fireable offense, if not criminal obstruction of justice. In the long term, I encourage each of you to take seriously the goal of reimagining our system of justice and do everything within your ability to bring about a system that works for the people, not against us. We can start by banning profiting off of prison labor, encouraging that the Nebraska Board of Pardons, Parole, commute the sentences of and pardon as many people as possible from our dangerously overfilled prisons, and take the meaningful but difficult steps towards ending mass incarceration and the carceral state. Black Lives Matter, reallocate funding. Thank you for your time. Hi, this is Jordan Ellis. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, um, I would like to start by um, making a few acknowledgements. I would like to thank the city council for making this forum available virtually. And I would like to say that I agree that it is extremely important to keep these public discussions accessible online uh, through the pandemic and beyond uh, for several accessibility reasons. Um, in addition to our current state of being um, impacted by COVID-19 and having thousands of local residents uh, who must protect themselves for various reasons. Um, as many people have mentioned earlier, the ability to take time away from work or family or have access to transportation to attend the meeting in person is a great privilege that not everybody has. Um, and in order to, you know, reflect the true scope of the voices of our community. It must be as accessible as possible uh, in perpetuity. Um, the connecting thread of everything that I'm thinking about uh, and hearing tonight is that we are not protecting and serving the most vulnerable members of our community. We've heard a lot from people who have friends and neighbors who are in the police department who think that everything is just fine and we have to try the system, but the system has not served people of color, black and indigenous people, um, and people who have been forced into poverty through various systems in our society, um, both private, societal, and governmental. Um, and it's time to change that mode of operation so that we are actually helping the people who need it the most. Um, in terms of our current budget situation, I cannot imagine how adding funds to a police force that is already overstretched just to have more people doing more jobs than they're actually trained for would be helpful. Instead of expecting police officers to respond to situations that are not criminal, where maybe there is a mental health wellness check that needs to happen, or an addiction treatment check that, or you know, support system that needs to be in place. We've got plenty of police when what we need are social workers, addic addiction treatment counselors, um, resources for the most vulnerable, resources for those who have no other existing support. Um, the police seem to be doing a fine job of supporting the people in their own neighborhoods who uh, are, are their biggest fans, but it is only those people who feel safe. Everyone else, myself included, as a white woman who benefits from all kinds of privilege. I do not feel protected by the police because there are so many thousands of my friends and neighbors who feel completely unsafe because of excessive policing and lack of supportive resources in our community. And I, I have always seen Lincoln and heard of Lincoln as being such a you know, shining uh, example of quality of life in America. And we are often looked at as such by the rest of the country. And we need to address that quality of life for every single citizen, especially those who have been the most vulnerable in our society until now. Thank you for your time. Uh, 
I look forward to hearing more from our community. Next is Gabriella Parsons. On deck is Ella Durham. Hello and good evening. Almost good morning. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. My name is Gabriella Parsons. Um, and I am a resident of the near South neighborhood in Lincoln, where I have resided and rented as a tenant for the past six years. Um, I have been listening, you know, for like the past five and a half hours, and I'm here today in solidarity with the movement for black liberation and the liberation of all black people, indigenous people and people of color. I first and foremost want to acknowledge that the land we are on belongs to the first indigenous peoples of what we now call Nebraska. In Lincoln, we are on Pawnee and Sioux land. This continued disregard for the stolen land and stolen labor of black and indigenous peoples that we actively benefit from is absolutely unacceptable. Um, so I just ask um, that folks please acknowledge, research, and honor the stolen land that we are on. Um, I wanna emphasize my support for all the incredible testimonies tonight, um, calling for the defunding of the Lincoln Police Department and the reallocation of those funds to community resources that truly protect people um, by meeting their, their true needs. Um, I think it's quite clear um, and beyond time to abolish the punitive systems of policing punishment and incarceration that continue to oppress black folks, indigenous folks and people of color, as well as people living in poverty. I specifically want to speak tonight about housing justice um, and the ongoing evictions in Lancaster County during the pandemic. Um, also acknowledging the ways in which these issues directly intersect with racial inequity in our communities and the opportunities for black folks, people of color and people living with disabilities to access equitable and just systems. Um, just, I really want to be clear that they are, these systems are not designed to function justly. These systems are designed to keep very few people in power while impressing entire groups of people. Um, I really want to emphasize Isabel's comments regarding housing justice um, and as also as someone who's been involved in the Tenants Assistance Project supporting uh, folks facing eviction. Um, but I also want to be clear that I'm speaking as myself, um, as an individual and not on the behalf of any specific group. Um, I want to acknowledge and talk about the mayor's recent appointment and recommendation of a local landlord to the City Planning Commission. Um, something very direct that you could be doing as a council is to look at this appointment and recommendation from the mayor very critically and understand that this is an opportunity to directly do something that benefits Black folks in our community and dismantle the systems that uphold um, oppression in our community. So according to public records on the county court scheduler since March 17th, 2020 of this year, CASA Property Management uh, has filed 12 eviction actions. I want to be clear that CASA is the company that um, the landlord who is conveniently being appointed to the City Planning Commission owns. So that's 12 families whose lives were upended during the middle of this pandemic and forced to find new housing, a struggle that is already hard enough when Lincoln is 5,000 affordable housing units short. Um, it really appears to me and many others that landlords who choose to evict folks during the pandemic often care more about money and status than basic human dignity. Um, because I know that many of you on this council are committed to housing justice, um, and in a, a really genuine way, I just want to ask you to imagine for a moment that your current housing situation was as unstable as those in our city who are living month to month. Amidst job loss, food insecurity, and so many more struggles due to the economic downturn of the pandemic, not to mention that sometimes because Lincoln is so sh short on affordable housing units, people are actually forced to live in unhealthy or unsafe conditions while also finding ways to care for and feed their children and at times care for adult dependents who have disabilities. 
Um, all of these factors have become so much more apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we know disproportionately affects Black folks, uh, Indigenous folks, and people of color. Also people with disabilities and immunocompromised folks who are at high risk of contracting the virus. And yet these are the exact people who are being summoned to show up at Lancaster County Eviction Court every single week sometimes risking their own health and safety or the safety of their loved ones in order to represent themselves in court. <sighs> Oftentimes people don't really even know that they're being summoned to appear in court um, and so they don't show up. So because of this, you have a situation where volunteer attorneys in Lincoln and, and just ordinary community members like myself, through the program that um, Mayor, the mayor helped start the tenants, tenants assistance um, project or that she supports are risking their own health and safety to legally represent and support tenants who sometimes aren't even there. And the absence of these folks in this courtroom is as well as the absence of these folks at this meeting tonight is an example of how these systems are designed to make people absent, to make people oppressed. So, you know, legal representation, oh, that's okay. Um, legal representation is oftentimes these folks' best chance at a fair outcome in eviction court. Um, but I just want to emphasize that um, appointing a landlord whose interests directly conflict with um, what the planning commission you think would would um, be um, objected to do is um, unacceptable. And, and I just really want to encourage um, the council, especially those who, who ran their campaigns and, and have proven to be committed to, to housing justice, to acknowledge that this is a racial justice issue too, um, and stand up and do something not only for black lives, but to dismantle these oppressive systems. Thank you so much for your time. Is Ella Durham on deck is Robert Stewart, then Mar Lee. Hello, good evening. My name is Ella Durham, uh, E-L-L-A. D-U-R-H-A-M. My thoughts are my own. I've lived in Lincoln most of my life and I provided my address to the office of the city clerk when I registered for this webinar. I'm pretty sleepy and I'm sure all of you are too. I've been listening um, and sitting here at my computer since five um, and just want to echo the appreciation for you offer, um, um, having this um, opportunity for um, us to provide testimony um, uh, through webinar. I'm actually having a little bit of a difficult time gathering my thoughts because of the recent testimonies that have brought in black on black crime into this conversation. Um, it's just entirely inappropriate and a disgusting show of white supremacist narratives. Uh, violence by police or even pol police efficacy has nothing to do with black on black crime. And black on black crime is a narrative perpetuated by white people to make black people look dangerous and to justify the violence that is imposed on them. Uh, that being said, um, what I'm here for is to um, support and offer solidarity to our black community. And I would like to express the support um, in this testimony uh, to echo in particular um, earlier Cameron uh, Cynics, who stated that the proposed budget needs to be closely examined and reconsidered, um, that body cams will, uh, will not change or stop police misconduct or police brutality, that the budget for the police should be redirected to provide resources such as investing in mental health services and in economic success programs for black and brown residents. Just a quick note here, there was a study in um, 2017 that was 18 months long of more than 2,000 officers um, in Washington that found that um, the, the cameras, um, those with cameras used force at about the same rate as those without. I mean, we have lots of data on this. This is just 
um, a poor use of um, it's, it's, uh, of money and, and it's fiscally irresponsible. Um, I'd like to also echo Karen Wilson's testimony that uh, there should be an investigation of the communications between the Lincoln Police Department and State Patrol regarding the legality of the protests. Um, that medical bills should be paid for um, for the in injuries um, protesters suffered at the hand of police assault and violence. Um, in addition to these testimonies I've mentioned, I'd like to add in short, one, defund the police, two, demilitarize communities, three, remove police from schools, four, free people from jails and prisons, five, repeal laws that criminalize survival, six, invest in community self-governance, seven, provide safe housing for everyone, eight, invest in care, not cops. And I think that's what is getting missed in um, the folks who think that uh, the ask is just to defund the police. It is really investing in care and communities. Lastly, and this has already been mentioned in several ways, I'd like you to consider the racial experience of nearly every one of the community members who've come here to speak in support of the police. Um, consider how their experience may be informing their personal opinions of the police. And also um, that there are those of you on the um, uh, council um, yourself, um, uh, one of you absent this evening, um, who share that racial experience uh, that might also lead you to see police as allies. Um, lastly, I just will close with um, Black Lives Matter, and I thank you for your time. Up next, we have Robert Stewart on deck Marley. Okay, we're gonna move on to Marley. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Marley, spelled M-A-R-L-E-E. -E. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. My address is 1425 North 19th Street. The links to articles and information about the provided statistics and proposed alternatives to policing have been emailed to all of the city council members. I want to state that the only way I could safely participate in tonight's council meeting was thanks to options to call in due to being high risk, but also that the broadcast does lack closed captioning, which still makes it inaccessible. This option to call in should continue permanently with accessibility accommodations made to include co closed captioning. I am a white ally in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm speaking only as a white ally and not for black and brown communities. And I am also speaking as a victim of police brutality and witness to police brutality. I have experienced white privilege with police officers while being pulled over and stopped and multiple times I've gotten warnings instead of tickets. I've also been screamed at, gaslit and willfully neglected by mis misogynistic police officers who were supposedly supposed to be the people I turned to for help in cases of domestic abuse and sexual violence. As a white disabled queer non-binary person that grew up below the poverty line, I can only speak to personally experiencing the sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism and classism that is rampant in police systems. And before all that, the history of policing in America is based in white supremacy, xenophobia, and the oppression of black people, indigenous communities, and people of color. I've witnessed this firsthand while providing first aid response in the first nights of protests in Lincoln to protesters who were being targeted by the police. These protesters were on the north side of the street, not near the easy go, congregated peacefully on public sidewalks. While providing first aid to an obviously concussed black woman, rubber bullets were fired in our direction. I yelled loudly, waving my arms, screaming for them to stop firing. They then directly, they turned directly in our direction and launched a tear gas canister that hit my friend who was assisting in providing first aid. She dropped the first aid kit to drag the injured woman out of the way of tear gas as I grabbed her jugs of water and we were cheated, only to be met with more people who had been maced and tear gas in need of what limited help the few of us could get. Over the course of the following days, peaceful protesters and obviously marked first aid responders continued to be injured by Lincoln police. 
I was informed by Sergeant Richards of LPD that these actions were protocol. LPD willfully executed police violence against Lincoln citizens protesting racially motivated police violence and murder. This violence was directed at black protesters specifically and my white body was only on the receiving end because I was there to help those protesters. A little over a week later, I brought this experience to the Nebraska Legislative Judiciary Committee at the listening session they hosted on police brutality and racism in policing. On my way home, I drove by the LPD building on 27th and Holders where I witnessed a black man cross the street in front of me. The cop car that was driving on the opposite direction whipped around the median and immediately stopped that man um, that appeared to be simply jaywalking. I drove around the block, parked my car, and got out to record, and by that time, another cop car had showed up. Another person stopped to record with me, and then by then, a third cop car pulled up to the scene. This was three cop cars, four officers, right outside of the police station for one black man who jaywalked. After checking his ID and giving it back to him, they let him go. I'm not sure if that would have happened if myself and another person weren't policing the police. This was literally happening while discussions of racist policing and police brutality were going on down the street. LPD not killing someone isn't a thing that we should pat them on the back for, and if it is, we need to acknowledge how low of a bar that is. We cannot reform white supremacy, and therefore we cannot reform police systems. Instead, they need to be abolished, and they're finding news to support community-based de-escalation teams, community-coordinated health care, and efforts to combat racial and class disparities. The Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department and Lincoln City Council need to follow the lead of the Douglas County Board of Health, Indianapolis City Council, and other governmental agencies and bodies across the country, including Minneapolis City Council, to announce racism and xenophobia as a public health crisis and abolish the police. Over the last 10 years, LPD's budget has increased by $20.5 million, while other community supports, programs, and grants have either barely received any increase in funding or have been defunded and there was no public outcry for these departments. We need to attack the root of violence in our communities that exist to grow systemic marginalization of black and brown communities. Black lives matter, black trans lives matter, and black disabled lives matter. And it's about time that the Lincoln City started acting like it. Thank you and have a good night. Are there any further testifiers? We may have one, just one moment, please. Okay. We have Robert Stewart. Robert, are you there? Found it. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, wow, City Council is the place to be tonight. Uh, thank you for all of the time and energy that you are putting into this and for making this online engagement available. It is, I mean, it has been amazing to watch the whole thing and just hear so many ideas and voices uh, coming through. And uh, yeah, it just really ups the feeling of community and involvement in the community. So I would definitely encourage you to keep it going as a part of the meetings and to keep public comments open every time. I mean, it's not, of course, going to be like this every time. So, you know, get some sleep eventually. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have a whole page of notes. A lot of things I was going to touch on have been touched on much in a lot of detail already. So I just kind of, uh, on a personal note, as a parent of a five-year-old, um, the libraries and the parks, as, I, as a stay-at-home parent, they were like crucial resources for giving us things to do as he was a young person. And to hear that those will be reduced in some way so that like, you know, you've heard about how ineffective body cams are so that those could be purchased. Uh, it just seems ridiculous. It seems sad. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't tell you anything that uh, you haven't already heard, or I'm sure you didn't know before you came in tonight. Um, I will say a couple points. People say, uh, you know, all this damage was done by protesters uh, without even, a, you know, entertaining the idea that cops may have somehow been involved in destroying things like that's not kind of their mandate a little bit. Um, and so, <laughs> oh, this got very conversational. It's been a long night as I'm sure, you know, um, what's left. I don't know. I'll just close it out. Happy Pride, ACAB forever, Black Lives Matter, Black Trans, <laughs> Black Disabled Lives Matter, Black Sex work Workers Lives Matter, Fuck Patriarchal. Rest in peace, James Gerlach, and have a great summer. Participate in public comment. Okay, seeing none, I would ask for, or are there any announcements that we need to make? No, all right, um, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn this evening. Second. Moved by uh, Councilwoman Washington, seconded by Councilwoman Ward. Is there any discussion? Thank you to everyone who came out for a public comment and to try out this uh, webinar uh, uh, type public comment. Um, appreciate everyone's dedication. Um, with that being said, I would ask for a vote. Shope? Yes. Ward? Yes. Washington? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Bowers? Yes. Motion carried 5-0.